vision and uh, really tireless work in support of the Hickson Center and our broader planetary solutions goals for the university. Um, finally, I want to thank the speakers for coming from near and far uh, to today's uh, seminar conference. Um, their wisdom and insights are going to be critical for our future, and I'm sure you'll learn a lot uh, from their perspective. So I'm really looking forward to the day's talks and events. I'm going to hand it over to Karen now to introduce our uh, plenary speaker. It is so nice to see so many people. We have not been in Kroon Hall with near capacity in over two years. And I wanna welcome all of you on the screen. I don't know where the camera is, but I know that we have over 500 people registered from literally around the world. So this is really exciting to see a nearly full room and to know that there are so many of you joining us from around the world. I'm Karen Sito, I'm the faculty director of the Hickson Center for Urban Ecology, and I wanna welcome all of you to this really exciting conference on cities as solutions to climate change. I'm not gonna take very much time, I will just say that a couple of things. Um, one is that the, if we think about cities in the context of climate change, they're clearly a point, a place where there are tremendous opportunities to generate solutions. And here at Yale, we're developing a lot of that new science, but generating the science isn't enough. And we're gonna hear a lot of that from Co Barrett this morning. We need to think about how we can uptake, we can have some of the most innovative science that's being developed actually being implemented. And we're gonna hear about that from our speakers today. We will only briefly introduce the speakers and we will ask everyone to turn to the bios that are in the printed programs and also online just in the interest of time. I will just briefly introduce Co Barrett though because she's especially important and special. Um, so Co Barrett is the inaugural, she's the first senior advisor for climate for NOAA. And for those of you, especially those of you joining us internationally, NOAA is the principal federal agency that collects data on weather and climate. They monitor climate, they forecast climate. And she's the first special advisor on climate. So she's helping the agency strategize what kind of data do we need? How do we actually provide better, more accurate forecasts about climate? Co was also the lead negotiator representing the US for the UN Treaty on Climate Change. And she has been representing the US for the IPCC for over 20 years. She has won a number of prizes and awards for her incredible civil service to our country, to the nation, really to the world. I just wanna highlight one that she won last year, which is the, let's see, it is the Distinguished Presidential, Distinguished Presidential Rank Award. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Co Barrett. <laughs> Thanks for that warm welcome and good morning, everyone. Let me get my glasses and be the old person that I am. Um, <clears throat> and um, thank you for inviting me to speak with you uh, as we kick off this annual Hickson Urban Conference, focusing on cities as solutions to climate change. It's super exciting, it's so important, and it's really extraordinary to be here with some of the world's most knowledgeable folks on this issue both researchers and practitioners who will share their insights um, on the important role that cities play as we seek to solve the climate problem. So Karen, thank you for your warm welcome and for your leadership on urban issues, um, especially as you've brought that expertise to IPCC assessments. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the insights all of the panelists will share on this important topic. So let's dive in. <clears throat> I'm going to give a little bit of a background on IPCC findings for those of you who are not intimately familiar. So um, IPCC is the world's leading scientific authority on climate change. Every six or seven years or so, scientists from across the globe assess all we know about climate and produce this information in a series of reports. Each set of reports improves upon the prior assessment cycles gradually building 
a better global understanding of climate change. And as a result, today, we have the clearest picture of how the climate functions and how humans affect it. So what do we know? In brief, it's indisputable that human activities are causing climate change and human influence is making extreme events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall, drought, um, more frequent and severe. Human activity has warmed the planet at a rate not seen in the last 2000 years and alarming and undeniable warming trend where the planet has already warmed 1.1 degrees C since pre-industrial times and shows no signs of slowing down. This level of warming is a threat to human well-being and the health of the planet. Each day we see the impacts of extreme weather and climate play out across the globe in ways that scientists predicted would happen. Um, it's become commonplace to wake up wondering where we will see a new record temperature or a devastating flood, so often completely outside of the range of normal. And every increment of additional warming increases the risk of a severe impacts, some of which will be irreversible in our lifetimes for sure, like Arctic sea ice retreat or increases in heavy rainfall and flooding uh, and loss of glaciers and snowpack. And these changes are driven by the rise of greenhouse gas emissions. Average annual greenhouse gas emissions during the last decade were higher than in any previous decade, uh, the highest levels in human history. And GHG emissions have increased since 2010 across all major sectors globally with an increasing share attributed to urban areas. In the scenarios that the IPCC assessed, limiting warming to around 1.5 degrees, which is a level that many countries have set as a target uh, for climate action, um, it requires global GHG emissions to peak by 2025 at the latest and be reduced significantly by 2030. So let me say that again. <laughs> global emissions would need to peak in the next three years if we are to keep to these warming levels that many countries have set as their targets. Um, climate change is already affecting every region on Earth, from the tops of the highest mountains to the deepest sea. And places that have not even seen a human footprint are feeling the effects of humanity's carbon footprint. And I just have to say this point makes me particularly sad um, for the wild places that we're losing before most of us even know what's lost. Solving the problem requires immediate action deep into every sector, every segment of society, and widespread action across the globe. And the next decades are really critical. The truth is, we've never purposefully undertaken uh, anything as transformational as we need to solve this climate problem. We need something like a Marshall Plan for the entire planet with the aim of decarbonizing energy, transport, industry, and manufacturing, building resilient homes and roads and um, power distribution systems, and protecting and restoring the natural areas that protect and sustain us. Oh, and we need to figure out how to remove large amounts of carbon dioxide from the air and the ocean so that we can eventually reverse the warming trend and address ocean acidification. Depressing stuff, right? Well, it is. <laughs> and I know it is because I get a chance to talk about climate change with lots of folks in my various positions. And across the board, this conversation makes people feel like the problem is too big and too hard, and it often makes them feel hopeless. And it's particularly true for people the age of my children, some of whom are so heartbroken and so angry that they question whether it's ethical to bring children into this world. Before I convince you too to lose hope, though, let's turn our attention to cities, um, because we have unique opportunities to transform society through urban and community level action. 
So in the IPCC, we increased our focus on cities in the last round of reports. And we found that cities and other urban areas are responsible for more than two thirds of global greenhouse gas emissions through the production and consumption of goods and services. Even those not living in cities, so folks outside of urban areas, are impacted by urban systems through interconnecting infrastructure, trade, family ties, and the influence on water, food, energy, and waste. And right now, half of the world's population, over 4.2 billion people, live in cities. And this will only increase. The UN predicts uh, that about 70% of people worldwide will be living in cities by 2050. 90% of people in Africa and Asia will be living in cities in that time frame. So more people, more emo emissions, right? Well, no. In fact, IPCC found that the concentrated nature of urban areas provides significant potential for emissions reductions. And that's what we're going to talk about today in part. Um, so in all cities, every city, we can focus on sustainable production and consumption. We can look at electrification with low emissions energy. And as places where we improve carbon uptake and storage and reduce urban heat with expanded green and blue spaces, like permeable surfaces, green roofs, urban forests, green spaces, rivers, ponds, lakes. In established cities, we can focus on improving or retrofitting buildings to make them more efficient and upgrading public transport and a host of other issues. Um, this picture that you've been staring at on the screen behind me um, shows the, trans the transformation of Dusseldorf um, from 1990 on the left to 2019 on the right, and you see that progress is not represented as more hardscaping, quite the opposite. It's achieved through enhanced quality of life and better resilience to climate hazards. Relocating green spaces and supporting walking and cycling, these are win-win solutions. For rapidly growing our new cities, we can do things right from the start and avoid future emissions by co-locating jobs and housing, transitioning to low emission technologies or avoiding fossil fuels entirely and providing energy efficient infrastructure and services and a growing number of cities around the world are doing this over 800 have adopted net zero greenhouse gas emission targets at the city level so there is simply too much going on in cities to ignore um, what's going on there and i want to hit on one more important aspect of cities that I think is, um, has huge potential. And this is touched on a little bit in IPCC reports, but it's really more informed by the conversations I spoke about earlier. Um, and this is the importance of city and community level action as a magnifier of individual ambition. It's really becoming clear to me that cities and communities provide just the right level of engagement to magnify individual ambition into action. Because um, there's a groundswell of interest in doing something about this problem. Um, but many people feel overwhelmed by the magnitude of the challenge. And just making individual dietary, energy, fashion, transportation choices um, feels too disconnected from the huge transformation we need to make a difference. But changes in your community, working in places you care about, that's an opportunity to make a tangible difference. And by the way, to disconnect from the fits and starts of national level policy, which pendulums wildly with changing geopolitics and different governmental administrations. Subnational action can have real lasting positive effects. Don't underestimate the power of community groups. I mean, groups like Science Moms, who advocate for climate change, um, exist in every US state and are being really successful in engaging their communities to make a difference and motivate sustainable change. And this is the kind of thing that really gives me hope. Um, now, it would be disingenuous to paint 
an overly rosy picture here, it's still really hard to affect the transformation that we need to see in cities. Changing the trajectory of two thirds of global greenhouse gas emissions across all urban systems is tough and expensive. Addressing inequities and environmental justice is a challenge. The most vulnerable in society often live with the most climate risk. In cities, this can mean dealing with temperatures more than 10 degrees hotter than more affluent areas replete with well-established and large green spaces. Uh, we find this constantly in a program we've been piloting here in the US, in the US where we're doing some citizen science in, in uh, urban areas. And informal settlements found increasingly in many urban areas present a tough problem because they often have few or no urban services and are often located in hazard prone areas like floodplains. So we clearly need to address these challenges and more if we to, are to avail ourselves of the potential for urban areas to provide the solutions to climate change that we're looking for. Uh, and before I close, I just want to share a near term op opportunity to contribute to our understanding of the potential for urban solutions for climate change. This is an invitation. <laughs> the one thing we know we're going to do in the next round of IPCC reports is a special report on cities. We have yet to scope this, the, the next cycle that'll start in the next year or so, but the city's report is the one thing that we know we're going to do. And this means we have a unique opportunity <laughs> to get in-depth knowledge about urban solutions into the hands of global policymakers um, sometime in the next five years. And I'll just say IPCC special reports garner worldwide attention. I mean, some of our recent reports have resulted in over 75,000 press mentions, and our reports inform the annual climate change negotiations that set global policy so I just don't want to underestimate the importance of this, this special report on cities. It is a chance to get these issues in front of people. Um, so right now we have to be thinking about what research we should be doing to shape that report. Again, cities can be so transformational, but we need knowledge that goes beyond, frankly, case studies um, here or there around the world. We need knowledge that transcends a particular place and helps us to see how we can affect the fundamental systems changes that can be understood and replicated. We need cost benefit analysis of urban solutions and better understanding of the feasibility of technical solutions. We need deep understanding of the social systems and the social science that underpins action. And we need to be thinking expansively now about the research that should be assessed in that report so we can make a significant contribution to the solutions that we seek in cities. So end of my plug for research, but I think, I hope it landed on ears here. It's super important. So I'll just end by saying, you know, cities are, are critical to the future of our climate. Um, and as we are acknowledging by gathering today, and I really look forward to the work we can do together in the future and to the presentations and discussions during the rest of the conference. Thanks for having me. Raise your hand, we can bring the microphone to you quickly. Don't be shy. Yeah, okay, did you hear that? So who, who serves in the IPCC? What governments are involved? So, um, so the IPCC, the panel for the intergovernmental panel for climate change, the panel is comprised of 195 countries, basically most countries across the world. Um, and we draw from scientists across the world who volunteer their time, like many of you who are in this room now, um, to produce and ass to assess the state of knowledge and to produce these reports. There is a small leadership team. I'm the, one of the vice chairs. 
um, who kind of helped to drive the action of the IPCC for the assessment cycle. We're in the sixth one. Um, but what I will say is this, it's intergovernmental, right? But it's also scientists. And so the tremendous value of IPCC and the reason why we have 75,000 press mentions when our reports go out is that you are bringing to the table a consensus view between scientists and politicians and policymakers. And sometimes the um, findings can seem conservative because we're assessing the broad range of, of the literature and governments are having their say, but it's super powerful to have a consensus that speaks to what we know about climate change. And over the 33 years or so of IPCC's history, that has been its superpower. Other questions? Yes, here in, here in the back. Thank you. You were mentioning how the IPCC is mainly like, or there are mainly scientists and governments, but I do think that climate change is mainly driven by the private sector. So how do you see the involvement of the private sector of these massive companies in the IPCC and climate change initiatives? That's such a great question. I mean, we do, um, we do have some private sector representatives who are, and practitioners across the board who are part of IPCC assessments. And we certainly, um, assess literature or, you know, uh, information that comes from private sector entities. Um, but it is primarily academics who are drafting the report. Um, I will say, though, that the science that's produced by IPCC is intended to underpin action, underpin action by governments, underpin action by private sector. I mean, it really is to create this kind of common knowledge base from which people can take action. And so for that reason, we're very, very careful about not being policy prescriptive. We assess, it's just the facts, ma'am. We just assess what we know, but we don't say you should do this in this place. But private sector uses these reports quite, quite frequently for, to um, make their decisions in the space. Hi, Co. Kevin Kreisick, thanks so much for your timely comments. Really, really spot on. I just wanted to ask you to explain or uh, uh, further describe what you possibly mean by requiring further research. Some things we need research about, other things we don't need research about. We don't need research when this chemical reacts with this chemical, bad things happen. We don't need more research to tell us when the apple falls out of the tree, it's going to go down. But we do need other types of research that I don't think that we quite conceive of yet. And so if you could further uh, describe that, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, well, I like the way you just put that. Um, and, and I'll say um, this cycle, we, we actually placed quite a focus on cities. We have more information on cities than we've ever had. And so that kind of ups the bar for this period now between you know what we've just provided in terms of information and what we can provide for this special report on cities i mean we don't want to just regurgitate what we've just said on cities like we really need to be thinking now what is the research that we haven't undertaken um i mean we had a very interesting conversation at dinner last night where it became apparent that one of the challenges with research on cities is that it's place-based. I mean, cities are places. Um, and just like adaptation, which you know, you, you really talk about adaptation in terms of a place. What do we do on the coast? What do we do in a riverine um, setting? And sometimes when you're dealing with places, we don't place enough attention on the research that brings all that information together into kind of larger aggregate findings. So, you know, with regard to adaptation, I'll just say we have a whole report on adaptation. The summary that we put together for policymakers on adaptation is not as useful as digging into the actual report itself, because when you aggregate it up and you take adaptation discussion out of the place based um, kind of context, you know, then it's aggregated to things that are actually honestly not as meaningful as digging in. And I think we have the same challenge with cities. We need to think about ways 
that we can aggregate information across across places so that it's not oh you're interested in this go look at that case study and that's the kind of thing but honestly i just am hoping to seed that conversation for those of you who re do research in urban areas i don't do that so i'm really hoping to benefit from your thinking on that Thank you for a very inspiring talk. And I was wondering, regarding to the spatial issue of cities, what are the pathways that uh, you, you um, foresee that scientists around the world are able to join and participate? In IPCC? Uh, in the spatial issue of cities. Okay. Like, as you mentioned, like case studies and like um, place-based studies ac across different places are very important. And what are the ways that uh, scientists in different countries in the next few years they can participate? Yeah, okay, well, let me just be clear because I think I may have confused things with my last comment. I mean, I think scientists from around the world can um, benefit our global understanding, even if they take undertake research in a a particular place, because that information turns out to be very helpful to our global understanding. And one of the things that I love about working for IPCC is that we have at our core recognized that the diversity of um, our scientists who come to the table with their knowledge and their expertise is a key um, kind of superpower that we have, honestly. Um, because bringing diverse perspectives to the table and making sure that they are reflected in our common knowledge base really helps to broaden the set of potential solutions that we have at our fingertips. So a researcher who's interested in a particular aspect of a, you know, geospatial, you know, um, piece of kind of city research is adding to that common knowledge base. Um, but I, you know, I do think we have to go beyond that and bring that into, and that's what the assessments do. They assess all the knowledge and they try to distill the common findings. So that's the key that um, IPCC brings to the table on this issue. So it's a balance, right? It's a balance of specific space-based, place-based research, and then distilling larger points from that. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, everyone. I'm Narsim Har Rao. I'm the assistant associate professor of energy systems here at the Yale School of the Environment and gives me great pleasure to serve as a moderator for this session. Uh, I'd like to thank the uh, panelists, for many of whom have traveled from far away as well, so I'm very grateful for that. What I'd like to do is um, make some initial remarks of my own, building on what Dr. Barrett has said, which is really useful. I'll then introduce the panelists briefly, and then we will give about 15 minutes to each of the panelists to speak up to 15 minutes. We're hoping that within that 15 minutes, I'll leave room for a few questions of clarification only if anyone in the audience has that. And after all the speakers have spoken, I'll kick off a conversation among the panelists with a few questions of my own. And I will leave ample time after that to have questions from all of you to, uh, to ask the panelists as well. So I'd like to first start out with the theme of this session, which is net zero carbon cities and electrification, future global challenges and solutions. So electrification is uh, kind of the foundation of an energy transition. We figured out how to uh, electrify um, buildings and transport and systems, and we know how to uh, make electricity production renewable. And electricity is a very flexible fuel that has a lot of benefits in, uh, in, in serving end uses. So that's an important uh, aspect of our energy transition. But cities are uh, really a locus for this radical transformation we have to undertake. You heard that over half the population of the world are in cities today and that's growing. But get this, more than three quarters of the energy demand is from cities and that share is growing. And there's some cities around the world, such as in South America, where over 
of the population live in cities, and that share is also growing. So that's the fact that energy demand is concentrated in cities makes it an important locus for electrification. Now, electrification involves a radical transformation in how we use energy in buildings and transport in the least. Um, in industrialized countries, this involves a massive repurposing uh, and retrofitting of buildings and transport uh, at a scale that we haven't seen, of course. And the use of electricity involves cultural shifts in our homes and in how we change how we think about mobility. When we think about the Global South, uh, we think about cities that don't even exist yet. And we have to think about the fact that cities have to preempt the lock-in of carbon intensive infrastructure. But we also have to remember that cities are dealing with social challenges other than just climate. That we have tens of millions of people who are living in substandard housing and informal housing, who have poor access to services that are essential to meet their basic needs. And they have to undertake this massive transformation in that context. And we have a big ambition gap, as you know. We have this big disconnect between our, our vision that we understand in our models and scenarios of how we need to transform society and what's happening on the ground. And we hope to shed light in this panel on some of those uh, disconnects. Um, I think there is some hope for uh, optimism despite these challenges. Um, all of us, one thing we share is that we've contributed to the sixth assessment report of the IPCC. And I'd like to ask the panelists to reflect a little bit on what they learned on the most recent advances in this report. From my perspective, a couple of things stand out as being uh, signs of optimism. So there was a chapter on demand for the first time in this IPCC report, chapter five. And there were a couple of takeaways from that that I think are extremely important. One of them is we've found growing evidence of the synergies between reducing energy demand and also having co-benefits for our quality of life, our well-being, reducing air pollution, reducing mortality. It involves lifestyle changes, but also involves changes in the structural aspects of the built environment in urban form and how we get around. Uh, and so that's something that uh, that's, uh, um, has signs of optimism. The second element is uh, we've also found in our research that there's synergies between energy demand reduction and these lifestyle changes and reducing social inequities. So focusing on public housing and public transit that serves low income communities more that has the potential to reduce our overall energy demand growth. So there's synergy there. And, and so that's also a sign of optimism. So with those uh, remarks, let me now introduce the panel. We have Professor Benjamin Sovakul, who will be joining us remotely, who's the director of the Institute for Sustainable Energy at Boston University. We have Dr. Sheer Kilkis, who is a senior researcher at the Scientific Technological Research Council in Turkey. And we have Professor Angel Su, who is an assistant professor of environment and public policy at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. So let me first invite uh, Dr. Sovaku for his remarks. Uh, thank you very much. And you can hear me OK? Yes, we can. Excellent. As an American, I often don't have to ask that question because people always think that we're loud when we speak abroad. But it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. And apologies, I couldn't come there in person. Um, uh, if you can enable screen sharing, I can share a hopefully spectacular presentation, which will wow everyone, of course. In the interim, I can at least also confirm that one of the greatest advancements in the IPCC report was indeed the addition of Chapter 5 on demand, which was a great overdone or overdone addition that I think uh, is a great novelty. Ah, perfect. And there. Here we go. So, as uh, I was just introduced, I am now at Boston University, although I still have an affiliation here at the University of Sussex, hence the very colorful slides. And I think that's actually quite useful because there's a lot going on in Europe. And I, I think as much as the American in me likes, you know, pride in the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and other progressive, you know, parts of California, New York, and Vermont that are doing great things. There's a lot that we can learn from cities uh, in Europe as well. You can also see a lot of technology trends that are European-centered. And so I think that to kind of set the backdrop, the scale and scope of our global energy transformation to reach net zero by mid-century is mind-boggling. As Co said, it's an intergenerational challenge that perhaps is unique. We haven't even experienced with the Marshall Plan. 
I like using some of the International Energy Agency data only because the IPCC is great, but their synthesis reports take five to seven years to come out. And so the, I, the IEA and Bloomberg are giving us data every year. This is from their most recent net zero roadmap, and it's just till the end of this decade. So I quite like this because it's like in the time it takes to build a nuclear power plant or in the time it takes a PhD student to maybe finish their PhD and their first postdoc. Over that amount of time, we will see wind and solar, which are already the fastest growing sources of electricity on most grids, uh, almost quadruple in size. We will see battery electric vehicles grow. Um, these numbers are okay in this graph. I like to switch it a little bit. There were 1 million EVs in 2015. And according to the International Energy Agency, by mid-century 2050, there will be a billion. So we will go from 1 million to 1,000 million battery electric vehicles in our generation. And we also have to keep putting massive investments and innovations in more mundane things like energy efficiency, heat pumps, windows, insulation, uh, better materials, uh, retrofits, refurbishments that help save massive amounts of energy. It's also important to think about what will have to happen in the global south as well. And so we still have about 700 million people around the world who cook with traditional fuels, who don't have access to electricity grids. As I tell my students, that means cold showers and warm beer uh, and a variety of other things. No Netflix, no email, no mobile phones, no fax machines. Uh, and so we have to get them universal energy access, which also means we have to see a transformation in microgrids and mini grids and solar home systems and biogas digesters and micro pico hydro facilities, just to name a few. I really like how Co talked about industry because we also have to decarbonize that. And this graph is great because it really shows how industrial decarbonization is no longer a problem of the global north. According to the projections from the IEA, you can see the two side by side. The bulk of future emissions will be in India and China and Brazil. And they're in very difficult to decarbonize sectors like steel and cement and chemicals. Finally, uh, there's a tension in the innovations literature and in that we may not have all of the technologies we need to decarbonize. So I think Co also mentioned negative emissions, carbon removal technologies. Those are at a very early stage, enhanced weathering, direct air capture, biochar, um, or even some of the more weird ones like solar geoengineering, aerosol injection, cloud thinning, cloud brightening. The IEA has predicted by mid-century that mature technologies, so technologies that are established today, like wind farms and solar panels, will only account for about a quarter of our emissions reductions. All the other emissions reductions are dependent on either early stage technologies that are just being adopted or at the demonstration stage or just on paper like fusion or small modular reactors or fourth generation biofuel. However, to give a little bit of optimism here, um, if you look at the numbers in the net zero literature, it's a massive investment opportunity. The envoy to the UN called it the greatest business opportunity of the century. We are expected to see $100 trillion invested into net zero infrastructure by mid-century. This looks a bit lower because it's numbers per year. Its annual investment will reach as much as five trillion per year in 2030 and 4.8 trillion per year in 2040. But if you add it all up year by year by year from today to 2050, we'll see massive investments. And you can see on the left, all those different colors show there's no winner takes all. It's gonna be across buildings and transport and electricity and fuels. And there's no real technology winner. Uh, electricity's in blue, so electrification, but look at the other rules, CCS, hydrogen, other renewables, et cetera. The co-benefits of this also can be quite large. My colleague, Amory Lovins, often says that low carbon solutions are the free lunch. You get paid to eat because for every dollar you invest in them, you get $5, $10, $40 in co-benefits, health, fuel savings, resilience, diversification, and so on. Cities, I think, are really legitimately taking uh, the lead in a lot of action. Uh, I really like this article that you can look up later in Nature Sustainability from Patrick and colleagues that kind of cataloged a few years ago the number of cities that were banning cars, and it is literally dozens of them, right? You already have active bans on the beloved conventional car in Paris and Athens, Madrid and Rome by 2025. That's for like three years from now. In my very lovely London, uh, where I spend a lot of time, also implemented a similar ban. 
these are sorts of interventions that people probably never would have anticipated in the 90s because cars are such a part of individuality and freedom, especially in markets like the United States. You also can see uh, cities taking progressive action in the Nordic region. Uh, this is the five countries of Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland, and Iceland. You can see here, similar to what Ko was saying, a massive shift towards cities, like 70% of the Nordic population now lives in cities and about 90% will live there by mid-century, which means a lot of innovations are happening in these cities. Whether it is very sophisticated heat networks, fourth generation combined heat and power, which is using intelligent monitoring and integrated wireless reading, integrating straw and biofuels and agricultural waste and waste heat recycling, as well as tri-generation, where these facilities provide not only electricity, but heat, but cooling, steam, and even occasionally other types of energy services like storage or thermal regulation. You also see uh, widespread use in these cities of innovations like ride sharing or car hailing. I think it's amazing that even before COVID, about 60% of commuters in Helsinki did not commute by car. And it gets very cold in Helsinki. Uh, they commute by mass transit or by walking or by cycling. And a final area that Nordic cities are leading the way is EVs. This shows you charging points for electric vehicles in Oslo from like six years ago, which also gives you a sense for why Norway is the kind of king of EV adoption. 70% of new car sales these days are actually full battery electric vehicles in Norway. And their per capita adoption is 41 times greater than the second biggest market, which is China. I mentioned this, uh, I wanted to mention this as well, which is that cities, especially those in Germany, are also innovating with kind of progressive policy instruments. And so this is the avoid, shift, improve framework. It is in chapter five of the IPCC. Um, and it's quite clever because it suggests as you decarbonize things like transport, the solution isn't only to avoid the need for cars, it's also to shift towards more energy efficient modes like mass transit or cycling and to continue to invest in innovation, improving fuel efficiency or parking spaces or the size of vehicles or the weight of vehicles or better pollution control devices. I was amazed to see advertisements here in London um, last year that a new Jaguar, which is not uh, EV, will get 95 miles per gallon. And that's not a hybrid. So we continue to make technical improvements to conventional cars alongside fuel efficiency improvements and others in EVs. The avoid shift and proof framework also implies it's a bundle of policy instruments. It's not just one, and they have to be implemented to simultaneously stimulate what you want, sustainable transport, disincentivize what you don't want, fossil fuel transport, and invest in innovation. Finally, I wanted to end on perhaps a wacky note, and that is that a final place in which cities are innovating is truly radical or transformative or unconventional or first of a kind projects. Uh, this is the Thames River Barrier, which is in London. It does flood control. So if sea levels do rise and we see the melting of the Antarctic or Greenland ice sheets, uh, it can handle a sea level rise of up to two meters, I'm told. Uh, it took a lot of money to build, uh, but it helps regulate the river. And it also will protect London if we see severe storm surges and flooding mid-century or end of century. Uh, the Thames River Barrier has been a model for others, like New Orleans has talked to them. Places like the Netherlands and Bangladesh have also talked about piloting similar river control systems. We just released a report at my institute last week on direct air capture. These are facilities that reverse climate change because they actually suck carbon out of the air and then sink it and store it. Uh, most C uh, DAC and DAC with carbon capture and storage literature are focused on rural areas. This is, you know, this is a hypothetical picture of the deployment in Colorado. Our report instead looks at cities. How would we potentially couple DAC systems in the built environment, on schools, on hospitals, on university campuses? And it's very telling that Boston's Green Ribbon Commission is the one who sponsored our assessment of direct air capture. So cities are actually taking an interest in some of these very new emergent cutting edge technologies final thing that it will do, I think climate change is even changing what it means to we think about a city and we think about new urban forms. We did a fun article this year in my research team looking at solar space-based geoengineering. This is literally putting things in outer space. Uh, and it's an idea that actually has a long history. We cataloged more than a dozen, the table's not complete, more than a dozen 
proposals in the peer-reviewed literature, in the proceedings of the National Academies of Science, in you know some of the top journals in the field that have talked about putting sun sails or other things in space at the Lagrange point between the Earth and the sun to then dim the sun and help reduce temperature change. And I agree the idea sounds a bit fantastic, for better or for worse, but the advocates of these things, including the interplanetary sun shield, have a very compelling narrative. They say, unlike interventions on Earth, this one is extraterrestrial, so it won't use emission sources here, and it won't have any impact here as we build it. And also, unlike things like aerosol injection or even afforestation, which are prone to unpredictable consequences or wildfires, you can turn this off if it doesn't work. And you could even microwave energy from it back to the Earth so it both promotes mitigation as well as climate protection. How does it lead to new urban forms? Well, we had access to a proposal from Airbus Space and Defense and the European Space Agency, and get ready for it. It literally shows us the building of moon bases as well as other solar extraterrestrial based space stations, as well as potential exploratory missions to Alpha Centauri. So we could create an entire moon economy, right, as we simultaneously uh, decarbonize and, and try to promote kind of climate mitigation. And again, as, as much as this proposal seems pretty extraordinary, um, we did expert interviews with people at NASA, Boeing, Raytheon, Airbus, and other top aerospace companies that have similar competing proposals. And the advocates say that building this solar shield will cost only a trillion dollars, one trillion. Think what I just showed you earlier, where we'll have to invest a hundred trillion in net zero. So the argument is it's one one hundredth of the cost uh, if we happen to design it. And think of all the co-benefits, robots, moon colonization, Mars missions, et cetera. Coming back down to Earth as my last slide, this isn't the only radical way in which we can reconceive cities. We could also create floating cities, which have been proposed by architects. Maybe they were inspired by Kevin Costner's water world. But the idea here is if we can't actually adapt our built environment fast enough, then we could build entirely new cities that could handle any level of sea level rise. And that could also serve as an emergency uh, kind of, you know, a safeguard for evacuations and refugees if we lose entire low lying states. Uh, there are multiple competing designs for these lily pad floating cities as well. So climate change, not only are cities leading, but it could lead to radically new forms of what a city even is as we grapple with this very significant challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salvakul, for laying the groundwork of the solution space uh, and expanding our vision for what we might include in that. Um, are there any specific questions of clarification uh, that anyone wants to ask now? You can take one or two questions if there are any. Yes, please. Hi, thanks so much for your presentation. Uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about uh, the report you just launched last week around uh, direct carbon capture in cities. What kinds of solutions seemed most promising in this area? Great question. Um, you start to learn with many of these technologies, there are multiple ways of configuring them, like offshore wind and onshore wind or concentrated solar or distributed solar. It's kind of the same with DAC. You can do high temperature and low temperature, and you can also do it fueled with uh, gas or with renewables. And so I think the most sustainable forms for cities tend to be lower temperature ones, right? So they're not having to get really, really hot. So low temperature direct air capture facilities that can be coupled to things like heat pumps or geothermal networks, or solar, or perhaps wind, although they're not so good because you don't have a lot of wind generation in the urban environment. But it's kind of those ones that avoid the need for natural gas and methane are quite good. Uh, and they also can create synergies because, especially for some of those systems like geothermal, their base loads, they're always on, but demand fluctuates at night. So you can then use kind of surplus energy at night when people don't need the geothermal energy to then actually store carbon dioxide and draw down emissions levels. So I think it's those particular innovations that probably have the most technical appeal for cities. All right, thank you. Let's move on to the next speaker, Dr. Kilkis. Sure. Good 
morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here in this panel, in this conference, and to share with you my perspectives on towards net zero carbon cities and electrification. Yes. Um, so acting quickly and more integratively is urgent. And it's important that we act upon those solutions that we have in order to support having as much as possible the CO2 emissions by 2030 for any chance of remaining within 1.5 that's so important for uh, maintain, uh, maintaining within and avoiding as much as possible tipping points. And it is true that although already about 24 countries have already recorded sustained reductions in CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions in the last decades, and you will see here in the blue bars that an important part of that also came from supply of, uh, of electricity and heat and the energy systems, how they were uh, supporting these cities, but also many other things. And for more countries and for all countries to be able to reach the reductions that are necessary uh, in front of us, uh, they need to mobilize the urban areas because urban areas will support countries in reaching their mitigation targets. This is the reason that in our recent IPCC report, we had a very good emphasis on urban areas and urban systems as key places for system transformation to limit global warming. In this contribution and remarks, I would like to focus on three keywords, net zero, how cities can support bringing the world to net zero, integrated strategies, how integrated strategies can play a role in bringing our cities uh, to be more sustainable, and how urban action can also accelerate decarbonization. When we say electrification, it's about how we power the buildings, it's about how we power the transport entire districts and entire cities, also including heating, cooling, and mobility in the energy system. Urban planning is also related to this, and it's about how we plan for urban areas that provide positive cascading effects across sectors for effective climate mitigation. And better cross-linking these two, electrification with urban planning can support urban areas in their mitigation efforts. Our findings also emphasize that urban areas can create opportunities to increase resource efficiency and decarbonization through the systemic transition of infrastructure, the buildings, transport, and how these are laid out, and urban form, towards net zero emissions. So urban systems, they are a key aspect of the solution. When we look at where we are now, urban areas with their consumption-based CO2 and methane emissions, they had about 29 gigatons equivalent, CO2 equivalent in 2020. And this was up from about 25 gigatons in 2015. So urban emissions are increasing. And with moderate mitigation efforts, we see that it, they will continue to rise about 34 gigaton and with only low mitigation efforts up to 40 gigaton. And these are some of the numbers where we might be leading. But with ambitious and immediate mitigation efforts, the global consumption based CO2 emissions, they can be reduced to at most three gigaton CO2 equivalent in 2050. And what do we mean by ambitious and immediate mitigation efforts? So for all different types of cities, the three main strategy areas, they focus on better urban planning for reducing and changing energy and material use. And here we see electrification in combination with switching to renewable energy sources and enhancing carbon uptake and storage in the urban environment. That's also very important for co-benefits, the shade that we need when we're walking in an urban area. So when all of these come together, they can make the reality for the figure that you see on the, uh, uh, on the right and trying to bring the emissions to net zero versus if there's only moderate mitigation efforts, not maybe doing one but not the other, then we will see uh, the graph, uh, the other one. So when all of these can come together in integrated and resource efficient and compact ways, the urban emissions, they can reduce between 2020 and 2030 about 9.8 gigatons CO2 equivalent. And you can see uh, the dashed uh, bars, 
how the reductions will take shape in these different regions. And with all, only moderate uh, progress, uh, then they will rise uh, 3.4 uh, gigaton. Our findings also emphasize that, especially in the ambitious and immediate uh, mitigation efforts, electrification supports integrating net zero energy sources in urban infrastructure, so buildings, transport, and especially in those systems where there's high penetration of renewable energy, when there is flexible energy demand on the demand side in mobility, heating, cooling, these can absorb greater shares of variable renewable energy. Countries and regions that are predominantly powered by renewables on the electricity side, these are increasing around the world. But when we look at entire energy systems, their heating, cooling, tra uh, transport, uh, they, these will require greater integration. And these include physical, institutional, operational uh, integration. And what do we mean by this? So there's, there can be smart grids, including thermal grids. There can be demand site management, demand response. And not only relying on grid scale electricity storage, which is uh, among these options, uh, the most expensive one, but on the demand side, there's much that we can do, bringing in the urban infrastructure and including the flexible demand in the urban areas. And with this, it's even possible the 100% in net zero energy systems. So urban areas, they are layer and they are a system within themselves also interacting with other urban areas across the world through their supply chains, their materials. And when we look at these layers in a given urban area, so energy, it's important to realize that electrification of energy and uses in cities and efficient demand can mitigate about seven gigatons CO2 equivalent by 2030. And decarbonizing electricity also brings this about 75% of the total. Then layer by layer, we also see land use interacting with buildings, transport, also energy. And we see here that better urban planning and service provisioning has the potential to reduce energy demand by about 20 to 25% by 2050. So when all of these interact, it can really make a difference. Yet, there are some lock-ins to overcome, for example, natural gas use in buildings. Uh, but when we are able to mobilize these solutions, it's possible that urban areas can reach their full greenhouse gas mitigation potential, also taking into account their extended supply chains. There are different types of cities and there are different patterns of urban growth within cities. And for example, when we classify the urban growth typologies, they can be established, they can be rapidly growing, and there can be emerging. So not planning for cars, but planning for people living in those urban areas. And when we look at urban form, it can be compact and walkable, or it can be dispersed and autocentric. When we bring these together and look at them uh, 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 in a, a matrix type of format, we can see that different mitigation efforts in these urban areas can hold a relatively greater mitigation potential according to the cross comparison of urban form and urban growth typologies. When we look on that bar for the established, we also see that electrification holds a very important role in the uh, integrated strategies of these urban areas. So electrifying not only vehicle by vehicle, but electrifying public transport, and not electrifying only building by building, but also using large scale heat pumps in district heating and cooling networks to decarbonize at scale. Another findings of, of IPCC emphasizes that bringing together urban land use and spatial planning for walkable and co-located densities, together with electrification of the entire urban energy system, can hold multiple benefits for sustainable development goals, and even more so when multiple mitigation options are brought together. Here we see the comparison of the mitigation options and their linkages with sustainable development goals. We see, for example, urban land use and spatial planning, electrification of the urban energy system, urban green and blue infrastructure, and we also see there are more synergies. There could also be trade-offs, but not, uh, it cannot, uh, if we plan for them, they can be minimized and only the synergies can take place. But bringing these mitigation options together in an integrated way, there can be very promising synergies to be captured by our urban areas. Feasibility is also multidimensional. It's not only economic, it's not only technological, but also including geophysical, environmental, ecological, institutional, and sociocultural. 
And there are different enablers and barriers across these uh, urban options for us to consider and plan for and to coordinate whenever possible. But an important part of enablers and barriers is the institutional capacity and uh, their governance and cross-sectoral coordination that's uh, required. So when we look into working across these different solution areas, we see that high levels of electrification combined with energy and material efficiency, renewable energy preferences, behavioral lifestyle, all of these need to come together in how we see the mitigation uh, of urban areas. This is also closely aligned with the illustrative mitigation pathways at the global level, where we need system transformations in energy, system transformations in land use, lifestyle, and uh, policy. So the, uh, especially in shifting pathways where low demand comes with renewable energy, it's important that we see this as a horizontal aspect also being supported by urban areas. So urban areas, they have a key role in mobilizing integrated action for reducing emissions across multiple strategies. And here we see what those emission uh, trends could look like for the top 420 urban areas with the largest greenhouse gas emission reductions. Looking into one region in which we're here today for this panel and conference, 79 of the top 420 urban areas are located in this region. And starting from about 300 gigatons CO2 equivalent in 2020, it could be possible to bring these reductions with different temperature outcomes to different levels, but by 2050, even zero um, uh, CO2 emissions by 2050 with large shares of renewables in the energy system. And it's possible to capture co-benefits. And what do we mean by co-benefits? The energy, health, air pollution uh, related uh, benefits, the uh, climate cost savings, these can all be mobilized in our urban areas that we're living in, in about 9.7 trillion uh, USD in 2050 for all of these top 10 urban areas across these regions. So intensified climate change requires intensified action for net zero and collective actions across all the urban areas, the regions, they can support making a world of a difference for net zero. So net zero, Urban systems have a key role for bringing the world to net zero, and this opportunity space is about 9.8 gigatons CO2 equivalent in 2050. Integrated, we need integrated strategies, including for electrification, to make this most effective. And possibilities for the integrated strategies, they include demand flexibility for renewable energy and more support from the urban infrastructure. Accelerates. Better urban planning accelerates progress for decarbonization. And when we look at the interactions with urban energy planning, there can be energy savings for more compact urban form and even less embodied energy use for materials. So with these three key takeaways, I would like to emphasize urban systems have a key role in bringing our world to net zero. Electrification requires integrated strategies to be most effective and better urban planning accelerates progress for decarbonization. So let's take the action or integrated synergetic action in our urban areas and urban systems. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for this uh, very insightful presentation on uh, urban scenarios and emission scenarios specifically and the interaction between flexible demand and options for supply. I think this uh, area of emissions scenario development is very unique and new. Um, are there any specific questions people want to ask before we turn it over to I'm so sorry. Sue? That's okay. <laughs> I'm happy to move on if there are. Let's go ahead. Okay, Thanks. I'm sorry, I got too excited, clearly. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> I forgot about the questions and answers. Um, well, thank you. Is it okay if I stand here, Will, or is, is the sound going to be able to... Okay, I need to stay closer to the mic. I'm just short, so I'm afraid that I'm going to get lost behind the lectern. Uh, well, thank you so much to Karen and the Hickson Center for organizing this conference and for inviting me back to New Haven. It really is a pleasure to be able to meet so many of my fellow IPCC authors. Ben, I'm hoping that we'll get to meet someday. Uh, he sent me a lot of emails and bugging me to respond to a lot of the comments. So I really appreciate all the work that you've done. Uh, before diving into my comments and the presentation that I prepared, I wanted to respond to Narissima's uh, question to all of us, which is to identify some of the most exciting 
findings from the IPCC and our contributions. And I think in addition to what was already said, I think the demand side chapter was incredible. I mean, thinking about how just from demand side responses alone, we can reduce emissions 50 to 80% across all sectors through many of the interventions that Shear and also Ben were talking about reducing and, and electrifying our homes, our transport systems, changing our behavior patterns, reducing food waste, shifting our diets. I recently got an e-bike, got an induction stove in my home. And so I think it's, it was really encouraging to read in the IPCC that now we have the science to back up all of the efforts that we've been wanting to take on climate change. And so that really, I think, removes a huge barrier in the question of why or when to take action on climate change. So I think that was one that was a really important takeaway. I think secondly, it's just the falling cost of renewables and a lot of these technologies that were talked about in previous assessment reports, but now we're seeing and we have evidence and data to show 85% reductions in some of these technologies, including solar PV, wind technology, and others. And so I think that was also really encouraging. And as a result, there was less emphasis in the scenarios on technologies like carbon capture and, and storage and sequestration and other far off technology. Sorry, Ben, on the geoengineering front, but that we have all of the technologies today available that are cheap and in some cases can actually net savings. So I really like that analogy of being able to eat your free lunch. And then I think third, and that the reason why we're here is just the potential for cities and, and for people living in cities to shift us towards a net zero pathway. And so um, that's where I want to start today. And um, I wanted to, to focus and structure my remarks around three gaps, the emissions gap, the implementation gap, and the ambition gap. So you may be asking, well, what do I mean by these different gaps? Well, uh, in the IPCC, we all love scenarios. And so I have here another scenario from the Climate Action Tracker. And you can see our historic emissions in green, and then the other colors are different pathways of where the policies that we have to tackle climate change can get us. In blue and in this tan color, these are current policies on the high end and on the low end that national governments have put in place that are, they're working on now. This is if we project them out to 2030, where they're gonna get us by way of global emissions. And then in yellow and in orange, we have pledges that they have continued to think about or to place on the books revising their Paris pledges that they initially put out in 2015, and that gets us to these scenarios in 2030. But then in red, this is the scenario and the challenge ahead of us if we wanna keep that 1.5 degrees Celsius scenario within reach. And you can see that's about a 25 to 28 annual gigaton carbon dioxide equivalent gap between the most ambitious implementation of those pledges and targets and where we need to go. So a pretty significant emissions gap. Secondly, we have an implementation gap. And this is something that we mentioned in chapter four of the IPCC. So it's easy to develop policies, to say that you're gonna take actions on climate change, but what makes it more difficult is to actually implement them. And so what we've estimated in that chapter is about a four to seven gigaton of carbon dioxide equivalent length gap between what policies have been put on the books and their actual uh, potential achievements in 2030. So that's the implementation gap. And lastly, and Arisama alluded to this in his opening remarks, is the ambition gap. And so if we look at the optimistic net zero pledges that countries have put forth, and our net zero tracker now has gauged about 134 countries around the world have committed to these mid-century or earlier decarbonization goals, that still leaves us an 18 gigaton carbon dioxide equivalent gap between these net zero pledges that are on the books and where we need to go for 1.5. My research has focused on the potential then for cities and other subnational and non-state actors, including businesses, somebody asked about private actors, to try to address these gaps in emissions, implementation, and also ambition. So let me now walk you through some of the results in terms of non-state and subnational action and how it might be able to fill these gaps and where we're seeing action and unfortunately where we're not seeing as much implementation. So first on the emissions gap. For those of us who, like me who are global governance scholars, the Paris Agreement, which was negotiated and agreed upon in 2015, was really exciting because it was a departure from the previous Kyoto Protocol that was a top-down instrument and was really focused on states and national governments. And what the Paris Agreement did is it flipped it on its head and it allowed for national governments to decide themselves what they could contribute. But most excitingly, and this is what this slide shows, I pulled out a text from the Paris Agreement itself that recognizes for the first time 
the contribution of all actors in society and various levels of government to contributing to the Paris Agreement. And so this was quite exciting. Social scientists have long theorized the role of non-state and subnational actors to help catalyze climate action. We heard about that from Co. being able to inspire national governments, other higher levels of government to take deeper and more ambitious action. Um, local governments are thought to be more adept on the ground, be able to adapt climate policies to local contexts, and also build capacity on the ground for actually implementing climate action. For me and other scholars like myself, we've also theorized that actually these subnational actors can have a direct effect on global emissions. They can actually contribute to policies that are more ambitious than what national governments have pledged. And we know that this is quite critical because of political cycles. And often you could have a national government one day in place that addresses climate change only to have those actions reversed by a new administration. This happened in the United States in 2016 and also in Brazil and countries around the world. And so for us, our question has really been, do these measures actually add up? If we aggregate all of the different efforts that these levels of government and various actors have pledged, can it help to narrow the emissions gap? And this is a critical question because in the lead up to the Paris Agreement and beyond, there are tens of thousands of cities and businesses and uh, financial institutions, also civil society organizations that are coming forward, they're pledging their own climate actions they're forming what we refer to as international climate initiatives that I've illustrated here on this slide to work together to tackle very ambitious climate actions. One example is the New York Forest De Declaration and that pledges to halt deforestation by 2030. Another one is RE100 on this map where multinational companies have pledged to consume 100% renewable electricity by 2030. And then you have the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy, which was started by former New York City Mike Bloomberg and that has close to 13,000 different cities that are all pledging their own actions on climate change. So we have about 300 of these ambitious climate actions on the books. At the same time, individual cities have also come forth and they're designing their own climate action plans. They're setting their own ambitious climate reduction targets. This is a map of a database that we've put together with nearly 13,000 cities all around the world that have pledged their own emissions reduction targets. This is from our Climactor database. And so our question has been, do all of these efforts add up? And if they do, what do they add up to? And are they additional to what national governments have pledged in those, I can't remember the colors, maybe the blue and the, and the gray scenario. And so that, that, this is what was really featured in chapter four and to some extent chapter 13 in the IPCC. This is our emission scenario figure again, and you can see the two degree range in purple, and then that 1.5 degree range, which is even more ambitious, and what we found is that looking at subnational and non-state actors in just 10 high emitting countries, including the US, Canada, Europe, plus the UK, China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, Mexico, that added all together, just 6,000 of these city efforts and around 2,000 corporate efforts can yield an additional one to two gigatons per year in 2030 on top of what national governments have pledged. That's factoring in for overlaps between emission sectors and then also national government policies. So that may not seem like a lot, that tiny bar, but to me that was really exciting because it quantified for the first time the aggregate additional impact and tells us that these actors can be really impactful in helping to narrow the emissions gap by about 16%. And then when you look at those initiatives, we looked at about 20 of them where we could find evidence of their implementation, that number grows. It gets much bigger into this purplish blue bar where actually in just these 20, um, it, just in these 20 initiatives, that can get us back on track to a two degree Celsius range. So there's a lot of potential here. And a lot of that is actually coming from cities and regions you can see in that particular bar. I just got the three minute mark, so I need to speed up. Um, but of course, these numbers that I've just presented, they rely on a massive assumption. And that assumption is, is that every city, every region and every company actually follows through on their pledge. They actually implement those actions. That's a huge assumption in these figures. And so that brings us to the second point of the implementation gap. Where do we actually see evidence that cities are implementing actions and they're achieving these goals? Well, this is a much harder question to answer and that's because of a data availability problem. I'm sure all of the students in the room are shaking their heads. If you ever try to do any research project and find data, it's incredibly challenging. And that's the same with trying to find evidence of implementation. Fewer than 10% of those 13,000 cities that I just mapped actually have available emissions inventory data for us to be in, begin to even answer this question. And so I'm giving you a sneak peek of a report that's gonna be coming out in October. This is the fourth 
of our Global Climate Action in Cities, Regions, and Companies report. And the picture, as you can see, is not great. Um, all of the, the countries that are shaded in shades of red are where subnational governments are uh, not making um, are not making enough progress on their targets. And so in these countries, less than half of these cities are actually making enough progress to stay on track to their goals. We can zoom in closer to Europe, where actually 90% of available emissions inventory data are, to see that the picture is also quite bleak. I know that, that uh, Ben was very positive and optimistic about Europe, and I think they're doing a lot of really great things, but at least from the data, and in, in here we were able to use the density of uh, emissions inventory available to then train a machine learning model to then predict across all of these 11,000 cities and find that only half of them are actually on, tar on target or actually had to achieve their 2020 emissions reduction target. Um, I'm, I'm not going to have time to really go into this complicated figure. I won't quiz you later, but just to say that we're looking uh, and bridging to the next gap on ambition that progress is not aligning to ambition. So some cities are actually growing their emissions. And then uh, many of these targets, even though it, it, if they're not on track, but they're also not compatible with a 1.5 degree scenario um, trajectory. So that's what the dotted line is here. And only these cities right here are, have actually set targets and are actually um, ambitious enough to help us move to a 1.5 degree world. So we are seeing that progress simply doesn't match ambition. And so that leads me to the last point, which is the ambition gap. And so we've heard a lot about this net zero uh, uh, goal that the IPCC special report is, uh, or actually really the Paris Agreement established, but then with the IPCC special report in 2018, motivated the scientific community and also policy actors to also set their own net zero targets. So this is a Google trend search and you can see the IPCC report and interest in net zero has just really ballooned, it's exploded since then. And at the last climate change negotiations in Glasgow, it was very clear that net zero is now the new parad paradigm. It's now the new normal. And there were businesses, there were, I mean, it was actually crazy. It felt like it was like Davos because there were so many businesses there all talking about net zero, so many cities. I was on a panel with the mayor of Miami who's also doing really incredible things. And they're all racing to set these net zero targets. Co talked about 800 cities. That was in the IPCC in chapter eight. And now it's even more, it's about double double the number of cities that have set net zero targets. And so that's incredibly exciting that all these cities are racing to go net zero, but um, I think the, the ambition doesn't necessarily match. Um, so what can they do? What should they be doing in order to achieve these net zero targets? Karen, Galena, a few of us, we wrote this um, paper that was talking about what net zero might mean for cities. And you can see the three buckets of where we have been um, uh, developing a framework to think about net zero and decarbonization for cities, obviously reducing demand, also supply side man, uh, measures, and then also enhancing carbon uptake. But are cities actually doing this? Are they actually aligning their climate action plans with these key buckets and recommendations? Well, we've uh, done a huge text analysis of close to 5,000 city level climate strategy documents. And what we found in their themes and their major topics across all of these different strategies is that there are many supply side measures. So I think that's good. A lot of the things that Sheer and Ben have been talking about in terms of focusing on transport, lighting and buildings, energy efficiency, and uh, talking about um, uh, municipal actions and fuel switching, a lot of the supply side measures are there, but what we're not seeing are the demand side management measures or the consumption based measures. And to me, that's a huge gap that I hope that we can dive more into in the panel discussion, because for me, it's difficult to be credible on net zero if you are not including scope three out of boundary emissions, which for cities can comprise from anywhere from two thirds to three fourths of their overall carbon footprint. And what we found in looking at the net zero targets of cities was this tiny little scope three bar here where less than 17% of them are actually saying anything about scope three emissions as part of their net zero targets. So we don't wanna fall the way of Copenhagen, which recently reneged on its ambitious 2025 net zero target. They said they're not gonna meet it. And it's because they simply cannot get their carbon capture online to make up the 20% of emissions that they still are gonna emit after offsetting the other 80%. So to me, that's a really critical issue and making sure that while we're racing to net zero, we can also do it credibly. Uh, just one more plug, I know Colleen, I'm out of time, but we just launched a climate global stock take hackathon. So I'm hoping that students here will be really excited. I would love to see a YSE team win this. You can win a free trip to COP27 in Egypt based on data analysis. And um, we were asked by the co-chairs of the global stock take for the UN to help them host this. 
and you will have an opportunity to present on Science Day if you're one of the winning submissions. So just a quick plug, go to climatedatathon.org. Hope those folks listening online will also join. Thank you, and I'm so sorry for going over time. Thank you so much, Dr. Stacey. Well, a lot of questions. Uh, it's fascinating to see the amount of momentum that's been gathering. We've seen a lot of pledges. We have a lot of solutions. But I'd like to now push the panel to think about sort of what's the disconnect with reality? And about what's, what are the barriers on the ground? What are the different issues we really need to tackle to really get this going? Uh, so along those lines, I wanted to start with the question of, you know, what should we, what should cities be thinking about in terms of net zero? So we can think about net zero as cities contributing to national targets for net zero. We could be thinking about cities themselves seeking self-sufficiency in energy production and becoming net zero themselves. But as you mentioned, we have the significant footprint of out of boundary emissions coming from consumption and global trade, but we also have supply of energy outside of the city boundaries, supply of food outside of the city boundaries. So one part of the question is asking, what should we, how should cities be thinking about their contributions in net zero? But the other part of it is what are cities doing when they make these pledges and they have these plans? How are they drawing the system boundaries? Uh, you know, are they restricting it to certain operations as we talked about last night, such that they can look better in terms of their achievement of those pledges? How many are looking beyond to its scope three? So both in terms of ideal and in terms of what's actually happening on the ground, how should cities think about net zero? Um, Who would like to go first? Yeah, she, please. Yes, thank you. So it's clear that net zero is not going to uh, happen overnight. And cities need a long-term planning to cover all of their emissions, including the scope three, which is currently uh, a deficit in the mm -hmm. uh, trends. At the same time, cities need a starting point uh, and timing matters. So for example, if cities plan now to say, I'm going to be net zero with my territorial emissions while also planning for scope three, and they do a uh, phase approach, uh, that could also be effective. This is not to exclude that cities should not be planning for scope three now, they should. And it's very important for all of the emissions to be accounted, but also the target setting. And the reason I'm saying this is there's a recently launched mission. So it's close to the Marshall Plan that Co was mentioning to mobilize that great scale effort. This mission on climate neutral and smart cities is bringing in 112 cities to reach net zero by 2030, which is in the next uh, seven years uh, almost. So uh, in this, they are focusing on territorial emissions, but not to be excluded. So all the cities that want to go and further, maybe it will not be 2030 because the entire global supply chains would also need to be decarbonized. So net zero cities need to be contextualized within a net zero world where all the supply chains are also involved in this effort. But for that, capacity building is also important. So this mission, in order to support the capacity building in those cities, they are mobilizing teams to work one on one with those cities to ensure so we cannot be fail safe. There's always a governance issue whether these uh, targets will be realized or not. And uh, for example, when we do a Monte Carlo analysis with plus or minus 10% for whether these cities uh, net zero emissions can be reached, it's also a very short margin in which these cities can come to net zero. But even when in that margin, a narrow margin of opportunity, mobilizing the capacity in cities can uh, be as close as we can get to fail safe as possible. I think that Ben, yeah, we can go to Ben, please. You're muted. I, I've been told I have a big head, but I don't think my head has ever been this big. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, just two quick reactions. I, I fully support the point that each city's net zero plan, right, should be enforceable. And I'm sure that there's going to be very different types of profiles. Detroit's will be more on industrial, probably decarbonization, where others like Los Angeles are more transport because each city's emissions profile is going to be very different. Um, for me, I think the two things to keep in mind is, first of all, there are some policy tools that only cities do, like city taxes or building codes. So I think those are kind of levers that cities are well positioned, municipal taxes, municipal bonds, um, that only cities can do them. And so that really opens up that kind of solution space. The second thing is more of a constraint, and that is don't lose sight of equity. 
all too often decarbonization pathways put climate first. And there's been scores of fascinating studies that have showed solar adoption, EV adoption, even the placement of trees and green spaces, bicycle lanes, parking spaces for EVs are all unfairly distributed in cities. There's even a classic sociologist who called cities in the 70s containers for elite interests. The job of a city is to monopolize wealth for the elite. So if that's the case, transmuting climate action through cities could entrench elitism and inequality. So I think as we think about how to decarbonize, we got to make sure that we're not also losing sight of equity. And if I can just add to the great comments by Ben and Cher, I fully agree with both of you. I think one, to answer your question about the conceptual and theoretical piece, um, one of the, the, we wrote two reports on, on net zero and how to think about it from the subnational and the corporate side. I think one is um, the, the idea that cities can't truly be net zero if they're still embedded within fossilized supply chains and, and energy structures throughout the world. And I think that's really challenging is how can a city it can't, they can't operate as an island. If they're connected, if they get their electricity from a state level or a regional grid, and that's not decarbonized, how can they truly actually reach net zero emissions? And so I think that from a policy and governance perspective, that just emphasizes the need for coordination at different levels. And so I showed a lot of this data, talked a lot about the additionality, and for someone who's, who's thinking about these virtuous policy cycles, it makes me a little bit nervous that I won't have any research to do in five years if everybody coordinates and works together, then we won't have any additional impact because everyone's coordinating but i think for net zero that's absolutely what needs to happen we all have to get on the same page and realizing that a city doesn't have power even though they do have the ability to affect building codes and, and municipal taxes they don't necessarily have the ability to transform centralized electricity supply systems and so that i think that's one 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 thing that's critical about um, net zero and then i think that the second piece to, to talk to point to is um yeah again these out of boundary and these scope three emissions. And that's one area that we're seeing a huge gap. And so for me, it's, I think our citizens and individuals should be incredibly skeptical of any city that says that they want to get to net zero if they're not looking at these out of boundary scope three emissions, which for many cities can comprise the majority or even more of their overall emissions footprint. And so what we say in those reports that we launched in 2020 is that perhaps it's critical for cities to first most look at their emissions profile, think about what are the direct emissions that they can actually get down as close to zero and then think about the rest. And in many ways, that could be more credible, credible, just an ambitious emissions reduction target rather than racing to get to net zero in a very uh, greenwashed way. So I want to get to your points on equity just a little bit later, because uh, I'm very interested in that. But before that, I want to pick up on this idea of coordination. So um, you know, we've heard that a lot of responsibility rests on the shoulders of local subnational actors at city levels. For example, things like building codes are unique to them. But we also know that we're talking about tens of trillions of dollars of money that has to flow. And I suspect that a lot of city governments don't have access to or you know, the authority over those kinds of funds. So we need coordination at multiple scales, you know, internationally, within countries, federal government to cities. So how would that work? How are we going to think about coordination, multiple scales? Also for step for goal setting, right? Do the targets for cities match the overall targets for, for countries? So how would you think about that in terms of innovations and financing, coordination in terms of target setting, and what's happening in that in that realm, or is that a big gap? Ben? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I can reflect on this a little bit. Um, um two ideas. The first is that I think angels work is really important because it, it does imply beware of ambition. Sometimes, right, the ambition is higher than what cities or other subnational actors can actually do. At the same time, ambition could be a good thing. Mm -hmm. And you all may not have seen David Victor published an article last week about climate ambition just in the Paris Accord. And he actually found that the more ambitious commitments are the more credible because it implies people actually take it seriously and there's a coalition behind it. So it's kind of this weird notion of you know the political economy of ambition and whether it's good or not to have strong ambition or not. The second thing is that we had a grant from the Luke Hoffman Institute a few years back that looked at cities as well. And we did like a complicated analysis of like more than 300 cities around the world and found that the most significant predictor of whether a city decarbonized was whether it was part of the Kyoto Protocol. So this also implies that like city regimes are still stimulated by international governance regimes, even though they're separate. So it's these international things that can also be a, 
a boost or a nudge that helps cities decarbonize. Yeah, just just briefly to add to um, the great points that Ben made. Um, so we actually found something opposite <laughs> with respect to ambition. That your point about being in a Kyoto country, absolutely, we saw that as well. Looking at a thousand European cities, that if a city was located in a country that was also meeting its Kyoto target and reducing emissions, they also tended to be on track to achieving their emissions reduction target. But we actually found a weakly negative or no correlation between ambition and actual achievement on the city scale for Europe for just these 1,000 cities. So I think definitely more research needs to be done to try to tease out this tension. And that's what I flew by at 90 miles an hour in my slides about thinking like there, there are two sides to the same coin, looking at progress and ambition. Um, but yeah, I think I think those are those are really interesting um, comments. But I mean, I think absolutely, um, it's actually really interesting how um, seldom those dialogues happen between national governments and subnational and non-state actors. And I'm always surprised in speaking on both sides, speaking to both sides, how little those conversations and that dialogue really happens, and how little that coordination is actually happening. And I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that could easily be gained. In coordination and helping to funnel resources to local governments. I think the Inflation Reduction Act, that's really huge. I've been having conversations with the town of Chapel Hill, and they say, help us think about what climate mitigation measures we can go and ask for. So I think this will open up a huge opportunity. And, and absolutely, there, there needs to be coordination to make sure that those resources get funneled into areas that, that need them the most and, and, and to help cities actually capitalize on many of these opportunities and to help realize their ambition. Because we're seeing, at least in the data that we've collected on a historic basis, it's not happening. In addition to um, Ben's and uh, Angel's excellent points, I would also like to emphasize that countries need to see cities as part of their strategy mm -hmm. for net zero. And when this does, does take place, uh, uh, for example, when cities are planning for their net zero targets, for example, Turkey also has a target for uh, net zero by 2053. Uh, we're trying to emphasize that unless cities are pulled into this mitigation effort and unless urban systems uh, are, are uh, contextualized in the countries and even the world's net zero targets, uh, this needs to take place. Otherwise. Uh, it's not going to be a coordinated effort. And when cities race to net zero, so the cities race to net zero is an excellent ambition. Uh, but when cities race, they should not race individually. They need to race collectively mm. because this urban systems perspective that was so essential in our IPCC report also emphasized that cities are connected across the world on a, on a global basis uh, through energy, materials, supply, trade of uh, flows of, of people and everything, of resources. Uh, so. Uh, this idea of, of also contextualizing this net zero target in the net zero target of the world uh, needs to take place when cities are collaborating together. Yeah, the, the Inflation Reduction Act has some provisions for funding for capacity building within cities to be able to mm -hmm. figure out how they can solicit funds for uh, developing new building codes and figuring out how to you know, make plans that would be appropriate for their, for their local region. So this brings up the question of the capacity of cities, you know, so what you mentioned how we have very poor data, so mm -hmm. we have tons of pledges, uh, but not many of them are able to think about implementation so i'm trying to think about what gaps there are at the city level, how do we need to uh, increase the resources to be able to understand. Understand you know the emissions profile in the cities understand how to solicit funds from national governments or otherwise and what other gaps in terms of sort of the capacity of local governments are there that we need to plug in order to be able to move forward in implementation. Uh, I can start. Yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, we need to, I think, uh, we need harmonized databases. So bottom-up reporting from cities is very important, but at the same time, there's so much data that can be used to support instead of yeah. wasting a lot of time trying to build up that data. A lot of uh, infra data infrastructure can support the cities. Mm -hmm. I think the global human settlement layer can be um, an excellent basis to support cities more, not only related to emissions, uh, like satellite uh, type of gathered uh, monitoring uh, emissions, but also the land use efficiency. Because as I showed in my slides, urban systems, they are layered. Land use, energy, buildings, transport. And if we don't have enough um, re recognition and awareness that data on land use efficiency exists in the global human settlement layer, uh, then 
are cities using that and are, are they integrating that type of understanding in their uh, planning when they're planning for energy savings are they thinking about urban planning and when they're thinking about electrification are they thinking about district-wide solutions mm -hmm. that can support for example uh, again as Ben also mentioned district heating and cooling it can help this uh, scale up of, of solutions so I think capacity building at the city level is very important because cities are the users and creators of data but at the same time we need more harmonized data structures across the world uh, uh, capacity in Latin America and Africa can be very different from other parts of the world and varies not only by region by region by city by city so a very small city in Italy for example uh, they also have very low capacity for these types of uh, so this is my uh, answer to your mm -hmm. question Yeah, just, just to push on this a little bit more, just thinking about also the what we talked about earlier in terms of the demand side of, uh, of the electrification. So we're talking about smart homes, uh, smart buildings, we're talking about redesigning public transit infrastructure, maybe having new modes of transit, such as, you know, shared mobility using electric scooters and, and things that could potentially provide services that don't exist today for people who don't have good access to transport. So there's you know, on the, on the demand side of electricity, there's a lot of learning that has to happen. But a lot of that is currently under the jurisdiction of utilities, you know, who manage customers, and they don't necessarily always have the incentive for some of these changes. So there's another aspect of coordination there in terms of building flexible, you know, flexible demand and, uh, and, and, and uh, new generations of customers understanding how to manage an electricity system. So how do we think about solutions on the demand side and deal with other actors such as utilities coordinating with cities uh, or is that something that just needs to evolve as utilities themselves alter their culture towards uh, you know greater electrification and incorporation of electric transport well i mean I, I think that's a huge opportunity for cities to further reduce emissions from the demand side that they're frankly not doing from the policy perspective and so when we did that large scale analysis, this is great because I didn't get a chance to fully describe that, but when we looked at all of their climate action strategy documents, we looked at close to 5,000 of them across the world. That's one area where they're not focused nearly enough on. It's, it's really just focused on the supply side and, and the things that we talked about, providing sustainable transit and, and focus on energy supply me me measures. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for cities to actually develop concerted policies that are aimed at incentives and behavioral nudges for citizens to want to take uh, fewer car trips or to switch their uh, to electric vehicles. They can provide subsidies and incentives mm -hmm. for citizens to actually shift or um, subsidies, tax rebates for um, changing out heating and cooling systems to, to HVAC and heat pumps in their in their homes or switching uh, out natural gas to electrified forms of cooking in homes. I think there's a lot that cities can do that frankly we're not seeing them do nearly enough of in their strategies. And so I, I'm one hope, and then I think for this future cities IPCC report is to make the science and the evidence very clear for cities. So I think we have a role in this translation too, to try mm -hmm. to take the science and make it understandable into policy, concrete policy recommendations and actions that cities can then take. And so that's, that's one area that I think I'm very hopeful that we're st we'll start to see some of these dots being connected better and cities designing policies that can really focus and capitalize on all the demand uh, side responses. Yes, Narasimha, to your excellent question and also uh, building on mm -hmm. uh, Angel's points, I would like to emphasize uh, that we also need business models to be able to utilize the data. Yeah. So for example, mm -hmm. even if we have all the data collected from smart, meter, uh, smart meters on the bu uh, buildings of every single uh, household, mm -hmm. uh, we need business models to be able to utilize that data and to make a difference for the CO2 emissions. So it, for example, prosumers, how they're integrated or how uh, the uh, electricity generated from prosumers are shared within a district, mm -hmm. for example, energy communities. Uh, this also needs good quality data generation, but also business models to be able to utilize that data. Yeah. Uh, so for example, demand flexibility, it requires hourly and even instant instantaneously, a very low, uh, very granular resolution uh, to be able to supply the demand and, and uh, demand and supply in the entire energy system. Mm -hmm. uh, but without also the business model supporting that energy transition, uh, we need to fill all of these gaps, the data gap, also the business model gap. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good point, yeah. yeah. Uh, ben, did you want to say something on this? Yeah, point? thank you. I, I want to just temper some of this optimism. It's such a nice, positive, <laughs> uplifting discussion. Um, just three quick 
quick reactions based on our own research. So we, we have done some work on a meta-analysis of smart meter deployment around the world. We tracked a data set of half the world's smart meters over 30 years and found that there, there are couplings of smart meters to demand response, but in reality, the biggest beneficiaries of smart meter deployment are not households. It's utilities and DSOs, like two thirds of the benefits go to them. So it's like we use the language of, oh, it's energy democracy and empowerment, but it's actually just rewarding incumbents, especially fossil fuel incumbents, or they wanna do it for remote disconnections. We also did a study looking at local electricity exchange. The cool term is peer to peer trading in three European countries and found there the same thing. It doesn't benefit the consumers, it benefits the tech companies, Siemens, Apple, Google, Hive. Um, and finally, and most seriously, we just did a study on prosuming that actually found that it can open up domestic abuse because you can have people track real-time energy and then husbands can monitor wives and kind of see, is she having an affair? And mm -hmm. in extreme situations, you can use these apps that you can, dark apps to install and actually track people's movements. There's even, if you want to look up not only surveillance capitalism, there's even a term called menstrual surveillance, where things like smart toilets will monitor women's menstrual cycles and then let insurance companies know they're pregnant before the woman does. So there's a whole dark side to these digital technologies and to prosuming that I think we have to at least acknowledge exists and, and definitely accommodate. Um, a wholly digitized smart city and smart home could also just open people up to vulnerability, hacking, um, and lack of privacy. So we just have to be careful. Well, let's move to the dark side then for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm interested. So there's a digital divide problem also with this mm -hmm. smart technology. We haven't talked a lot about the global south cities. So I'm interested in asking about justice. I mean, there's so many layers to this. A lot of these solutions are solutions that uh, people in, well, even in, even in this country can ill afford a lot of these solutions. And so to what extent can we piggyback on these solutions, access to services that people don't have today? When we think about cities in the global south, people are concerned about justice at an international scale. Right? Are we getting the financing and support to be able to undertake these large scale solutions at all? And then those have to filter down into where they're implemented, which is in cities. And we want a lot of that to flow to the demand side, not just in supply, because it's going to be more efficient. So how do we address this justice aspects? Well, not just in theory, but are cities thinking about that when they talk about the city plans, or are they just thinking technology? Uh, is equity in their radar screen at all? Yes. Uh, when we talked about the multidimensional feasibility assessment, for example, we see that when public participation is increased and when co-benefits, there's an awareness of co-benefits, this can support. So wherever the starting yeah. point of cities in shifting their uh, uh, pathways for sustainability, yes, the starting point is very so, so much. Uh, but when uh, this understanding of, of, of co-benefits, for example, um, air, air quality co-benefits, and when this is communicated, and for example, when uh, a plan is done in a particip participative way, people also say, yes, I had something to do in, in this uh, transition, and I, I could take a point, but empowering also the people, uh, social housing combined with renewables or uh, different mindsets can also uh, support this. One of the case studies uh, also in uh, chapter 13, we collected case studies from different different parts of the world. Uh, Benjamin may want to say more about this, but electric trams in uh, 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 Uganda, for example, this was one. So this leapfrogging that we do not have to go through the same path as other cities have done, for example, in the global north, but we can leapfrog mm -hmm. and we can avoid these uh, lock-ins or we, at least we can plan to avoid these lock-ins. That would be necessary to address both equality, justice, uh, affordable energy, and uh, these benefits that can be provided uh, when the planning is, is done uh, to address comprehensively, inclusively all of these aspects. And one of our findings is this type of bringing in equity and justice type of perspectives can accelerate the progress around the world. Um, I think I want to leave room for all of you to ask questions. I have one last question I'd like to ask the panelists, but I'll hold that off until I hear from all of you. So please ask your questions. Clarification. Oh, thank you. Um, so I have two questions. One is just a quick point of clarification, and then the other is a more in-depth question. So I just wanted to make sure you were talking about scope three emissions, and um, and in this context, 
are you talking about the municipal operations themselves and those emissions or the laws, policies, and enforcement that cities create to move corporations within, you know, that are operating in those cities? So that's just the point of clarification that I'm seeking. But then the, the other question is um, thinking about equity. What municipal systems must be dismantled to move toward net zero and create environmental justice? Now, Rashima, that question's for you. <laughs> Listen, I, I'm not going to steal time from all of you. We have limited time with all of you. Do you uh, want us to answer or do you want to no, take? Yes, if, okay. If, you, if, you, if you'd like to answer, please go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the scope three question. So by scope three, we're talking about out of boundary emissions. So it wouldn't necessarily be municipal operations or emissions arising from municipal operations because those would be considered scope one, they're direct emissions. So scope three would be if they transport waste somewhere else to be dealt with or processed also the importing of different goods so if they import food from outside of the city boundary and it's consumed within the city boundary the emissions associated with growing that food transporting that food refrigerating that food and then bringing it into the city and so that's that's really what we mean by the out of boundary scope three emissions and so they're critical because if you're like um and actually in terms of net zero from the corporate side we see that a lot of the companies that are leading on corporate net zero targets are those that don't have significant supply chain emissions or out of boundary emissions. They're the Googles, the Microsofts, where their only emissions are electricity based within buildings. And so it's much easier for those companies to make net zero targets as opposed to others that have much more complicated iron and steel, cement. These are all sectors where they have very complicated um, uh, emissions to get all the way down to zero. And then, um, yeah, so that's what, yeah, what we mean by, by scope three. I don't know if Cher, you wanted to add. Uh, you had also a second question. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, the dismantling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Benjamin, would you like to take that one? Yeah, <laughs> um, a, a great question. And there's no easy answer, but we published a review in Nature Human Behavior earlier this year, and it was great. I got the team up with a political economist, an energy systems analyst, and a food systems person. And we looked at four innovations, food sharing, clean cook stoves, EVs, and solar energy. And I think the framework we used helps answer this question. So the framework identified four types of inequity that get cemented often in urban systems as you decarbonize. There's demographic inequity. So that's you know people of color or marginalized groups, or it tends to be white affluent neighborhoods that benefit first from decarbonization. But there are three other types. There's spatial inequity of preference for urban areas or within urban areas, affluent neighborhoods, things like EV charging points or grid connections for solar feed-in tariffs. Then there's also interspecies inequity. So this is where we damage other forms of the environment, land, air, sea, water, deforestation or solar energy would be an example. And then finally, this intertemporal inequity, which is where we create burdens for the future, whether it's embodied waste flows like e-waste in solar, uh, or you have a kind of you cement a, a lifestyle of, of excess food sharing always presumes you have excess food to share. But if you're food poor or you have no food sovereignty, it's not the case. So I think you could reverse that framework for how to answer your question of what needs dismantled. We must simultaneously dismantle demographic, spatial, temporal and interspecies inequity. Yeah, it's a nice way to address yeah. it. I would also add, I think we need more research to really understand the politics of decision making at that level to understand what we need to dismantle. But yeah, uh, let's take more questions. Uh, Sorry. Uh, hi, Reed Lipset. Um, so this is hi, nice to see you. <laughs> um, probably a question for, mostly for Angel and and Ben. So I uh, was the lead author on the policy chapter for the International Resource Panel's study on material efficiency in climate change. And um, what I found was an astonishing lack of policy evaluation. I mean, basically a, a complete desert. Yeah. And while some of the material efficiency policies are new, some of the things that you've been talking about, some of them are very old, the waste related ones. And nobody seems to go back and say, how effective was this policy? And so where we talk about getting data or even harmonizing data, there's a companion part to this, which is 
are the data any good? So first of all, the data have to be good in order for you to draw any reasonable conclusions, or let's just say good enough. And then the other thing is, um, as the first speaker said, you know, what research should we be doing? Well, where's the research on the effectiveness of the policies, not just the technologies, but actually the governmental side where, you know, we put in a tax, we change the building codes or whatever. How much progress can we actually attribute to that? Do you want to collect questions or? Um, or I can, sure. I can just, okay. We can, we can take another one. Okay. Yes. Um, so in, in now global effort for zero carbon city, it appear we are hitting a same paradox of lumper or slip uh, or splitter. One size fit all, which we know don't work, doesn't work, or everybody reinvent their own wheel. So does the IPCC or a similar body, um, can, you, can we come up with a playbook for a city planner can go in there and look through a playbook, pick a play according to which continent they're in, which part of the continent they're in, a country or sub-region of the country. Do you have time for another? Why, why don't you try answer those and I will uh, address the next question. <laughs> so, um, hi, I'm Jeff Speck, I'm on the next panel and will demonstrate that I'm relatively new to this space and so easily fooled. Um, but I have almost finished reading Ministry for the Future, and I think you get a certificate for that. Um, being easily fooled, I'm just curious, I've never heard before about the IPSS, the International Planetary Space, uh, Sun Shield, and that sounds like an incredible solution. So is it real? And um, why doesn't that just serve as the silver bullet that makes all these other conversations unnecessary? Okay, I'll add one last question to the mix before I let everyone respond to whatever they feel like responding to. Uh, I'm a junior in high school. What can the youth and younger folks do to create active and positive policy change, whether it be local, state, national, or beyond? So what's the role of youth? How can they contribute? Um, does anyone want to respond to the questions by read on, um, yeah. Yes, uh, I would like to take your question on how do we see these different types of uh, solutions for cities uh, what we try to do in our IPCC Chapter 8, it ends with this roadmap for uh, integrating mitigation options for different types of cities. So we did not do this on a regional basis, but you can see how these different types of cities, they do have dominant patterns across these regions. And for example, for example, established cities, uh, what, they can, what they can do uh, for, for uh, reaching net zero and decarbonize. So uh, in that a uh, uh, roadmap that we tried to put forth, we did try to differentiate how the mitigation options hold greater mitigation potential for different types of cities. And uh, wherever the growth pattern, whatever uh, the urban form of, of these cities, wherever it may be, uh, the aggregation of those strategies or how they come together, they can be identified uh, by looking into these uh, patterns of cities. Uh, for the youth uh, in the opening presentation, it was also emphasized how urban places are uh, bringing the individual to the collective. So uh, for the question online that we received, uh, awareness is also important. Uh, so for example, the, the infrastructure may be there, uh, but do people uh, take the opportunity to use that infrastructure for walking or bicycling? So the awareness for the demand side options, that plays a very big role uh, and it can integrate with the urban planning, but uh, awareness building, uh, you know, we talked about uh, scope three emissions a lot. Uh, that consumption of goods and services is us. It's, it's, we are uh, uh, contributing to that scope three emissions. So even uh, that can be the materials that we choose or the food, not wasting any food. All of these have a great, great impact uh, on the uh, uh, overall picture. But urban planning can bring all of those opportunities together. Yeah, I'll just um, briefly respond to Reed. Hi, Reed. <laughs> Your really great question, and I think that's really the the major challenge for me as a policy researcher to try to get the data so that we can answer these questions of what has been delivered. And so a lot of what I showed is exactly trying to throw a lot of data science at it, machine learning, trying to develop proxy indicators that can help us identify 
the, the, the signal through the noise and whether or not we can actually see evidence of any for any progress being made. But I think um, going back to the urban planning piece, what a lot of cities are now doing is actually thinking from the outset, okay, what kinds of data, what are the metrics that and the indicators that we wanna track to know whether or not we're meeting goals on, um, on uh, transport or on buildings or other types of indicators. And I think that's really critical to try to close some of those gaps. And yeah, the resource efficiency, what I, what we're seeing in the policy documents, states and regions tend to be focusing in countries as well. Like I, I, China, circular economy, these are all really big topics that they've been working on, as you said, for decades, but it hasn't necessarily trickled down to the local level. So we're seeing that as well. Um, and then just briefly to the youth, I mean, I think that the youth are doing a lot, actually. I feel like I derive inspiration from them every day and, and just making sure that they're holding local leaders accountable. I think that's another key point in addition to having them design uh, or advocate for meatless Mondays or, or for them to do a lot of the things that Shear said, I think also for them to hold local leaders accountable, like the uh, Greta Thunbergs and the Van Vanessa Nakates are doing, being present and in, in pressuring local policymakers to continue to be accountable. I think that's also really key and something that they can do. Mm -hmm. oh, great. We are pretty much out of time. I want to give an opportunity for any closing remarks that you want to make, and I, perhaps I'll prime you. And, I'm very curious that as scientists, what, where do you see the most important contribution to make in the next five years to try and really get these solutions on the ground? If you had a gigantic new grant to supplement your existing grants and work, where would you put that to? And in, in my mind, I would think you know, social science research is extremely important. We need more of that to understand decision making at all levels and where the barriers are there. And if you'd like, would you like to say anything about where you think our science needs to move from here? Then. <laughs> sure, yeah, I, I can actually frame it. I was going to answer the other questions too, but I can put it all together. So three very quick reactions. The first is, I think this notion of what are the impacts of policies is very important. There was another IPCC author, William Lamb, did a great systematic review called What are the Social Outcomes of Climate Policies? A review of the ex post literature, so when we actually had those ex post evaluations. But the shortcoming with Will's review is it was just climate. I haven't seen them for food and water and waste and minerals. So, I mean, imagine if we were to have a similar systematic review. That's a great research agenda that I would, would love to see funded. Um, the second point about youth, I think, is also very apt, right? This kind of blends into what are the direct action techniques, also in Ministry of the Future. You see some wicked stuff there, assassinations, social movements, disruptions, strikes. So are there other levers that we can do that aren't behavior, technology, um, and innovation? Uh, and there are by, you know, but how do they work and, and what lessons can we learn from previous social movements that have been successful, like anti-slavery and anti-racism? And finally, radical solutions like the interplanetary sun shield, which would lead, I think, to a scope for emissions, by the way, which is outer space. Um, <laughs> Should we take them seriously? Are there emerging options that fusion is another example that we could fund? And you can read the article we did about the Sun Shield. It's called Between the Sun and Us. I have to give my research fellow Chad Baum credit for coming up with that title. But we interviewed all the aerospace experts that talk about risks and benefits, uncertainties, to give a really balanced take on it, on these types of super mega projects that are very alluring because they could solve it all at once, but also tend to also have their own sets of risks like space war. Um, and anybody who's likes James Bond, Moonraker, that plays out in our interviews. People talked about space attacks and robots and nanotech, artificial intelligence. So yeah, it's uh, it sounds wonderful, but there will also be risk risk trade offs for these types of solutions. And I would love to see more research on those. I would also like to add that climate uh, climate science and urban uh, science has evolved much in the last five years, and it will continue to do so in the next mm -hmm. five years and more. Uh, but when we look, uh, so context sensitivity is very important uh, and uh, in, uh, upscaling these type of opportunities, but science is also needs to be at that, at that point that we're, uh, science is ahead of action. So science needs to be at a point that guides uh, future action. It needs to be actionable, but also show, show the direction. And I think this is where we've had a tremendous um, uh, uh, synthesis of information for integrated solutions. But we need more. So for the next um, uh, path of, of the IPCC, we need to continue this urban science to support the integrated solutions uh, for the cities. And uh, 
it's, climate change is too risky to bet upon. So you might recognize this phrase, but we need to do whatever we can, not rely on uh, technologies that uh, they are still immature, but do whatever we can, mobilize all our resources as much as possible, and really take this opportunity to have urban mitigation co-deliver the co-benefits because people are waiting for this. They're waiting for clean energy, they're waiting for clean air, and they're waiting for all of these uh, opportunities. So this is now is the opportunity to enable the urban systems to take the lead in uh, driving the mitigation efforts. That's a hard one to follow, but just my two cents. I think from the research perspective, one of the things that we're starting to think about is how do we actually incorporate the subnational and non-state actors into the integrated assessment models that have are the bedrock of a lot of these scenarios for the IPCC. So they're very much still on the regional basis at best, but how do we actually incorporate the individual policies and the interactions at the different levels into these models to get more accurate estimates of what their contribution can be in the future. So that's just one thing in the next five years that, that we want to work on. That's great. I thank you all personally very much. Please join me in thanking all the panelists for a wonderful discussion. Please enjoy a coffee break.
Okay, so welcome back, everyone. Folks are still getting coffee and snacks. I want to welcome our mayor, give a shout out to Mayor Elliker. Thanks for joining us. So in the first panel, we heard about, learned about um, net zero cities and how cities net, need to get to net zero in order for us to keep global warming at one and a half degrees C or below. And we also learned that cities cannot reach net zero if they only think about emissions within their own boundaries, that they absolutely need to think about the scope three emissions outside of their boundaries. This panel, we're gonna change gears a little bit to focus what cities can do within cities and specifically thinking about the spatial form of cities. In the fifth assessment report that was published in 2014, it was the very first time the IPCC had a standalone chapter on how cities can mitigate climate change. And this was really important because prior to the fifth assessment report, what cities could do or urban mitigation was seen through the lens of individual sectors. It was seen through the lens of transport, buildings, energy. And so the fifth assessment report was really this this radical shift in how the IPCC um, and in many ways the global, the international uh, policy community looked at how cities can be part of the solution space to reduce emissions. And one of the key messages of the fifth assessment report, that chapter on cities, was that cities need to think about their geographic space and very specifically how cities are laid out, where people live versus where they work is one of the biggest drivers of urban emissions, both in terms of transport emissions, but also in terms of building emissions. Because if it turns out that we, if we design cities so that people live here and work is here, it turns out that buildings tend to be a lot bigger. There's a lot of wasted space. There's a lot of wasted concrete to pave all that land. So that was the fifth assessment report, 2014. Fast forward to 2022. Eight years later, what did we learn in this assessment report? Well, one of the big new messages is not only do we think about the way in which cities are laid out, but that that layout of cities has this knock on or domino effect into scope three. It actually can change demand across a number of different sectors, not just in transport. And so this is a very exciting panel where we have three speakers who represent a continuum of, of different ways to think about and implement more sustainable cities. We have Professor Massonet from the University of California, Santa Barbara, who thinks about and researches sustainable energy, sustainable energy technologies as well. We have Kevin Kreisick, who's a professor of environmental design at uh, University of Colorado at Boulder, who's one of the leading scholars on how do we design and, and, and plan um, uh, sustainable transport systems? And then we have Jess, Jeff Speck, who is a city planner. He's a practitioner. He actually helps hundreds of cities all around the world design them to be more walkable. And in fact, if you haven't picked up his book, Walkable Cities, I highly recommend it. It is a very easy to read, implementable way of thinking about how do you design cities to be more walkable. So with that, I'd like to invite all three speakers to come up, and then we're going to start off with uh, Professor Massonet, please. Okay, make sure I'm mic'd. Well, thank you, Karen, for the, for the invitation to come speak today and for the wonderful introduction. And uh, uh, as Karen mentioned, uh, uh, my name is Eric Massonet. Uh, I focus primarily on energy systems modeling, material systems modeling, and I had the great honor to be part of this inaugural chapter in AR6 on demand. So as we heard this morning, this was the first time, somewhat of a radical shift for the IPCC, that low demand pathways uh, were featured in their own chapter as part of the overall mitigation book. It's not that demand focused uh, interventions weren't included in past volumes. So for example, recycling, materials efficiency appeared in the industry chapter, uh, food waste reduction appeared in the agricultural chapter and so forth. 
However, by combining uh, the, all of the evidence into one chapter and giving uh, a lot of thought to the, an analysis to the, the opportunity space that demand side interventions can open up, it raised the, vi the visibility of demand side pathways as uh, something else to think about on the road to net zero. And so what we did was we analyzed quite a few studies, hundreds of bottom-up studies, case studies, scenario results. And this was really the marquee graph uh, coming out of our chapter. It made its way into the su uh, summary for policymakers, figure six. I'm showing you sort of a micro version here. I would encourage you to take a look at the, the full infographic, which has a lot more information richness. But we found that the demand side, meaning reductions in energy use, resource use, all the while meeting the needs of every human on the planet through decent living standards could open up a massive uh, mitigation opportunity space in the form of, for example, sociocultural factors, which you see there in blue. These are behavioral changes, things like reductions in food waste, dietary shifts, uh, more recycling, infrastructure changes, so more walkable cities, uh, shifting people to public transit and so forth. And then finally, end use technology transitions, heat pumps and buildings. When we added it all up, we found that just by lowering demand on the demand side, we could uh, reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by about 40 to 70%. That's a massive step towards net zero without putting pressure on the supply side. And what we also found was by doing so uh, that, you know, the supply side has to work less hard, fewer capacity additions, less CCS, less land use associated with BECs and so forth. So there are multiple co-benefits to these pathways. Uh, and as we've heard already, I won't belabor the point on this slide, m m many of these pathways can be unlocked and run straight through the world cities, which comprise the majority of population and therefore the majority of energy use and greenhouse gas emissions presently. And when we think about the indirect effects of cities, you know, from an industrial metabolism perspective, all the food, all the building materials that are consumed in human settlements, that mitigation space even grows wider. So I'll focus in the limited time I have on low, you know, illustrating what we mean by a low demand pathway. And since this is a spatial oriented panel, I'll focus on buildings because my, my two distinguished panelists will focus also on, on transportation. So in the chapter, we, uh, we had two primary tenets. The first was to focus on services that are provided to humans rather than stuff, right? People don't necessarily demand stuff. What we need is shelter. We need thermal comfort. We need mobility. So the first focus is on providing those services through pathways that minimize energy waste, uh, minimize energy inputs, and minimize resource inputs. The second uh, tenet was we, we, we took this uh, avoid, shift, and improve framing approach in the chapter because it's very intuitive and Professor Sovacool mentioned it earlier today. What does avoid, shift, and improve mean? Uh, he used the, the example of transport. I'm going to use it here for buildings. And what I've done here is rolled up a lot of the, the, the measures that fall into each one of these categories. So if we think about how can we achieve well-being with, with our buildings with minimal energy and resource inputs, one of the first concepts is we need to avoid as much waste in the overall system as possible, right? So pro providing a square meter of dwelling uh, uh, with minimal amount of material, build buildings that last, uh, have them be materials efficient and so forth. So just avoid the demand for energy and resources in the first place necessary to provide a service. Then we think about, you know, shifting uh, more multifamily dwellings, more compact urban forms. And then finally, once we provide those services, do so in the most efficient way possible. And I've got a couple of pictures here because this improve column is something that the IPCC and many researchers have been focused on for many years. And you might say, well, don't we have a good handle on that? Aren't, aren't, don't we have programs for heat pumps? We've seen tremendous uptake of LED lighting in the US. The answer is yes, we have a lot of programs. We have seen progress. Many of us would argue we need a lot more progress on the efficiency front, but is energy efficiency enough? This was one of the major uh, framing shifts uh, in chapter five. And we can examine this question just by looking right here at home in the United States. So the first graph shows relative change uh, changes over the last 30 years in the US residential sector based on US Department of Energy data. So we have seen a lot of success in improving the efficiency of our building stock. Uh, over the last 30 years, energy use per, per unit floor area has dropped by about 25% through efficient appliances, uh, building codes, and so forth. However, at the same time, people are living in more and more living space, larger homes, more floor area per capita. That activity level is going in the wrong direction. 
with coupled with population change, what that means is nationwide, I'm sorry, the, the legend isn't showing up there fully, what you're seeing there, that top blue line is total floor area. And the net result is despite all of those efficiency gains, our activity uh, consumption, meaning floor area per person, has gone up, meaning overall energy use has gone up, negating all the efficiency gains. And there's an even more drastic story when it comes to transport. Again, I think the legend's appearing properly there. Over the last 50 years, we've seen decent gains in fuel economy, not nearly enough compared to other countries, but we've cut fuel use per mile by about 50%. But at the same time, vehicle ownership per capita is going up. Vehicle miles traveled per capita is going up, and the net result is a steep rise in transport energy use. So it's clear that to achieve low demand pathways, efficiency won't be enough. So when we think about buildings, and this is where I'll pivot a bit uh, in, in the uh, presentation, to talk what can we do beyond efficiency in our global building stocks uh, and, and put more focus on avoiding uh, unnecessary waste and resource use in the built form, shifting to more uh, compact forms, multifamily dwellings, which have ripple effects like making cities more walkable and so forth, in addition to efficiency. It's not that any one of these is a silver bullet. They have to work synergistically overall to reduce the energy and resource used to provide a service. And I've got a picture there of some you know, novel uh, sort of technologies and techniques that are coming in to reduce the material intensity of buildings. So more material efficient forms, for example. Material substitution, I think that will be discussed in future panels. Um, and cities play a critical role here because um, cities uh, have obviously use a lot of concrete, a lot of steel for the urban forms. And many cities around the world have great leverage into you know, the plans, the building codes, the specifications, the permits for those buildings. And we know that cities, by demanding through the right policy regimes, uh, low carbon industrial materials can really affect the footprint of the industrial sector. So the industrial sector is really difficult to abate, but a lot of those materials flow into cities. And with the right policies, uh, cities can enable, unlock that low demand pathway for industrial materials. So what am I showing you here? Um, this is a study that my lab did, came out last year, looking at the US cement and concrete industry. Globally, this industry accounts for about 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. And you know we've seen plenty of decarbonization plans that look like the one on the left, the production-centric scenario. We can get to net zero on paper by more, having more efficient industrial plants and frankly using a lot of carbon capture and storage. So those, you know, those wedges you see on the left-hand side get us to net zero, but we rely entirely on the cement and concrete industry and we need lots and lots of CCS. And if you follow CCS, you know that we're way behind where we need to be in terms of deployment, right? So we, we also looked into, well, what if we could have really uh, proactive demand side strategies, designing better buildings, requiring low carbon concrete, getting buildings to last longer, substituting concrete. Uh, and what we found was we could essentially eliminate the, the need for CCS, remove some of the pressure from the industry through better demand side policies and practices related to buildings. So the same savings, we get to net zero, but what we've done is we've opened up the opportunity space and we've empowered many more stakeholders. That's another key finding is that demand side strategies involve a lot more societal stakeholders than supply side strategies alone. And what you're seeing here are the exact same results. All I've done is taken the, the, the mitigation potentials and map them to different stakeholders. So in the production centric world, we have to rely on cement producers, concrete producers. Cities often don't have very much control over these industrial plants or industrial systems. However, if you see what happens here, the mitigation potential really shifts when we look at the demand side strategies. Now suddenly architects, designers, urban planners, city governments have a big role to play through specifying the right materials, the right architectural designs, and we've empowered a lot more stakeholders through these low demand pathways, still reaching net zero. So broader stakeholders as well. Um, and we know that these savings add up globally. These are some results just very quickly from the IEA who studied material efficiency uh, quite in depth. Uh, they've shown that just building material efficiency measures can bring global cement and steel emissions about a third of the way to net zero, just through using those materials much more efficiently and lowering demand through better building policies, essentially. Um, it's important to stress, though, that when we talk about low demand pathways, um, 
The pathway is highly dependent on the context, meaning income levels and, and development stages. So what we're seeing here is a graph we used in, in chapter five, informed by some work being done by Professor Rao and others who have tried to establish just how much energy is needed for decent living standards. So what we see here in that vertical blue bar on both sides is the range of energy use, roughly 20 to 50 gigajoules per capita per year, uh, researchers think is needed for decent living standards globally. Of course, in the develop, you know, developed countries, and especially at very high income levels, we exceed that you know, uh, by, by several factors, right? You know, multifold. Um, and so a lot of the low demand pathway opportunity space comes from current structures, current consumption patterns that frankly have a lot of waste in them, a lot of food waste here in the US, for example, a lot of wasted space, as Karen mentioned earlier. So for these countries, we need to find a different path to getting closer to just the amount of energy and resources that are needed um, and reduce the waste. However, um, in uh, lower income classes and uh, uh, the developing world in particular, um, we need a lot more materials and energy and more demand to raise people to decent living standards. So for, for these uh, situations, these low carbon pathways provide a roadmap as to how to build future cities, how to build future buildings, set up structures that enable low consumption in the first place, rather than sort of repeating the, 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 uh, the building of wasteful systems like we see in the develop, developed world. Um, and that's really captured here by this graph, showing just where the countries and different income levels sit with respect to uh, energy for decent living standards. What, what are the challenges related to the transition? So um, what you're seeing here uh, are some floor area trends uh, per capita by country, a few select countries in the world. And the red line there is coming from the low energy demand scenario. This is a scenario that was produced by researchers at, at YASA. Professor Rao was part of this team, which tried to establish sort of decent standards for living space, for mobility, for food consumption, and so forth. And you can see that in many countries where we've had a lot of space, getting back to the spatial theme of the, of the panel, uh, we tend to build larger houses, more space per, per, per capita, uh, also a factor of income than uh, many other countries who are either developing, and if we look at Hong Kong, that's a pretty high GDP per capita place, uh, very spatially constrained. They figured out how to provide uh, you know, decent living standards for many people, even below the, the target of the LED scenario. So steering this ship in the built environment is tough. It's going to take a long time. Can we get to that LED target or somewhere near there by 2100 in this country? It's possible, maybe we'll get close, but it's going to be a challenge for sure. So one, one aspect that always comes up is, are these plans realistic? This is what's technically possible, but do we have the, the financial incentives, the policies in place to achieve this? In many cities right now, we don't. The good news, though, is that we found also that uh, you know there are a lot of co-benefits benefits to low energy and resource demand, which you can imagine and which we heard about earlier today. So the point of this graph isn't to step through it in any detail, but what you're seeing here is in columns all of the SDGs and in rows all of the low demand strategies for different sectors. And notice all the blue. The blue means that a given low demand strategy has a strong positive effect for a given sustainable development goal, excuse me. So these pathways are highly compatible with the sustainable development goals that have been laid out. And you know, for example, food waste reductions, clear benefits for land use, clear benefits for energy use. Uh, telework, as we all saw, unfortunately, during COVID, and tremendous benefits to reducing travel for air pollution and so forth. So as I think uh, Professor Sovacool mentioned this morning, an investment in demand reduction reaps a lot of rewards in, toward other uh, sustainable development goals. Um, and in developed countries where we have a lot of waste, that's just part of our consumption patterns, part of our structural regimes, the good news is, is that there are a lot of behavioral change. this is, uh, changes. This is something else we explored in the chapter. And the IEA has done some wonderful analyses here, showing that um, while behavioral change isn't fully sufficient to get us to net zero, we still need technology change, we need infrastructure change supported by proactive policies. Behavioral change can deliver gigaton scale savings, mostly in developed uh, countries where we have a lot of consumption, we have a lot of waste. And the good news about this is, if you look at this wedge here, you can see that these savings can be reaped relatively soon with the right supporting policies. So this is another IEA graph showing the pathway to net zero uh, emissions through 2030. The technology specific uh, wedges 
all come a bit later in the time horizon, whereas the behavioral ones can come a lot sooner because they could be instantaneous with the right incentives and behaviors. Lastly, I'll just mention that we also examined several mega trends, digitalization, the sharing economy, and the circular economy, which could help enable and accelerate low demand pathways. However, what we found was a lot of these strategies aren't necessarily panaceas. So for digitalization, for example, there could be wonderful benefits by enabling telework. However, telework has to be done for the, in the right way, for the, uh, for the right segments, because if we end up driving more because now we're sitting at home or we run the AC all the time, uh, it could lead to growth in energy use. The sharing economy was a bit of a mixed bag, uh, especially when it comes to transport. Maybe we'll hear a bit more about that later. There are plenty of case studies that show that ride hailing might lead to more emissions and energy use if it's not managed properly. So the red zone there was our opportunity to point out system conditions that could lead to more emissions and more energy use that policymakers should be aware of and should track and should further study. And I'll wrap up with a call for further study. So we heard from uh, Co this morning about the need for more research. We heard a great question from Reed earlier about the need for more research. I can tell you after having examined hundreds of scenarios and case studies on low demand pathways that they are the uh, minority in the scenarios that inform IPCC thinking to date. So on the left hand side, we see it's a graphic I, I borrowed from the LED scenario. Uh, which was our guidepost in our low demand uh, work throughout the chapter. That's a rarity in the scenario literature. Uh, all the other scenarios that were proposed, or a lot of the scenarios proposed for the 1.5 report, even the AR6 report, uh, comprised a lot more energy use and had a, to rely a lot more on CCS, bioenergy, and renewables in order to keep temperature rise to uh, less than 1.5 or less than 2. And you see that on the right hand graph, kind of an ugly scatter plot showing where the LED scenario fits. Most scenarios aren't taking these low demand pathways into consideration. So it's a huge need and it's a huge research opportunity for anyone in the modeling space. And with that, uh, apologize for going a minute or two over. I'll, I'll wrap up and uh, uh, yield the floor. Thanks, Eric. Well, I'm going to first turn to the co-panelists to see if there are any comments, initial thoughts, reactions. Okay, and while they're thinking, I'm gathering their thoughts, I'll open up the floor to questions or comments from the audience, and I'll look online to see if there are any questions or comments. Okay, I'll take a, a few, so please. Oh, there are two in the back. There's one on the right. Thank you for the presentation. Um, one of the pathways you call for is reducing dwelling unit size, which I believe is empirically correct, but framing it that way is politically stupid, at least in an American context. Yeah. Um, how do you deal with that? No, it's a really great point. And this is something that is really delicate in the way to communicate these pathways is that um, anytime, especially in an American context, we talk about uh, having to do with less or reducing consumption, it's often a, a no-go from you know, public perception and policy perspectives. So uh, there are better ways of framing it because what we find is that reduced dwelling size can also bring lots and lots of co-benefits, more walkable cities, lower cost housing potentially, quicker pathways to decarbonization. So there is a big communication challenge, challenge that the low demand analysis community is wrestling with. I was at YASA a few weeks ago and we, we talked about this very thing. How do we communicate these pathways in a way that'll be publicly and politically palatable um, while also being you know, true to what the, the plans call for, right? Just a smarter way of living that respects planetary boundaries and eliminates waste. One pathway is you know, reduced dwelling size. If that's not palatable, there are a lot of other levers that we could pull in the building space, you know, lower material intensity buildings, more efficiency. There are ways to kind of make up for that. And we know that there's no one size fits all, right? Especially when it comes to the US. But it's a good point, uh, and it's something that we have to deal with when you know trying to take that next step, which is acting on these plans. There's one more question. Ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you. To what extent do the low demand pathway scenarios take into account increasing demands from climate change impacts? I'm reflecting on my experience in Vancouver over the last two years, the need for cooling, the need uh, of demand of rebuilding after the extreme weather events of wildfires and floods? Yeah, thank you. It's, it's a great question. So the first part is the low demand scenarios generally take into account 
the energy and resource services levels that will provide decent living standards for all. So things like more cooling, uh, more dwellings, more infrastructure are generally accounted for in those plans. Adaptation, though, is a bit of a wild card. So how much concrete steel will we need to sort of reinforce cities or adapt to climate change? I haven't seen a lot of work in that area. Um, and then also, we try to take into account the resource needs for development, right? So one of the challenges with industrial materials is we do need a lot of concrete. We need a lot of steel. We need a lot of new buildings and infrastructure to lift a lot of the world's population up to decent living standards and also to you know build the clean energy technologies that are needed on the supply side. So the, 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 the state of the art is frankly um, not good enough yet to really monitor and uh, capture all of those effects in our integrated systems models, integrated assessment models. And that's why there's just a lot more research needed on materials flows, uh, how they're linked to demand and behavior, requirements for decent, decent living standards. And I'll say it, a, lot of, a lot of that great work is happening right here at Yale in the Industrial Ecology Center. Okay, I see other hands, but we're gonna hold off for now. We're gonna come back to questions from the floor. I'm gonna invite Kevin, please, uh, to, the, to the podium. Thank you so much, Karen. It's uh, really an honor to be here. I am. Um, I appreciate your invitation and your wonderful team for their hospitality. I would like to focus my comments and put ourselves in the shoes of a political official. And they have incredibly difficult jobs, incredibly difficult jobs. And they're the ones responsible responsible for deciding how to appropriate public resources to attack all these challenges that we're hearing about. So they're bombarded on a daily basis, seeking to effectively respond to issues of climate, energy, security, community safety, and more. It's completely overwhelming. And so they turn their head up to the metaphorical tree and they try to look for things that are gonna make, be able to move the needle on things that they care about or that their populace, that, that their um, citizens care about. And it's, it's, it's staggering. And, and so, so often what we find is that we're favoring actions that are, have lower hanging fruit that relatively speaking, have relatively low impact. Why? Because they resort, result in, in quicker wins, right? And so lower hanging fruit really is, it's incremental. It's, it's really making tweaks to our existing system. Now, alternatively, higher hanging fruit is difficult for us to conceive because we need more funding, we need more resources, we need more time, we need more study, we need more research before we can act on something that is a little bit higher hanging. Now, my question here is, in our quest to do more with less, is there a high impact, low cost solution to solve some of these issues that might be lying right in front of our eyes? Is there a high impact, low cost solution. Now costs come in a number of different ways. Political costs are one. And I think it's difficult for us to kind of get that grasp because we, we know how much cloud brightening is going to cost. And that's going to be a lot, a lot of money. We know that uh, another action is going to cost a lot in terms of time. It's going to be like eight, eight years. Well, if we realize everything that we're hearing about, we don't have eight years. We, we need to be doing something yesterday. So how do we find these, these, these strategies? So I offer three questions here. Can we reduce total energy demand, improve our communities with low cost? I like to encourage us to think about where we live, where you go get your food, where you go recreate. Maybe you go across town to grab a bite to eat with friends. In our existing communities, most of these trips, certainly not all of them, most of them are relatively short. We can inspect data from the NHTS, the National Household Travel Survey, the most reliable travel data that we have for the entire US population to learn that every other time a car is used, it goes less than four miles. Every other time a car is used, it goes less than four miles. Now there is a denominator that already exists and applies to both urban and suburban communities. Relatively short distances. For most daily travel, even short ones, for centuries, the primary way that we've gone about satisfying this type of travel, and in many other communities across the world, not only is enabled by the car, 
it has prioritized the car. This is Los Angeles, and we see this in our city design. It's an aerial shot that is just one example, but it showcases what we see in most of these shots in most American cities and other global cities. There's lots of activities that are spread across districts and neighborhoods, and, but still most distances are relatively short. One third of a land area in all cities, globally speaking, is devoted to the public right of way. One third of all land area in most cities across the globe is devoted to the public right of way. Now, there's always going to be variations. Boston's going to be different from Miami, et cetera, et cetera. I'd rather be generally right than precisely wrong. <laughs> and how that space has been appropriated has been designed to favor automobile, automobility based ways of getting around. So cumulatively, the impacts of these decisions have had been mounting for some time, right? And we look at climate and you say, dirty fossil fuels being used to propel all these short trips. Don't worry, with the right incentives, like those being employed in California, we're gonna kick those cars off their internal combustion engine. We're gonna green them through electrification and batteries. Is this really a good idea, I ask? It's one that we've seen before an AMC Gremlin in Seattle in 1973. I love the 25 cents an hour you can charge it here. Okay, now repeatedly in policy decisions, we find ourselves finding ways to tweak the existing system, moderate this, examine the elasticity there, choose an option. That's fine, it's, it, except it's not fine. It's easier. It's easier. And we wonder why progress on these efforts is so slow. to get other people thinking about other ways to, of, of getting around town. So I would claim that we're suffering from a 15 centimeter problem, which is really, that's the length of our brain. We need a new mindset. We need a new mindset and we sit in 2022 here, there's a golden opportunity to push forth reform, a reform agenda based on the purpose of transport grounded in principles of accessibility, sustainability and social justice. These are some of the ideas that uh, are presented in my uh, recent co-authored book. We explain how uh, a reform agenda idea, uh, uh, coalesce. If you feel you're beyond an advanced introduction treatment, title given by the publisher, who required that I actually say this, um, then there are two other books that describe some of the bases uh, for what I'm going to suggest or encourage us to think about. Now, common themes from these readings are that transport can adapt to cities and cities can adapt to transportation, but in times of high uncertainty, which is what we're living in right now, how can we design for change and resilience? So we so often talk about the need for compact cities, and I'm all for compact cities, land use integrating with transport, transport integrating with land use, et cetera. We need to have these two things married. I'm going to offer that we have the existing land use. And if we just take the existing land use as a given, we could really move the needle meaningfully with just playing with the transportation lever. Just thinking about how that space that lies in between the private property lines in most of our cities is appropriated. Seeing street space as solution space. If we think back to April, 2020, um, COVID really helped us see how much space was available in our cities, right? And it, it just sat there laid bare. Not only did it lay bare, but we saw how quickly it could change. Seemingly overnight, many communities started to experiment. And together with my colleague, Meredith Glazer at the University of Amsterdam, we took this as an opportunity to study what worked, what didn't, and how new processes to imagine this new space were enacted. Now let's turn to the fact that yes, a, quarter, or a half of all trips are less than four miles. How can we redesign our communities overnight to get what we want and need in ways that are non-polluting and non-energy intensive, safe, equitable, inexpensive, convenient? If we look to solution space as street space, what does that look like? I think it looks like smaller, lighter, less energy intensive vehicles. Imagine the power 
of that solution that could be enacted. But to really take off, we're going to need to find ways to spur that growth, right? We're going to need to find ways to spur growth of these types of vehicles for our daily trip making. Because right now, what we're doing to save the climate crisis for transport, I would claim, is really isn't working. And there are real costs to continuing the ways that we're, th we're going about thinking through this. Now, I, I, I feel fortunate because when I was 16, I was expo first exposed to these ideas. As a teenager, my father charged me 18 cents a mile <laughs> to use our family sedan. I kept a mileage in the glove box. Every month we would settle up. I would give them five, six, eight dollars for the month or whatever. And to me, this exercise clearly demonstrates the value of, of thinking through how other cost-effective means to make most trips could be scaled up to solve some of the major crises of our time. And so if we continue to think about our mindsets of, of doing what we're doing, and we can get away with a lot more use of smaller vehicles, things that are maybe a, th a third the size of our cars, the size of a Christmas tree, for example. And how can we, how can we encourage these into our transportation ecosystem in a very formidable manner? Because right now, if we think about the soon to be Tesla Cybertruck and, or the GM electric Hummer, these things are a thousand power horsepower monsters. They, they weigh more than three tons. They can zoom zero to 60 in less than four seconds. They stand taller than a six foot human and they best the weight of a school bus. These are not what we want to be designing our future, future communities around. And you talk about a Marshall plan, these new Teslas, these new GM type vehicles, they are almost the size of what we used to see in World War II of the current tanks that were used. Not the current day tanks, because current day tanks are, of course, a lot bigger than they were back in the 1940s and 50s. And we're consistently reminded of the costs that we're dealing with in having to accept more of this type of decision making. And when I say the decision making, I mean us as the public who own that public right away. We are the ones who own that. We are the ones who own that space, and we channel our preferences through the mayor, and the mayor is the one that gets to authoritatively or not decide oh we're going to use this space in more clever creative ways but that has to go through city council and so what we're seeing in the case that i'm making is that transport is one of these integrative themes that really run very very strongly through all of these issues of climate energy security safety equity and if we continue with our current mindsets of how we're providing that accessibility to solve some of these issues, we're going to run into the same problems. So what is going to lead us to this meaningful solution? We need to really redesign our streets, and we can redesign our streets overnight. Now, is that going to happen? It's happened over the course of many years, sometimes months, sometimes weeks, in other communities across the globe. Every time, sometimes I go to uh, Amsterdam or Europe, this street used to look like that. Now it looks like this. Sometimes they redesign a street overnight. And so this, these are examples of, of streets in Amsterdam. There are just two. Um, there's hundreds of other examples in communities nationwide. Uh, there's thousands of other uh, demonstrations like this in other global communities from other countries. In the United States, we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, and what I'd like to suggest is that we're learning that streets can change, but it's taken us 150 years to kind of realize this. 
Uh, so I'm going to show you seven different pictures from Congress Avenue in Austin, Texas. Even things are changing in Austin, Texas. Uh, South Con Con Congress Avenue, the iconic Main Street of Texas, where we see in these historic photographs I'm going to show you, the Capitol is always in blue. What's happened on the road has changed its character, highlighted in orange. And what it's doing is it's keeping up with evolving technology. We're changing our streets. Granted, we're changing our streets over a relatively short period of time. And now we're slowly coming back to human scaled vehicles, even in Texas, even in Texas. Now, how are we going to marshal this, this ability? We're going to have to find new ways for people to really grab opportunities to think through how they're going to get from one space to an, uh, one area of the city to another area of the city through new safe networks. New safe, I'm not talking about a protected bike lane here, a change to that intersection. I'm talking about radically thinking about who has hierarchy on most of this street space and marshalling that. Uh, that knowledge. We don't need more research in this capacity. We know that getting around in town that is less energy consumptive can be realized. A key challenge here for us as the population, population is ensuring residents and decision makers, largely who are car users, that access is not being radically reduced in this solution. Rather, it's being augmented and transformed. We're in a once in a century situation. We are gaining the people's attention. We're repurposing streets by redesigning them to favor smaller vehicles. And it's possible that in the long run, by doing so, we'll save money, we'll save lives, and we'll make our communities more just and resilient. Thank you very much. To take one question from online, Kevin, for you, which um, who is this, this question is from Philip Kunhard, who is a graduate of our school, and he writes So, why do cities not enforce safe bike lanes and continue to allow businesses and trucks and cars to cannibalize bike lanes and sidewalks and greenways and even parks? What layers of power can we push through towards a, towards more towards Amsterdam? and less towards cities across the US? No, it's a, that's a very um, pressing question. And you, you, want the, you want the cities to be able to change their character quickly. If we allow cities, streets to change their character quickly, we can get through that mindset. So if the UPS truck has to park right there for 30 seconds and it's blocking my bike lane, that is a problem. I, I'll admit, and I've been living in Washington, D.C., and I have a collection of hundreds of photographs of UPS trucks and FedEx and everybody else in, in bike lanes. But at, at the same and I, and I see all the bicyclists diverting around them and saying, this is incredibly unsafe, but who gets priority to that? And what's the alternative? The alternative is, is really waiting for a new bike lane to be adopted, encouraging the police to to, to enforce it, think through the logistics of how that is going to be enforced and stuff like that, right? I, I think that if we get through a mindset of we all own the space together, we all own the space together, and if we can moderate the predominant travel that's happening in that space to 25 kilometers per hour, we're gonna see a lot of gains. Okay, well, I'd love to use that as a segue to invite Jeff, who is a city planner so you're going to tell us how we can actually get this done i was i was waiting i was waiting for the opportunity to comment on the last talk my my two-word comment was here here um fantastic thank you um hi everyone uh, I, I karen i want to thank you for inviting me and by extension victoria beach for inviting me here and mayor Alicker, thank you for coming um I come at this from the reverse direction uh, of a lot of you. Most of you are coming at city planning and cities from the space of climate change. I come at climate change from the space of city planning. Um, there's a lot I need to learn that you already know. I should say normally I, I make um, 
two hour presentations and give them in an hour to give me a lot of energy. Uh, I usually get smart audiences. I think this is probably the smartest audience I've ever had. So I'm gonna do a two hour presentation in 12 minutes. So <laughs> hold on to your seats. Um, I may not finish, we'll see what happens. Uh, another title I would give to this talk or, or to this symposium, excuse me, is, is demand side versus supply side solutions. And I'm just delighted to see it finally being addressed. I mean, after the debacle of, of supply side economics and the debacle of supply side war on drugs and supply side everything, um, I don't know why uh, our focus has been so supply side uh, when it comes to climate change. And we need to start thinking much more about the demand side. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a city planner. I am uh, not a climate scientist. I am an author. I am not an IPCC author. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I'll talk more about my books uh, in a bit. Uh, but uh, mostly I'm, I'm a city planner who does plans for cities. And I've done a lot of uh, new town work uh, all over the, the country and uh, in some other places on the planet, um, uh, including a number of TODs, transit oriented developments, which I'll be talking to you about um, some quite close to here. I've even designed a parking garage. Um, so maybe I'm part of the concrete uh, mob. I'm not sure. Um, but the goal of this garage was to get people to not use the elevator. And I think we succeeded in that. Uh, this one happens to be in Long Island. Um, but a lot of the work I do is for mayors, is for cities, uh, is for downtowns, uh, trying to make them more walkable, trying to reallocate the street space, uh, as Kevin described. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you briefly about theory, uh, about practice, and about impediments uh, that we face in that practice. I'm also almost entirely working in the US, almost entirely. And so my talk is really geared towards my experience. My talk is geared towards my experience, which is the American condition. But since we contribute so much to climate change, I think probably that's a good place to start. Um, theory, uh, in my book, Lockable City, I talk about, uh, uh, I have a subchapter called The Wrong Color Green um, that communicates what I learned from you folks and for a lot of, from a lot of the environmentalists uh, and recognizing that the environmental movement, particularly in the US historically, has been an anti-city movement from Jefferson on who said cities are pestilential to the health, to the morals, to the liberties of man. If we continue to pile upon ourselves in cities as they do in Europe, we shall become as corrupt as they are in Europe and take to eating one another as they do there. Um, and that, that, that philosophy only became stronger when we started mapping carbon because the carbon map of the US looks like the night sky map of the US, uh, you know, worst in cities, this is Chicago, uh, better in the suburbs, great in the exurbs because we were mapping carbon per square mile and that was a huge mistake. Scott Bernstein about 15 years ago realized you need to map carbon per household and when you map carbon per household it, the maps entirely flip. Coolest in the center city it's mostly because of our driving. Driving is the problem. Uh, what's amazing in this, well I'll talk about it in a minute, um, uh, what's, oh, and I couldn't help noticing uh, in the uh, potentially green uh, paraphernalia surrounding this conference um, that there's still 50 cars and a big honking parking garage in this image, right? So we can even do better than that. But the, the, I, the, what's so important about this graph to me is the extremely steep decline and actually going from uh, a few houses per acre to going to 25 units per acre uh, has much, much more impact than going from 25 you know, to Hong Kong. Right. You, and the reason that is, is because that's when neighborhood structure and traditional urban form takes over and actually driving is no longer necessary. Wonderful quote uh, from Green Metropolis by David Owen. The real problem with cars is not that they don't get enough miles per gallon, is that they make it too easy for people to spread out, encouraging forms of development that are inherently wasteful and damaging. So even if we uh, make our cars, uh, uh, you know, gas free, uh, we are still doing what cars allow us to do, which, you know, transit is nodal and it creates concentrated areas where people come together. The car changes all that. You lay a thin strip of asphalt and the entire landscape is equivalent and you can spread out to anywhere. And so the question is, you know, did cars cause sprawl or did sprawl cause cars? And the answer, of course, is yes. It's this feedback loop that get, that keeps going. Um, and and the, the, the problem of the automobile is not the fuel, it's the, it's not mostly the fuel, it's the way it causes us to live our lives so large on the land and spread out into places where we only live, where we only work, where we only shop. Schools get bigger and bigger, 
and get further and further away from you as a result. Uh, and if you separate everything from everything else, reconnect it only with automotive infrastructure, of course, the highway system gets bigger and bigger as well. I don't care if your car is powered on fairy dust. There is no future in which this is sustainable. Let's move on. So I've had the opportunity to do some really um, uh, interesting projects. I'm one of many, many people who's doing this work. I just happen to write about it more than other people, so that's why I'm here and not them, but there are a lot of us doing this work. I'm going to show you three categories, uh, streets for everyone, transit-oriented development, and car-free. Streets for everyone is, is so much of my work. This is Oklahoma City. Uh, it was named by Prevention Magazine as the worst city for pedestrians in the entire country. The mayor panicked and called me in and we did a walkability study, the first one I've done out of 15. Uh, and we looked at every street in the downtown core and I was in charge of the curb to curb and we were able to reduce the number of driving lanes by a full, fully a third. And we were able to put in a lot more bike lanes and do other things, so this went to this. Um, and of course, make the pedestrian experience so much better. This is what you do when you have money. And this was $200 million being generated because of a new tower being built in the downtown. Most places I work, I say, don't rebuild, restripe. You can restripe an entire downtown for the price of rebuilding a couple streets. Um, that's what we did in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, another oversized set of roads. Um, we were able to change this road network, if you can see the number of lanes in a mostly one-way system, as we also encountered in Oklahoma City. Very dangerous, like in New Haven. Horrible for cities to have multi-lane multi one-ways in their downtowns. Um, we changed this to this, mostly two-way, two-lane streets. Um, our bike network went from this to this because of all the extra road space that we were able to free up through that work. So this street became this street. Notice that people are learning not to park in the bike lanes on the left. Um, and, that, and, and notice also the bike lane is protected by parking, theoretically protected by parking. Uh, this model where you pull the parking off the curb and it protects the bike lane is so important. If you do not protect the bike lane, people will put something in it. Trash cans, dumpsters, the Uber driver every time, buses, vans, policemen, Peloton in the bike lane appropriately. Um, it gets quite ironic. And, and that's why you need to protect the bike lane. So um, this is the model you know, five years ago. Now, I should say, this is the restriping model. When you rebuild, you can actually do what they've been doing in Europe for 20 years, which is to put the bike lane up on the sidewalk, like we see here in Somerville, Massachusetts. Cambridge does that as well. Uh, complete streets have been talked about for some time. If it's not safe, it's not a complete street. Don't be fooled. Um, and you can actually create tremendous safety. Uh, but if you, if you with, with adding bike lanes, as happened here in New York, but if the cars are moving quickly, the bicycles need to be protected. This is where I was yesterday. This is Carmel, Indiana. I did this plan uh, 10 years ago to wrap a uh, rails to trails with a street and turn it into the new urban center of this community um, and uh, did it with Jan Gale following up. And it's wonderful going from the rendering to the reality. Um, but this is kind of the golden standard. Uh, if you are spending money, uh, what you can do. Uh, TOD, I mentioned uh, this one's in Jersey City on light rail. This one is on the Long Island Railroad, the most demographically challenged neighborhood in, uh, on the railroad. Um, and just the idea that you um, bring density where the transit is. And I agree, what we do to our streets, Kevin, is the most important and fastest build, and that's why we do so much of it. But we can't give up on making our cities more livable. And number one rule of planning, bring density to transit. Number one, number two rule, bring transit to density. That's got to be the focus of our work as we build. Uh, I want to show this project that we're about to break ground on in Newton, Massachusetts. Uh, it's at the end of the Green Line coming up uh, from Boston, uh, and it is a surface parking lot. It's a thousand cars. Well, we're structuring the parking, as you can see, and then we're building a community around it. Um, and it's a uh, more than a million square feet replacing what was just a thousand cars. Uh, but it's in the suburbs, and it's wonderful that we have a town transit square intermodal where the buses meet the trains. Um, but notice, not only do we have the park and ride replacing the parking lot, but a whole nother parking lot that's serving our future residents and workers because of the expectations and the requirements for uh, parking on site that now bind developers into providing a ton of parking for their schemes. So how green is this development? Well, it's a lot more green than something that's not on transit, but still almost everyone who comes there is gonna bring a car. 
because the space has been provided for them. So the ultimate solution is to go car free entirely. And so this is a project I did not work on at all. Um, I'm friends with them now. It's called cul-de-sac. You may have heard of it. It's in Tempe, Arizona. It's 17 acres. It is car free, except for the very edge where you can park, uh, you see to the left, to go shopping. But no one who lives there will be allowed to bring a car. Um, and uh, they put their first phase up for sale and uh, for rental, and it rented immediately. It's now under construction. In every metropolitan area, there are enough people who want to live this way that the first developer who does it will, will get rich. And slowly cities are, are understanding that. So that's an important thing we need to do as well. And then finally, I wanna end with some of the impediments that are just some. This list is twice as long, but some of the impediments that we face doing this work. Zoning was mentioned. My mentors, Andre Stwani and Elizabeth Peter Zyberg, who went to Yale, graduated from Yale, um, um, you know, founded the new urbanism movement. Andres used to give a talk he called the uh, story of urbanism. Uh, in, the 18, in the 19th century, the people were, were choking on the, the soot from the dark satanic mills and the, the planners said, hey, let's separate the housing from the factories. And when they did, the lifespans increased immediately and dramatically, and they've been trying to uh, repeat that experience ever since. So the onset of Euclidean zoning, the, sep the separation of the landscape into large areas of single use that make, make actually walking useless. Walking doesn't serve any purpose. This was only hammered home in Futurama, uh, 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 1939 World Fair. They could have called it Autorama, uh, sponsored by gas stations and, uh, and car manufacturers, where Norman Geddes, an industrial designer who didn't know shit about cities, was put in charge of the future of our, of our planet. And he said, residential, commercial, and industrial areas have been separated for greater efficiency and greater convenience. What the hell does this even mean? How could this even make sense to the people? How could people hear that with a straight face and think it would be convenient or, or, or efficient to break our life into these separate pieces and strew them across the landscape so far from each other? But that became the model, thanks to this guy and many others. Um, tons of federal subsidies, of course. I was an art history major. I say, uh, you don't want a Rothko, you want a Syrah, the pointillist if you're planning uh, for, walk, for a walkable community and a livable community, um, that's the first impediment because of course, the single family zoning is sitting on so many uh, properties that need to be denser, particularly ones near transit. Now with each of these impediments, I'll try to mention one or two solutions. Um, you're probably aware a lot of towns, cities, states are, uh, are breaking down single family zoning and making rules, starting to make rules where you can densify them. The ones that matter are the ones that are by transit. And that's what's happening in Massachusetts, where the, the rules, local rules are being overruled about putting new density, but on transit stops. Next, road building is our biggest problem. We're still building tons of roads in the US. Every new lane is a commitment to greater global heating, period. There's no exception to this. Confronted with uh, my words by an NPR reporter, um, Pete Buttigieg, our Secretary of Transportation, said, sometimes the roads legitimately need, need to be expanded. This is the United States of America. And he's a good guy, right? But we need to understand that every, every lane we build is, is climate gases in the air. Uh, fear of congestion is why this is happening, because people still don't understand induced demand. Induced demand uh, is the reality of traffic. It always happens. We widen roads when there's congestion, which is the gap between the yellow line and the capacity of the road, right? The demand for lanes and the amount of lanes on a highway or in a downtown, because we think that those lanes will absorb that congestion. Of course, they don't because of all the trips that weren't happening because of the congestion. Very straightforward. I'm sure this audience understands this, this graph, um, but what it, what, it, what it concludes is basically every time you widen a, a road, 40% of the new capacity is taken up immediately, and within four years, 100% of that capacity is taken up immediately. So every time we ride widen the highway, that is what we experience, because in congested systems, the principal constraint to driving is congestion. And when you remove that constraint, more people drive. This is an equilibrium. It's what we accept. It will always happen. The reverse also happens. So you remove a highway in Korea, in Seoul, that's carrying this many cars a day, and you replace it with an urban park. Unfortunately, this is only locally, not the whole planet, but we reduce temperature by five degrees um, and uh, property values soar and, and the trips just go away. So it's our choice. 
how many lanes do we want? And people don't understand that, but when you do it, it always, it always seems to work. Traffic studies are the reason why we keep expanding lanes. It's the default mode of every plan that you make in the US. You have to do a traffic study. And if your project is generating more trips, which means it has more houses or more offices, you have to widen the streets. But of course, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Widening those streets is what reduces the congestion that causes more people to drive. So actually, I would suggest that traffic studies just be abolished um, as a first step towards it. I'm not joking, um, towards the work that we do. Uh, I'm, I'm working in Boston. Finally, with the new administration in Boston, we're making some major changes in the city that for the first time, we don't have to maintain throughput. That was the rule through the, through the last administration. We had to maintain throughput. Now we don't because there's some enlightened leadership in that city. And of course, parking requirements, you've probably all read your Donald Shoup and the high cost of free parking. He says uh, the on-site parking requirement is a fertility drug for cars. And it's absolutely true. It's what allows people to, um, to own more cars and drive more cars. And then finally, believe it or not, it's you guys, not you, but in California, San Francisco had to wait four years for a damn bike plan because someone sued on the CEQA, the uh, environmental review, and, and then the NIMBYs, if you want to call them that, but the people who are fighting changes to our streets that will make them more, more sustainable often use environmental law to stop these projects. So for example, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a federal law that says anyone who wants to replace a driving lane with a bike lane, you are waived from environmental review because there's no way that bike lane is going to cause more, more pollution. So those are some impediments. There are others that we can talk about on the panel, um, but we, we're one by one, we're breaking through them. I do agree that, that in the short term, and for most of the cities I work for, it's the redesign of the streets that provides the most opportunity for change quickly. Um, but I don't think we should forget about quality of life. Um, if you live a lower carbon lifestyle in a traditionally organized city, your life is better. It's delightful. And we need to communicate that uh, to everyone and not just be driven by climate goals, but by the goals of, of enjoying our lives and being happy. Um, my book was mentioned. I'm here to tell you, do not buy this book. Because, uh, first of all, for technicians like you, this is the book you should have. It's much more technical and detailed, Walkable City Rules. It came out in 2018. Uh, but also, we're doing a 10th anniversary edition that's, coming, uh, edition that's coming out in two months with 100 new pages. So wait two months. Please make a note to yourself. In two months, look me up. Um, but thank you so much for your attention. I'm really looking forward to the to the panel. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. From buildings to streets, ways in which we can redesign our cities and our communities to be low net zero carbon. So um, I would like to start off with a couple of questions for the panelists. Why aren't we doing this now? People think that their access is going to be jeopardized. We, well, we, we are doing it now, just not enough of it. And not to pressure the mayor, but it has to do with leadership. It's happening in yeah. cities where where, where leaders, not just mayors, but city councilors actually stand up and, and, and lead the, they have to lead the way. The, the street changes that happened in uh, Oakland in April, May, June, July, throughout that summer, they were really, really um, helpful and, and influential, I think, because a lot of the residents on those streets said, what do you mean you're going to be opening that street up to walking and cycling? How am I going to get to work? I drive and I need to get to work. They thought their access was being limited. And so we have to get over that. We have to get over that that challenge. And then on the building front, I would say from the building side, you know, there's a lot of inertia with respect to building standards, architectural preferences, construction lead times that really don't incentivize using less material. That's changing slowly. Uh, there are some movements to start accounting for embodied carbon. Some architects are really on the leading edge. Um, and part of the problem is traditional business models, right? So uh, the cement industry doesn't necessarily want to sell less cement. Uh, 
They want to sell low carbon cement, but in the same quantity, so we'll focus on production side. But there are some places in the world where that whole chain is integrated, where the construction company also either owns or works with the cement company. Now they have an incentive to use less cement because it helps their bottom line, essentially. So part of it is standards, part of its codes, part of its inertia, and part of it is just business models that keep leading us to more to traditional buildings. I was just admiring this, though because there is a big movement towards cross laminated timber. And that was kind of a technical challenge that's starting to slowly replace concrete steel in mid and even quasi high rise type buildings, which is, which is very exciting. Panel three, we'll talk a little bit about this. I think one of the things that I imagine many people either in the audience or online are gonna to wanna to know is, well, ultimately if they live in cities, as we know, most people live in cities now, what we've been hearing is what cities can do, what leadership at the city level can do, businesses, but ultimately cities are comprised of individuals, households, neighborhoods. What can be done at those scales? So at the, you know, Angel talked about subnational. What about at the subcity level? We're not. I'm not go, not going to go out there and start painting, or maybe I will. Some people no. do. So yeah, Some what what do. could I do? What should I do? How about both? What should I do versus what I could do? Well, actually, there's been a lot of guerrilla bike lane painting and other forms of tactical urbanism done without permission um, in neighborhoods that you see. Um, absolutely. But I think that the most important thing people can do is, is show up at, at public hearings. Uh, I'll try and say this quickly. When we came forward with the TOD, the Transit Rating Development in Newton that I showed you, there were three types of people who came to the meetings. There were the people who supported us in our, our project, uh, who were like friends of the FOD, friends of the developer. There were there were NIMBYs, or I would call them NAMIs, not across my interstate, people who lived across I-95 who didn't want to see our project built um, because they were uh, afraid of traffic. Um, and those two groups kind of balanced each other out. But then there was an equally sized contingent of people who were pro-environmental sustainability, pro-transit, uh, and pro-housing who tipped the balance. And they had no dog in the fight, but they were people like this who just showed up at the meeting. And so that's the main thing that people can do. When, when people show up at these meetings, of course, they're going to be there to protect their personal interests. That's what people showing up to meetings usually results in. Their personal interests are ensuring their economic prosperity and their safety and their all these other things that they, that they want, right? But too often, I think that we don't do a good job of recognizing the spiral, long-term knock-on effects of the cumulative impacts that we've made in, in our communities. And I understand the merits of needing to get bigger cars. We all feel safer with bigger cars. And it is a very difficult, vexing problem to tell somebody, no, you don't need a bigger car. But unless we come to our own conclusion on that, that maybe we don't need a bigger car, or we do a good job convincing the mayor that we don't want to design that street or design that parking lot to accommodate that bigger car. We're just going to be, we're going to continue to shoot ourselves in the foot. But the, and, the traffic safety yeah. leadership in Europe doesn't allow you to buy bigger cars. They don't, they, they do crash tests, not just for the dummies inside the car. They have dummies outside the car. Did you guys know that in Europe, yeah. they, they have dummies outside the car. And here there's been zero leadership at the federal level because obviously the dollars involved um, around making cars less dangerous, which is why, or just not more dangerous. We have an epidemic of pedestrian deaths in the US, 55% more than it was 10 years ago. Pedestrians are being killed by cars. And the, the principal reason is, is SUVs and trucks. The principal reason is that our fleet has changed. You're four times as likely to be killed by an SUV than you are by a non-SUV. Um, and our leadership's done nothing to slow that down. And, and, and we're greening our transportation fleet by putting the, the greatest, the most, sell, the most widely sold vehicle in the wor world, in, in the US, the Ford F-150. Right now, the internal combustion engine is, I believe, 2.6 tons. And the, and, and, and the green version of that is gonna be in excess of three tons. Yeah. The battery weighs as much as a small car. The battery. The yeah, yeah. Three, it, the battery weighs as much as 400 electric bikes. Yeah. Just the battery. And, and, and we're subsidizing electric cars and not subsidizing e-bikes. And e-bikes outsold. Sorry, we should be on like a game show. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
<laughs> we, we didn't rehearse this. Uh, E-bikes outsold electric cars in 2021. I don't know where I end and you begin. Yeah. <laughs> What about buildings, housing? Well, I was thinking about behavioral change. So by the way, I'm really enjoying this panel. It's so great. So I mean, people in my field, we kind of sh shed light on the macro level of the opportunity space. There's something here, big savings, and then we punt to the experts to go make it happen or you know, figure out the granular changes. So I agree wholeheartedly with everything Jeff and Kevin have said. I would say that if, we've, if we just bring it closer to home and focus here on the US, that chart that I showed with the average energy consumption per capita, sorry, sorry uh, not average, the, the span of energy consumption per capita in the US was just staggering compared to nearly every other part of the world, right? And so a lot of the, that energy use is associated with waste and consumption patterns that we all have the power to change today. So for example, um, I was just looking at new DOE data a couple of days ago. Uh, many Americans have, most Americans have programmable thermostats, but don't use them. They set the temperature to too cold in the summer and too hot in the winter, and they leave it there all day. They don't even take advantage of the, the native features of that. Part of that is awareness, and part of that is deciding to do something about it finally. And, you know, rising emissions, every year the emissions keep going up, and we keep talking about all the technical plans, but yet emissions keep ticking up. Uh, food waste is a tremendous problem. The graph I showed about demand side changes for food could get us like a third, away, a third of the way there on the demand side potential. Tremendous amount of food waste in this country. I think it's something like 30 to 40% uh, of, of food that's produced and purchased and, and never eaten. So making daily choices like that, just you know, uh, plan meals, reduce, reduce our food waste, um, maybe think about dietary shifts. These are all things that we as a wealthy country or consuming an awful lot, much more than we technically need to for high quality of life, could do pretty much immediately. And it's not going to be the, the full set of solutions we need to get to net zero, but it's something we could all do if we decide to act. They're just kind of waiting there for us. All the models, all the scenarios point to this potential, but it, it's sticky. It still remains because uh, a lot of us aren't acting. So a Sorry lot for of, the guilt trip. <laughs> well, a lot of what's been discussed so far really focuses on the U.S. and the global north, but we also know that most of the new urban growth is going to happen in the global south somewhere on the order of 20,000, an area equivalent to 20,000 American football fields gets paved every single day to become <clears> urban <throat> on the planet. A lot of that is wasted space. So what is being done? What can be done in the global south? Uh, go ahead. I was gonna say Jeff had some wonderful pictures yeah. of urban forms that, and you did too, Kevin. Um, that the, the problem are, is that, that other countries emulate American visions of wealth. So they aspire to what they perceive our society to be, particularly Hispanic, if I can say, cultures don't seem to take to the, to the bicycle as quickly. Um, if they're near America, they, they need to be freed of that image of America, uh, of the US, uh, as their model. I want to mention that ride sharing and ride hailing was, was mentioned. It's not ride sharing, people never share. Um, because it was mentioned, I just need to say, it has been a disaster, um, particularly in the global south, it's been a disaster for VMT, for vehicle miles traveled. Every, every ride hailing trip causes three to four times the VMT than if you, than if, if you drove. Um, because of the car getting to you and then because of all the people who choose to take the trips who would not have driven three to four times. And then the global south and then a little bit in the US, people are using ride hailing as as drivers as a way to buy cars. Mm -hmm. So this, this mythology that somehow ride hailing or sharing would reduce VMT is is completely backward. And by the way, autonomous vehicles will only be worse because their whole goal is to reduce the cost of, of, of driving in a car. And if you reduce the cost of driving, you increase the demand for driving, and that would be an absolute nightmare. So ushering in that technology, which probably will never happen anyway, but ushering that in uh, is a big mistake. Karen, I think one of the most valuable things we can do is encourage them to leapfrog past us. We talked about leapfrogging earlier. And because right now, the only model that we have to be able to put forth is the model that we know. And it's very difficult for them to see through an alternative model, a, a, a different paradigm. And so, but that's the imagination. That's the creativity that really is, is, is going to be fueling the next generation of cities in Latin America, in yeah. Asia. And if they continue to replicate our decisions and the ways that we've gone about doing things, that's, that's and American cities, American city planners, we've already, I think we've, we've already read the Bible. We know that we are the problem. We know that 
that the way that we have created American cities is the problem. We're trying to now fix that, right? And they, they, they haven't quite read that yet. But can I say that, that there's incredible models from, from South yeah. America? So uh, uh, Curitiba, Brazil, which had a BRT line and then organized all future development, high density around that BRT line, really lightening their footprint. And then in Bogota, Colombia, uh, you've probably he heard the uh, quotes, but Ciclovia mm -hmm. and incredible biking, incredible biking on the weekends in Curitiba, where um, Mayor, Mayor Peñalosa says, uh, a rich nation is not one in which everyone drives, but in which the rich people take public transportation. And he's really pulled that off down there. And, and Lima and Peru, uh, in Sao Paulo, all these places, they're really taking back streets. They, they, they are, they're aggressively building that into their culture. And that's really exciting to see. Okay, let's, I'm gonna take a bunch of questions. We have only about five minutes before lunch. So let's rapid fire, um, everyone with a hand up, please. Let's, can we get microphones to folks with hands up, please? And uh, yes, please, uh, what, yes. For people on the line, I okay. think it'll be helpful. So, um, so I had an idea while you guys were talking. I'm just wondering if this is realistic. So um, through creating more walkable cities, can we also lower demand for concrete, um, creating gravel paths or stone paths, sidewalks from pavers with clover, between them, which would not only reduce concrete use, but also reduce water pollution, because we know about the runoff issues from paved pathways, et cetera. Would that, does that make any sense? Absolutely. I'm going to ask yeah. one other, there's yeah. a person right behind him. We're going to take all the questions at once quickly. Okay. Yes, please. Thanks. Um, and, and if you can try to keep your questions very short. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to ask another question sort of on the housing thing of not only multifamily housing being um, more efficient, but all the idea of people having access to those walkable areas and like more people wanting to live there than there is currently housing. What would you propose to allow that to increase? Okay, there's a question here. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, there is, uh, of course, a big spike in interest for bikes during the pandemic. And I know lots of people purchase new bikes. And I'm wondering if you feel that the infrastructure and policy changes made during the pandemic and I guess ongoing now, um, have they kept up with that demand? And then more, more broadly speaking, do you feel like infrastructure and policy changes have kept up with other types of changes in demand related to sustainability due to the pandemic? Okay, we have another question right you here. You have to let the mayor ask his question. Too. Okay, yeah, we'll make sure. <laughs> okay, let's... Let's let's hear from the mayor and then we'll hear from <laughs> yes. I don't have we'll a question, you. but since I was raised multiple times, can I make a comment? Yes, please. Thank you. So first of all, please do not paint your own bike lane in the city. <laughs> Sandeep, the director of transportation, will have to go out and clean it up with uh, the rest of his team and it, and it will divert that important resource to other things. Um, I, I appreciate the, the the this idea that the mayor could press a button and all of a sudden these things will happen which is not exactly the tone, but it, it's a little bit of the tone. I would love, we're so, our team is sold on this. I'm sold on this, I rode my bike today. I would love to close down more streets like we've done in East Rock. Okay. I've heard zero call from the community to close down other streets around the city like we've done in East Rock. I would like to have a pedestrian way downtown that we shut off to cars. Not a lot of folks calling for those sorts of things. Orange Street, a lot of controversy that you, you all may or may not know about, there's a push to have separated bike lanes on Orange Street. The people we hear from are people that want their parking spaces. And the people that we do hear from that are advocating for this are predominantly white. And this can't just be a white issue. We need to have a larger constituency advocating for these things. It is not just the mayor, although we very much want and are working on these things, but it's about community advocating for these things and engaging other populations as well. Thank you so much. Hey, wonderful. And there's a woman in a green shirt right there, please. Thank you. 89% of all emergency calls um, in Connecticut, at least, are medical emergencies, but they get answered with huge trucks. Yep. 
I have been a city planner for a really long time. I can sit down and redesign streets with people. What I get, and please help me on this, is we end up with a beautiful design, everything works, and then the fire chief comes in and says, but we can't get our giant hook and ladder around there to answer emergencies. And it's an incredibly emotional, unfortunate argument. And it's killed more plants than I, so help. Okay, lots of questions. Uh, let's hear from the panel lists. Take any question, pick and choose. Uh, I'll talk quickly. Uh, one of the rules in my 101 walkable city rules is expand the fire chief's mandate. They mm -hmm. need to understand that they're in charge of life safety. They're not in charge of response time. You need to have a very public discussion around what's more important to you, response time or saving lives. And they'll say you're going to kill babies. You say, no, actually, look at the ratio of car crash injuries to fire injuries. You're killing the babies, not us. And it's a very emotional discussion, but you have to frame it very loudly and very publicly. To the mayor's comment, I would say um, and agree. Um, sorry to put that much pressure on you. Um, what we found is you need to have a very public discussion around these issues. You have a, a walkability summit and you, you publicize the hell out of it. And you, you, you actually, I had yard signs in New, Alb New Albany, Indiana, proclaiming we need our two-way streets back. And that only happened because, uh, and they did it. They reverted an entire downtown, entire downtown from entirely one way back to two-way, save lives. The police chief now loves it. It's incredible, but it's only because of the public forums that were held to educate everyone. And then to your great idea, you, you'll be glad to know you're not the first person to have had the idea about much more pervious surface uh, in our streets. There's a whole field of urbanism that's focused on that. Uh, to, to it, I would only add, um, as I mentioned last night, and here we are in the School of Forestry, um, that urban street trees are by far in every American city, the most underappreciated, under, uh, misunderstood and misallocated you know, poorly funded asset. And we knew if we understood fully the value of street trees, we would be paying for them before anything else. Can you say more about that? Uh, they, actually, ready? can we just pause on that? Because panel three everything. will actually talk directly about street trees and yeah. urban forestry. Yeah, so just we'll hold up, yep. There are so many different entry points to each of these conversations. And that's why I kind of said at the opening, your job is so incredibly hard on this respect because the way that we've baked in all of these incentives to drive into every element of every fabric thread in our communities is it's staggering to think through it's staggering but there are ways that people can see through the fact that we sit in 2022 and the rules that were used to create our communities come from 1920 and 1950 and there's a new way that we can get access to goods and services these days and i think that we need to project that conversation along those lines there's there's a new breed there's a new kettle of fish that we need to be able to collectively gra uh, grasp and it's a collective action uh, collective action issue uh, that is only going to be able to be moved through collective public discourse. Eric, you get the last word. Uh, tough hacks to follow. So um, I would just circle back to something that a uh, salient point that came up from both Jeff and Kevin about development pathways for the global south. And uh, you know that discussion about limiting floor area or PKM is equally fraught from that perspective because you know it's seen as limiting development potential. Why should we have to limit our consumption when the rest of the world destroyed the climate with high levels and so forth? But I think these case studies, if we can show that, you know, smaller dwellings or reduced PKM or whatever actually improve quality of life, we live better, we're happier, we have more access to more things that give us services and joy, getting, you know, having more case studies, having more demonstrations, having more policy exchanges that show, listen, these changes are completely compatible with all aspects of well-being is really super important. Um, so that's, that's where I'll end. All right, so thank you all. We are going to break for an hour, about 55 minutes. And those of you joining online, we will reconvene at 1.45 Eastern for a keynote. And then our third panel, which will focus on carbon sequestration and uptake in cities. So enjoy lunch, which is outside. Thank you.
Welcome back. Welcome back to the afternoon session of this conference. So we're going to start off with a, um, a keynote, and then we're going to go into our third panel of the day, um, but our first our keynote. So as I suggested in the early session, I ask all of you to go online or to the printed program to get the full bio. Um, I will simply just say our next speaker is uh, Dr. Diana Urg Vorsatz. She's a professor at Central European University in Hungary. She has been, she's also a longtime IPCC scientist. She's been a coordinating lead author for two IPCC reports um, for the fifth assessment, also for the fourth assessment. She led the chapters on uh, buildings and how buildings could be part of the, the, um, the strategies to mitigate climate change. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Erg Vorsatz. Thank you very much, Karen, for this very nice invitation, and thank you for the opportunity to be able to share a couple of thoughts with you about um, uh, about towards carbon positive cities. What can we do? So I'm, my job is actually going to be very easy, since Cole has already given you all the big picture things. So instead of the big picture messages from the sixth assessment report, I can just put up uh, this uh, cartoon. But um, since already there were really excellent other talks in the morning, uh, what I thought uh, to do uh, this afternoon is to actually pick out from the Working Group 3 report as vice chairs our privileges that we are really quite familiar with the entire uh, material in the working group, in the respective working groups report. Pick out those pieces of information which I believe are really important for this particular subject and show a few case studies and um, so want to show you what's really novel. So we are very proud that in this cycle, in the sixth assessment report, one of the newest things that we have done in the IPCC, that the first time ever, we have now a whole chapter on so-called demand and services. And in fact, this has uh, fundamentally changed um, our perspectives or enriched, I would rather say, enriched our perspectives on mitigation. Because, uh, and this figure, I didn't do this, uh, the, actually many of the figures are coming from the uh, working group itself. So this figure already suggests that demand and services are kind of in front of all the other sectors or everything else you do. So this kind of recognizes that so far we mostly just ask, well, where can we get the next low carbon kilowatt hour? Or what can we, how can we produce the next ton of low carbon cement? But instead, what Aris Ford now suggests that before we ask those questions, first we should ask, do we really need that next kilowatt hour uh, for the same service? Of course, we don't want to compromise services, although it was really great that uh, Eric already discussed our sufficiency issues as well. Do we really need that next ton of steel? So this kind of thinking has now really penetrated. And what I want to show you is that basically every chapter, every sector which uh, was up there has, um, uh, has prioritized this. And all of this is very relevant also for, for how we think about mitigation in cities and towards net, uh, car, net zero cities. So first, this is an energy sector. And what you see here is also, it says that energy efficiency and conservation is very important in energy supply. And believe me, this was, is the major step forward. Usually there is always the big community of the supply side guys and the demand chapters. So it's there without us telling them that they have to do that. This is the industry chapter, and it, look at the, uh, this is the highest level text on the industry chapter. So this is a summary for policymakers. So the very first sentence on the in industry chapter says, promote all mitigation options, including demand management, energy and materials efficiency, circular material flows, and the actual industry related measures only come after the as well as. That's quite remarkable, I think. Also, um, uh, further down below, there are many sustainable options for demand management, materials efficiency. 
These op and this is really important. This is again in the summary for policymakers. These options have a potential for being more used in the industrial practice and would need more attention from industrial policy, are generally not considered in recent global scenarios nor in national economy-wide scenarios. And this is really important, that actually a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today, and actually a lot of the things that you have been talking about today, and we all have been talking about today, and, and a lot of this work is not in the global scenarios. And that's the problem, because still, the vastly the most used materials from IPCC are the scenarios, which will say to what degree temperature target, what do I actually have to do? And that's where people read from, but all of this is not in it. And not necessarily only because they, uh, anyone is doing a bad job, but this is just very hard to integrate. And we definitely need more need work. We need to integrate this. And of course, the urban tax that Karen knows uh, very well. Here also, the first measure that uh, in, the, in the priority is reducing or changing energy and material consumption. And finally, the buildings uh, chapter also starts with ambitious sufficiency efficiency. Again, it's already a very important step forward that we dared mentioning sufficiency. So dared questioning that perhaps beyond a certain level of affluence or consumption, maybe there, there, there could be a level that is enough. Because especially with governments, this is not easy for governments to, to say that. So let's delve actually dive actually into detail. So this is the very high level summary of the demand and services chapter. And so, uh, yes, it shows uh, after really fantastic work, uh, including by, by many fantastic authors, that there is a potential to bring down global emissions by 40 to 70 percent. But what is really important is that, um, is this, this uh, point here, because, of course, very often we are asked, okay, so what can I do, what can I do, what can I do, if, if you're giving interviews, always that's what we are asked. And the chapter fi finally answers this question really um, very, uh, uh, on a very solid basis that if we were just alone, changing our lifestyles and making sacrifices. And, and even if you were to behave really, really as good boys and good girls, we may still be able to change, reduce emissions only by 5%. However, we could do this. We could, through this, we could do it by 40 to 70%, but this requires systemic change. And the morning uh, discussions and talks were fantastic examples for that. So, for example, <clears throat> for me in Budapest, I would love to commute by bike. But if I commute by bike, I will be killed in, in less than a day because uh, there is a really a heavy traffic road where I would have to bike. And if I don't get killed, then I will suffocate from air pollution. So anyway, but if like I really love the Copenhagen example, if if you make an effort and make an all encompassing system, then really a lot, I would definitely you know my whole, whole family would be bike, riding the bike instead. Instead of now we have to drive this big car, so we are kind of locked in. So this is the important that requires systemic change. And one of the most important systems to change we identified in all the working group reports is the urban systems and Cole already mentioned this, and we will have a whole special report on this. So let me get into some of the concrete details, um, the, uh, how the built environment uh, is so important in cities, because that's my specialty expertise, and that's what Karen asked me to, to focus on, how we can uh, uh, get, um, to go to how we can, how cities can go towards the net zero uh, future, how the built environment can, can contribute to that. I don't want to talk about uh, transport. You already had some discussions. So this will be the he heaviest slide. There I will summarize seven points here that I'm later going to unpack. But this is the seven key strategies, which is not the only key strategies, but the strategy which I picked out of several chapters, which are, I think, very relevant here, um, but may not necessarily have so much um, coverage elsewhere. So the first point is, uh, which I'm going to demonstrate, that net zero energy buildings, not net zero carbon, and there is a difference, actually could be a big difference, are feasible in all climates, in most building types, and economic for almost all building types. But the key to this is maximized energy efficiency and minimized energy and material demand. I will also um, uh, show this through, demonstrate this through, through examples. <clears throat> uh, 
However, what is really important in our regions of the world, in the developed world, that in fact we have a lot of the buildings. We may not need any more new buildings. So the key is really on retrofit and repurposing of existing, existing building stocks and repair of components rather than new uh, and replacement, wherever, of course, this is applicable, much less seen the third word, but um, in much of our, uh, our uh, parts of the region, very applicable. So it's very connected, but this is which we don't really say, and it's just hidden in some of the chapters, this, uh, <clears throat> Actually, I didn't put the word here, but it's in some of the, yeah, it is here, the repurposing. So the durability and the long life. And, and we, we never talk about this, that actually durability and long life of uh, components and buildings and infrastructure makes almost bigger difference than how energy efficient it is or how material, how much carbon it uh, saves and so on. And we also only, I also only realized this when we did the sensitivity analysis of our model. And I was completely shocked that, uh, that simply what lifetime we assume because there is so much uncertainty actually determined our final energy, global building energy consumption more than um, you know, how efficient that uh, building was and so on. So uh, the final three, I'm not going to go through now because I will uh, give that in the, uh, my next uh, talk that um, I will be kicking off uh, the next uh, panel where I focus on. So this talk, I focus on how to get to net zero. And the next one is how to go below zero, how to, so how to become the carbon uh, sink. So let's uh, actually jump into some of these. So first of all, net zero energy buildings are feasible in all climates and almost all building times and economic for almost uh, also for almost all building times, both for new and retrofit. So, um, but because for a retro, uh, so let's, um, so the, the building chapter based this, uh, based on this paper that uh, we published recently in, um, in annual reviews uh, annual review of environment and resources. And this is a review paper of reviewing not only scientific literature, but also the professional literature. And this knowledge cogeneration earlier, this was a kind of taboo. Why do you have an industrial, you know, why do you have the construction industry in your paper? Uh, is that objective and so on? But I really learned that from, from Deborah Roberts, our, our co-chair of, um, of working group two, that is really so important that we academics don't only sit in our ivory towers and, and think our own fant fantastic ideas slightly detached from reality. And, and I will give a very good example in my talk how I made big mistakes, well, one big mistake in uh, my scientific career because, uh, because I was doing that. So uh, Rob Bernhardt is actually concretely and uh, and Yuchen Chan, they're both from the uh, actually who make things happen. So we also reviewed the, the professional literature because what we see actually that in buildings and some of our engineering fields, actually the reality is much more ahead than, than what is the scientific literature. It takes a long time for these to be assessed and, and get into the, uh, into the scientific literature. So what does this paper say? It will talk a lot about uh, buildings and feasibility, but first let me go. So that, that was the paper where we concluded the big conclusion which I said that it's feasible everywhere. But let's go back to the roots. How did all of this start? Zero building. So um, this is uh, uh, this is um, this house has uh, banana plantations inside. It's the 78th, now probably the 90th banana crops and and there is no heating system inside. And you're wondering, okay, why do, does Kenya need a heating system? Well, apparently this is not in Kenya, but this is in the Rocky Mountains at 2,000 meters elevation. It happens to be the house of Amory Lovins, who built it in the 70s. Why? Because it was a very similar crisis to today's. We had extremely high energy prices. We thought we are running out of, uh, at least in terms of oil supplies, so, so we don't have enough oil right now. So we have to figure out ways to, to suddenly save energy. And he was, he's a physicist and was thinking, why on earth do we bring in all this energy into the buildings when there is enough internal sources, the same amount of energy sources inside, so there is no point. So he built this first house without a heating system. He says, well, it was cheaper to do it, 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 it that way. Um, by today, this is an industry which is present all around the world. It's called a passive house. 
Oh, I knew I left to Hungary, and I'm sorry. That was the only thing I'm looking for it, and then I couldn't find it where I still left Hungary. But anyway, the point is that even this dog is an important part of the heating system because it's 40 watts. So um, that's very, and here this heating is not on. This is an example from the UK. In a passive house, even in the cold, coldest climate, you may need only a dozen days a year that you really need uh, your heating system on. So this has been. Uh, uh, everywhere around the world, and and when we made our Earth, our global building energy model, uh, the um, decade or, or a decade and a half ago, and we also for the U.S. we assumed what you know just looked at what if these technologies were penetrating, then our Amer American reviewer said no. You have to take that out. In America, it will never happen. This is really not for the Americans. Now, fortunately, uh, the US has some of the strongest passive house industries and communities in the world. This happens to be a, a retrofit in, um, in Brooklyn. And retrofit is more difficult because usually it's, it's uh, uh, more expensive. And also, it's really important to show that you can do even historic buildings. Because in the UK, very often, and, and in places with a lot of uh, cultural heritage, they say, I can't do anything. We have to put up with all these really leaky, really bad buildings because we have a, a historic building. So no, you can actually really nicely uh, um, retrofit even um, the most beautiful, and I will show you, uh, historic buildings to uh, may energy positive even. And this is just the top to show that that you can cater to all needs. The reason why I'm showing is, is, is uh, uh, two, it's also uh, in the US, it's also energy positive. So this is also a kind of power plant of the 21st century, making more multi-generational. So it's cohabitation. But also because it's, although it's probably not a cheap property, as you can imagine, but still it sets, it starts uh, with this, um, that it's assembled and easily built so it can actually be replicated and and done cheaply also at lower scale but certainly we have by today a lot of uh, social housing and, and lower income housing in passive house standards uh, uh, as well so but as as i said the most challenge the biggest challenge is is um is a retrofit because we have uh, enough buildings and this is a wonderful example it's also in the us this is a health uh, care center which used to just be in a um in a trailer uh, for for 10 years and then they applied for small funding and managed to buy this this really rundown industrial uh, property so they um uh, repurposed it this was a very nice repurposing and they because they did the passive house retrofit they managed to reduce by 50 percent uh, the mechanical systems uh, and also they used uh, existing furniture and salvaged they call it salvaged uh, furnishing so it's clearly low income and a very good example of a, of a re, um, of a, um, repurposing and, and retrofit. So, um, but you are probably asking, okay, well, if it's so great, why isn't everybody doing this, right? And that's the question I'm still asking, actually, too. But especially, this is also a figure from that paper where we showed that that actually if you look at a lot of the data it doesn't even cost more a new building a passive house new building it doesn't even cost more so this is from uh, from philadelphia and in the same neighborhood very very uh, very similar uh, houses those who are there is of course a huge range of costs because construction can be really depends on what you put inside and so on but on, on average uh, actually the passive house costs even less so why it's not happening? Probably because we are just so used to cheap energy that it just really isn't an issue. So who cares? Why should I uh, optimize uh, for this? And in fact, that's why even this uh, is happening, that um, it's very beautiful, of course, um, the old glazed uh, structures, but there are several things which are really bad with it. First of all, they really overheat, especially now with, with uh, our heat waves. Uh, this is very difficult even to keep with uh, with air conditioning because you have very different uh, uh, temperatures and, and really still uncomfortable. But it's just definitely you lock these buildings into very high air conditioning and energy uh, needs uh, for for as long as these buildings are used, which uh, which is very difficult and also have high embodied CO2. But with this picture, I also wanted to illustrate, and even though it's beautiful, but 
simply maybe in the era of climate emergency and carbon budgets and having to you know find, find uh, our future with a very limited carbon budget we do have to ask ourselves can we do beauty without having to condition a lot of space unnecess unnecessarily so here there is this giant space that they have to air condition which is really overheating in the summer and you have to air condition which really doesn't have a function except it's beautiful i think we have very creative architects who can create beauty without uh without uh necessary very high carbon locking Okay, you say that this is very, all very nice for the rich part, but actually what about the rest of the world? Where it turns out it's also really spreading in the rest of the world. So this happens to be uh, uh, a Chinese passive house conference. If uh, you're in North America, if you have a passive house conference, maybe there are 300, 400 people also in, in Europe. Now in China, there were 30,000 people. It was a whole city and there were 10 of these uh, houses uh, exhibited. This happens to be an energy positive house and I just wanted to show that it's really a very livable, so it's not the thing where you go back to the darkness. But the most interesting thing, these are these really huge cities um, which are all passive house uh, developments. And I totally excellently realized actually why it's so popular with the Chinese middle class and why they are building, uh, buying it. There is not much in it as for, for marketing, except one little monitor, and unfortunately didn't take a picture, of PM 2.5 concentrations inside. These buildings have really low, uh, because they have um, passive house, you have to have ventilation systems and you have to, uh, you have very strict um, air exchange regulations. So, um, so they have very good air quality inside. So even though you cannot, you cannot tell the outdoor air quality, but if you know that your children's mental health and, and, and intellectual abilities are going to depend on, on clean air, then this is the best thing you can do for them. So we never sometimes know, you know, why uh, is some sustainable solutions um, spreading. For example, this is also from Hungary, uh, uh, one of our first uh, uh, retrofits where we retrofitted um, my, saving 90% uh, energy. And what this woman is showing, she just pulled out the two, um, two filters, and this is the out, out door part of the filter, this is the indoor, it's near an iron smelter. So it's before that, all of this used to be in their lungs or, or in their furniture. And what she said, the thing that she loves most about this uh, retrofit, it's not that they pay much less energy, of course, they don't care for the climate or anything. What she loves most is she have to clean, she used to have to clean every day. Now it's enough for her to clean one day. And I know you will laugh and you think it's ridiculous and, and it will never make into an IPCC report, right? That women have to clean with 10 times less. But, you know, that's really important for people. And, and we just, it's not in the science. And why is it not in the science? This is why these people really improve the quality of their lives. And also noise, for example, this is next to a very heavy road. And because in passive house, you have to have really good windows. So there is absolutely no noise. So. But there is also the science now uh, attached to it. So what this shows is that, unfortunately, uh, we also we have serious air pollution, air quality issues in Europe with PM 2.5, and the burden of disease is big. But interestingly, of course, because we spend most of our time indoors, we don't get sick because from our door air, but we get sick from the bad indoor air quality. So what this figure says is that the best thing you can do for health, for get, uh, getting rid of a lot of the health uh, problems for, from air pollution in Europe is actually changing buildings to passive house level. Because what you see is that this is uh, um, outdoor sources, but this is all indoor. So from outdoor sources, for example, cardiovascular diseases can be significantly reduced. The light bars, uh, shaded uh, light bars are those which can be reduced by good ventilation systems. So, and this is, was before COVID. So if we had COVID, that would also be a very significant uh, big bar because that's also uh, helping a lot. So um, let's go back. But uh, so yes, um, it's very important, but um, to do zero energy building, yes, yes, we can do it. But this, uh, to go to passive house level, that's one, uh, that means 15 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, that's one thing. But going to zero, actually, really, the key to that is maximized energy efficiency and minimized um, energy and material demand. 
And I want to give you an example, which I mentioned that one of the biggest scientific mistakes of my life. So we were, you know, initially when California and the UK and all of these were coming up with these uh, net zero energy mandates, it was early two decades ago. And we were like, oh, come on, this is impossible. So let's finally do research and show them that which are the areas where this is not possible. They shouldn't set us policy goals, which are in, impossible because then, you know, people will get disappointed that it will backfire and so on. So we did all this research and calculated which places you cannot do um, net zero energy buildings. And for sure, one category was Central Europe, uh, high rise commercial buildings, no way you know, really high energy use and really little um, insulation per, per square footage. Now, fortunately, uh, the professional, the industry doesn't read academic literature. That's really good because they, uh, they didn't care for my fantastic scientific findings and they just went in and did it. So this is the building of um, the Vienna um, Technical University. It was a retrofit. And uh, this was before, it was just ready for a retrofit and they retrofitted and this is now a power plant. This is producing more energy than it's consuming and there is no rocket science in it. But what was the key to it? But when I show you this, I a little bit comfort myself that I wasn't completely stupid saying that. So let me just justify my mistake. So um, because before the building had 800 kilowatt hours per square meter per year, the commercial buildings use very a lot of, of energy. Even a really good office building at that time was 450. So of course, if you can only produce 60 kilowatt hours per square meter um, per year from solar energy, so I wasn't that stupid saying that, look, this is impossible, right? They made up all my alibi. But they again said, well, you know, let's try it. So this is what they did. And it doesn't matter if you don't understand German, because the point is in the yellow. What they did, they optimized 9,300 components. So it's not about one big technology. So all of her scenarios, IPC scenarios, you know, they model big technologies. And also when I said, oh, this is really possible. And when I asked, went to Yasa, can you please include this in your models? Yeah, give me the one thing that, that made the difference. It's not one thing, it's 9,300 things. And it's, you cannot put that into integrated assessment models. So the point is, these are all the different types of energy uses in that building, heating, cooling, but everything else from tea kitchens to coffee machines to, to security systems. Actually, it turned out to be the security systems were one of the big users. And just ask the students, go around, think about how you could reduce the energy use of that. So uh, when it went to one tenth of this, then it was immediately possible to have a net zero energy building or energy plus building. And what I'm trying to, this is just an example, because this is actually applies to cities, to everything, to go to net zero energy, net zero carbon, really what you, the only way to do is really go to very low demand. So for example, we did, uh, uh, this is a study, unfortunately, it's not uh, having materials yet, but this is uh, the Vienna, uh, gave this fantastic historic um, building complex to my university as, as the new home. So we looked at, would it be possible to retrofit this under very strict national uh, monument protection? Could we turn it into also power plant energy positive district? And after um, a long study, we understood, yes, we can also do that. Again, the same uh, reduction, very significant reduction, but it really needs a very big reduction. This is the university and this is the, the dormitory dormitories energy consumption, but it's possible after we did the same looking at all the energy uses. But the biggest thing of this was that not only it's possible, but actually it turned out to be cheaper than a regular retrofit. Why? Um, the thing is, this was the conventional retrofit and this was the energy plus retrofit. And the thing is, simply retrofitting the district heating system, it was already there, but simply fixing it and, 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 and adding to it the district cooling system would have been such a big cost. Yes, there are, yes, district systems look very attractive, but in the end, they have high cost, they have also high embodied carbon. So in the end, the, the flexible low, uh, local and low scale solutions seem to me much cheaper. And we won with it um, actually the best environmental research uh, in Austria. This is the minister who, who gave uh, the prize. I was just one of the members. So these are actually the people who can do it because they have already done energy positive. And now the bad, sad side of the story that my university board decided 
just when the same Senate meeting, the Senate meeting adopted that, yes, we, are, we agree to take this research and we will up, uh, retrofit this uh, to energy positive level. This would have been the first energy positive district in the, in the world. But then the board decided that we will not go there. We will have another campus is too far out of the city. So anyway, it will still probably happen just without my university. So anyway, but why does this all matter? It all matters now, especially because we are in an energy crisis and you are less, but in Europe, this is, we are really into really, really serious trouble in how, how even the most affluent people can, whether we can afford heating or whether we will have enough heating, it's, it's very serious. But actually, and it turns out half of all European energy is for heating. And, um, but we always ask, still even in this crisis, we only ask, okay, well, where can we get the natural gas from then? If we can't get it from Russia, where else can we get it? Well, we, you don't need the natural gas because you can just retrofit the buildings in a way that you don't need heating at all. Um, and in this research, what we have shown is that if you, if we, um, this is also for, from our global energy model, if we retrofit uh, European buildings to the level and after a, a certain initial period of learning and so on to this, we don't do anything else, just what has already been shown to, to work and also, also to actually not uh, to be affordable, we replicate that. We can uh, get rid of Russian gas dependency by uh, the 2040s. I know it's still later than, than this winter, but you know we have been saying that for decades and once it's, it, we have to start. And if we instead go again into new, uh, uh, new dependencies, new lock-ins, and create a lot new stranded assets. We are building new uh, LNG terminals. We are bringing in a lot of um, new pipelines and so on. They are just going to create more. We, the, our report concluded that we have $4 trillion worth of stranded assets already. So instead of that, we should really invest into the long-term solution, which helps not only in, in a war are my countries next to Ukraine. So we have really um, difficulties and we get uh, our guess actually through the Ukraine. So you help energy security because you're not dependent on who turns off the tap. You don't depend on energy prices. Energy market price markets can go wherever. If you produce your own, then you're, you're just sealed. And socially, it helps a lot because uh, basically you don't have uh, utility costs. So, but the problem is that yes we understand okay let's let's retrofit but the problem is most of the retrofits actually um <clears throat> we just retrofit a little bit just to, you know we put a little insulation there maybe uh, change a little bit uh, there but that results in a huge lock-in because if we don't do the full uh, net zero or we don't go at least for the really passive house later on you cannot go back for these efficiency potentials and what we calculated here is that instead of this is a scenario where you go just for passive house not yet the net zero um, you can reduce even with huge global um, um, increase in global uh, building stock you can still uh, reduce by more than half of uh, by 2060 your building energy use but instead you will increase a lot, so you lock in 84% of energy use, uh, of today's energy use unnecessarily, and we published uh, this actually with Karen also, we have a paper on, on lock-in, um, so it's already uh, in several places. So I know I have one minute left, but I just want uh, two minutes of your patience with the final point on, because okay, we went all the way to, to, net, uh, to very low energy use, but the last bit, the, 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 uh, how to produce the energy from, and I know you're in the, in the morning, we already discussed on electrification, but sometimes the electrification doesn't, maybe does more harm than good. So for example, this project sounds great, theoretically great idea, but in the end, because you, you cleared so many bushes, so, ma so much uh, biomass, and you disturbed the soil, perhaps you already released more carbon dioxide that you might have saved from this solar park, even if it, you compare it to, uh, to um, 
coal fire plan, power plan and in general we have lots of competition for land especially in the context of mitigation so what would be really much better solution is to use our cities and infrastructure in the cities and integrate uh, the pv there or renewable energy uh, production into there true this is uh, maybe a bit more expensive but in the long run maybe actually uh, cheaper than all the dependencies than we have now and i'm very proud to present this is our new paper that came out uh, two days ago in the journal of cleaner production this is so far the most um, spatially highest, uh, so geo, uh, geospatially most resolved uh, global energy model and, and with incorporating very high detail of the technological potential of building integrated solar energy potentials. This is on per square meter roof area. But basically what we conclude is that if you do nothing, just use every roof that which is feasible and, and where you not, don't have shading and so on, you can generate 30 petawatt hours of electricity. That is more than all of today's global electricity uh, production. So, so basically, of course, it's not that easy, but, but still you wouldn't need any of the land, you wouldn't need basically any, um, any other power source. Of course, it's not so simple, but still I think it's an important figure. So, um, <clears throat> So um, what I wanted to show you today is that, is that we can do a lot by focusing on the demand side and also for net zero cities and energy positive cities. It's really important to not only ask the question, where will my electricity, clean electricity come from and let's electrify everything because especially now that we show in Europe that electricity is not that easy, uh, electricity production, not that easy to ramp up so quickly. And if we need to electrify everything, we need to have so much more uh, electricity uh, generation. And we see in Europe, you don't, you are not able to do that that fast. So the demand side is really important, but we need so much more research on this and we really need to understand how we can inf how we can get these better into the scenarios as very often they inform policymakers more than our little you know page 347 uh, footnote seven so thank you very much uh, for your attention Okay, great. Um, hello, everyone. Yep, my name is Pete Raymond. Um, I'm a professor here in the School of the Environment. Um, I'm trained as a chemical oceanographer, um, but I've studied uh, the carbon budget of sort of ecosystems and the exchange of greenhouse gas between ecosystems and the atmosphere for my whole career. Um, Karen and Colleen asked me to give a five minute introduction to the global carbon budget. Um, I really wanted to like go deep into sort of the natural carbon cycle, uh, but we don't really have time for that. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd just try to hammer home two, maybe three points. And first one is the, the scale of the issue. We've been hearing a lot about scale today that we're facing. Uh, urgency, which we've also been hearing about. And then of course, opportunity with respect to the carbon cycle. Um, this is another way to conceptualize the carbon cycle. It's what I call the anthropogenic carbon cycle. So it basically um, tries to put in the emissions of um, CO2 from uh, the burning of fossil fuels and land use change, but also how the global carbon budget is adapting to make room for that new carbon, right? And of course, the thing that we're worried and interesting about is atmospheric growth. Um, but one of the like biggest ecosystem services that goes on now is that you can see that the atmospheric growth, right, is about half of emissions. And that's because of this land sink and ocean sink. So these, uh, the, the global um, ecosystems are responding by taking up more CO2. Um, I think another point that adds a sense of urgency is there's um, nothing given about these sinks. There is no reason why they're going to continue at this pace in the future. Um, yet, um, obviously, it's a very big, as I said, um, service. I don't know. You can also see that maybe the amount of land vegetation isn't really that big compared to the total amount of emissions, or at least that's the way I think about it. 
And we've been hearing about this today. This was quite surprising to me when I was prepping to this, reading the um, IPCC report that urban consumption-based emissions are 60% of total emissions. So obviously um, a big source of pollution, but also a big um, opportunity. Okay, um, I did wanna say that um, one thing that I've struggled with my whole career when I teach about the carbon cycle is trying to put the size of these emissions in perspective. And of course, this is how we do it mathematically. A gigaton um, of, of emissions is equal to uh, a petagram, which is 10 to the 15th grams of carbon, or a billion tons. But I think one of the issues here is this is a completely abstract number, right? But it is um, exceedingly huge. I've challenged my students a few times to like come up with some analogy that makes this sink home. And I don't think we've really been successful at that. Um, it's a very, very large number. Um, one way you can put it into perspective is to think about per person emissions, um, particularly if you uh, live here in the US. So the average person in the US is responsible for about a really large dump truck worth of emissions a year. Um, and so we all, in the next 10, 15 years, have to eliminate a dump truck of emissions in our personal life. Um, and so uh, this is also, I mean, maybe this is start, starting to put it in perspective. This is about 100 pounds per person per day in the US. And I, I can't really think of any form of pollution that we're responsible for that equals this, maybe wastewater. And so you can imagine sort of you and all your neighbors taking a 100 pound bag of cement and walking down your local waterway and, and dumping it in every day. I mean, I think that analogy is, is somewhat valid. Um, it's a massive problem. Um, the other one with the sense to urgency, um, one way you can think about the sense of urgency is to, is to look at these scenarios. Uh, we haven't heard a ton about emission scenarios today. They're basically like experiments that the IPCC and scientists run, right, to um, probe how changes in behavior and um, how we manage the globe might decrease the emission rate to hit some target temperature. These are some of the first ones from the IPCC in the, in the um, 1990s. And this is a graph that Michael Mann made, um, you know, sometime around 2010, where he basically like, so the emission scenarios all start here, and you know, all these lines are a different scenario where some of them um, are, you know, a little more optimistic change in behaviors. Some of them are pe more pessimistic, business as usual type change in behaviors. And see, so these are all the scenarios in the 1990s starting to march out into the future. And these are the actual rates and emissions. So you can see that when I was finishing grad school, right, um, we had these uh, um, emission scenarios and the actual rates of emissions were usually sort of tracking the business as usual, more pessimistic. And um, that's pretty much still where we are today. But what's even more interesting maybe from, um, is, is looking at like the time scale of trajectories. And so when I was in grad school, Yes, we had to drastically decrease emissions somehow, but there's this 20 year lag period where you could, we could sort of get our act together to do this. And I think mentally, you know, um, this was a little easier to handle, um, but maybe it was also part of the psychology for why uh, we didn't push emissions down. Um, you know, you had this period of time in front of you, 20 years when you're 25 years old is forever. Um, and so, um, yeah, there was a little less sense of urgency. Um, and um, yeah, this is my last slide, of course, from the most recent IPCC report. And you can see that that lag time is gone, right? And that's the sense of urgency, right? This is the wake up call. If we wanna hit one and a half or two degrees, uh, we have to bend the curve immediately. Um, you know, we've been hearing about this. We have to bend the curve in the next few years. So we all have to change our behaviors and we have to change policy um, to start to bend the, bend the curve. And sort of like riffing off of what Deanna was saying, um, it's not gonna be any one solution, right? To get to net zero, we have to eliminate all our emissions and then also start to take up CO2, which our speakers will talk to today. So it requires sort of, um, you know, us to research and look into all of these potential solutions. And I think what we've been hearing today is the, the impressive opportunity that cities offer. 
um, with respect to that. And so um, with that, I'll introduce our first speaker in the series, which is Galina Turkina. Um, she's visiting us from the University of Berlin. Um, she, like all the speakers, right, were, um, worked with the IPCC, and she was with the IPCC Working Group 3, contributing author. And uh, thanks for coming. It's all yours. I will use this microphone. I think this one doesn't work. Okay. There you go. Oh, okay. Does the microphone work? Yeah? Can you hear me? Okay. Good. So, <clears throat> thank you very much for the invitation. I really have been enjoying the day today, listening to the other talks, discussions, questions, and answers. Um, and um, so I'm going to continue basically the conversation about the cities as solutions to um, climate change. And my specific kind of focus will be on the carbon cycle. So when we think of uh, solutions um, to a problem, right, we try to develop a strategy. And um, usually we try to, to optimize and to come up with a strategy that brings us to, this, to the solution as soon as possible. So um, for the climate mitigation strategy, I think um, this, the strategies have been in the past mostly focusing on lowering uh, the carbon emissions. Uh, that was absolutely um, a right move. But for the last 200 years, we have been emitting so much carbon into the atmosphere. And Peter already showed that we accumulated a lot of it already in the atmosphere. So even if we today just shut off all the emissions, this carbon will stay there. And um, even though um, the natural ecosystems, uh, the vegetation and the ocean, they've taken up this um, carbon, it's, um, we don't know what happens to these um, things in the future. So we need, when we think of the effect, effective climate mitigation strategy, we need to add to this, into this equation, so to speak, to the lowering emissions, also the carbon uptake and uh, also we have to look for the pools where to store this carbon uh, safely and long term because we don't want to uh, store somewhere the carbon so that and it will be emitted in the next five years let's put it this way so cities um, and uh, the carbon cycle kind of the, car the cities basically they offer solution to all this kind of three um, parts of this kind of three, three um, parts in this equation and um, I'll start with a short review of the carbon pool of the carbon uh, pools and fluxes, basically carbon cycle of the city. Uh, so I'll start with carbon pools because it's the easiest. And uh, Peter already introduced us the global carbon cycle. This is kind of scaling down to the city scale. And uh, cities have actually more pools uh, than the natural ecosystems. So in addition to the vegetation and soils. Um, and um, the lakes and rivers like the, um, the, um, that also exist in the natural systems. We also have in the cities infrastructures, especially buildings, and also the uh, landfills. I mean, we don't want to, to maybe talk about it and we try to kind of, but this is also a way to store carbon. So when we talk about fluxes, we have to think broader than a city because cities are not self-sufficient. And that has been mentioned again and again, I think, by many speakers today. And um, so we need to think of urban footprint and uh, basically a transfer of uh, different uh, fuels into the cities that we need to satisfy the energy demand of uh, urban dwellers. We need to think of the flux of uh, food and fiber, especially construction materials. Um, and that they all come from the um, outside of the cities, from the footprint of the city. So whatever comes in the city is not and not used um, immediately or over some time in the city comes out as a waste, right? And um, the other part of this will come out as uh, ga as gases. So we burn, for instance, uh, fossil fuels. Um, so. What is important here is that all these arrows, they show the carbon fluxes. So the, all these uh, um, fossil fuels that we bring in, they, they have very high carbon content, 70 to 90%. Uh, 
wooden fiber have carbon content up to 50 percent and waste of course it's it's very the picture is very heterogeneous there are very different types of waste but when we talk of solid waste and especially it has biomass it's it can be also up to 50 percent of a carbon store, uh, storage. So in the cities, we don't only emit carbon. This all the uh, our vehicle that use fossil fuels or the power plants. We also uptake carbon, and this carbon can be taken up by, by vegetation, by urban plan, urban street plan, plants, urban street trees, parks and gardens, uh, but also actually the buildings. So the buildings that contain cementous materials. They also uptake carbon, but the rate of this uptake is substantially lower than by the trees. So I did estimation some time ago, it's um, roughly two orders of magnitudes lower than what the trees can do. And this is the kind of ideal conditions when you kind of have the ideal uh, moisture and um, the, the particle size of these materials is very small, so the CO2 can diffuse. Uh, whatever we do inside the cities, whatever we bring inside of the cities, will also have impact on the uh, ecosystems that are not urban, right? The, on the systems outside of the urban uh, footprint. In, in, in the urban footprint. And this footprint is actually large. It's not only the areas adjacent, but it's also sometimes of this, some ecosystems are located um, miles and thousand miles in, uh, away. In addition to that, we, when we emit uh, all these pollutants, uh, all greenhouse gases, but also other pollutants like sulfur dioxide, for instance, um, we um, basically can um, impact the carbon cycle and like carbon uptake of plants that grow into in the urban areas, but also um, the, those that are downwind from the cities. And some of those uh, pollutants that cities emit, like carbon dioxide or nitrous oxides, they are kind of fertilizer. They have fertilizing effect on the um, vegetation. So they will actually grow better if they're in the downwind from the city. But if you have the ozone and increased ozone concentrations that are often also uh, part of the equation when you think of pollution in the city, then they will actually reduce, they may actually damage, have damaging effect on the agriculture, but also the, on the plants outside. So um, this is a complex kind of system. And when we talk of the carbon uh, cycle and all these pulls and fluxes, um, I will not talk much about um, all of these parts, but I will focus on the infrastructures and um, especially buildings. Um, Diana already started this uh, conversation about the buildings and how we can achieve the uh, high efficiency buildings for basically bicycles and passive houses, how we can build them, that that's possible. And um, so if you look at the city, and this is Berlin, that is very green city, in any uh, city, the buildings, they dominate the skyline, skyline, they dominate the landscape. So in Berlin, the um, a uh, fraction of vegetation is roughly 30% of the total area, so it's a very green, but still the buildings is actually that um, um, by weight by far exceed the uh, plants. So how can we store carbon in the buildings? What can we do with the buildings? So today we mostly use cementous materials, um, concrete for instance, uh, that is basically cement mixed with aggregates and steel in our, our urban construction. Both of these materials, they contain carbon. Steel has very, very small amount, less than half a percent, so we could really show it on this picture. And um, cement also. Cement um, also has, as I already mentioned, these materials, they have the, the ability to absorb the carbon from the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, and um, uh, it fixes with, um, uh, with the other, with um, calcium carbonate, and then uh, it basically leads to increase of carbon storage in um, these materials over time. But the maximum storage that you can achieve in the one ton of um, um, kind of material is, it's basically 12%. So if we compare it to the biomass-based materials, such as timber, for instance, one of those, uh, here we have, again, emissions that um, are associated with production of these materials, but we can store substantially more because the biomass 
has 50% uh, of um, carbon basically by weight. So the, uh, all of these three materials, they do uh, the, the production of these materials and construction is associated with, um, with the building um, this um, mission. What is important here is also to think of the material intensity. So if we build with biomass based materials, so with timber, uh, then we have substantially less weight and emit less. So this is an example where I compare basically how much we can store in a um, mid-rise house designed with timber to a temperate rainforest a system that has the highest carbon um, storage above ground. And in timber building above ground, we store around 186 uh, kilograms of carbon per square meter. And uh, below ground, the carbon storage is really low because there is a um, clean field that is, has no basically carbon usually. But also, but in temperate rainforest above ground, the carbon storage is lower. So it's only 52 uh, kilograms of carbon per square meter. So, um, so this is an example. And of course the question arises, others do these buildings already exist that are carbon sink rather than a storage? And this is a building in um, uh, Zweisimen, Switzerland. It's in Matterhorn region, not, not far from Bern. Uh, so then, uh, Average temperature of July is around uh, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and, and this is the hot, hottest month. And January is the cold, uh, coldest month. It's around uh, 35, 34 degrees Fahrenheit. In New Haven, does anybody know compar comparable values what they are? You have to get the benchmark. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, so in, um, in, um, in New Haven, the temperature is around 73 degrees, like the, the average monthly temperature. And in January, it's sub, 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 31 degrees, so it's a little bit lower. So what is interesting in, um, in this building is that um, it has a, a very high carbon story, store because it, it's uh, built with dowel laminated mass timber that is a champion basically in terms of carbon storage per square meter of um, the wall area and it contains no glues and glues lead to high emissions usually it actually increased emissions from, from glue lamp uh, so it has very low carbon emissions um, it contains a lot of carbon and built but it also has no cooling heating of any fireplace, basically, it's a passive house. Uh, so it has very uh, low emissions from operating this building. And indoor temperature doesn't drop below 64 degrees. So this is, I think, an example of the building that is basically uh, more or less a carbon sink. So I return to my equation and uh, kind of reiterate the statement that um, the cities can basically uh, move toward, they, they, they can help this climate mitigation strategy addressing all these three big important components and um, the, what, we, what the cities and authorities and what we can do in the cities is basically reducing emissions, that's something that people, that the speakers previously were talking about, but we also need to build the pools and we need to increase the uptake of carbon in the cities and also build these pools um, that are mostly in the buildings. So, thank you. Okay, great. Um, we're going to hear again from Diana uh, Berg Orstas from um, Central European University. Thanks for uh, being here with me today. I can learn more about how to prepare and improve the city. But it's difficult to speak after Galina since she already covered almost everything. But uh, that's uh, that's good because I can be then uh, faster. So first of all, this uh, just to illustrate the the size of the impact and, and the carbon uh, commitment that we have, this is a figure from a paper that we've done together from uh, with the uh, scientific steering committee members um, of the first uh, cities and, uh, and climate change science uh, conference uh, co-organized by the IPCC at the beginning of this uh, cycle. So what the, uh, the, what the figure shows is that this is the existing infrastructure, although this is a few years ago, but still, 
And this is what, the, uh, if, if we close the infrastructure, oops, sorry, what happened? If we close the infrastructure gap and also uh, the new uh, cities that we have to build. So basically we are talking about in the order of magnitude of 200, 30 gigatons of carbon that still uh, will, could be emitted as a result of that. Now, if you know, of course, carbon budgets are very uncertain, but that could be a third to half of all of the remaining carbon budget that we still have towards one and a half degrees. And we haven't even turned any of the light switches on, and we already uh, committed this carbon. So this is exactly the size of the challenge, and this is why it's so important what uh, Ganina demonstrated that turning this liability into an opportunity is, is, is perhaps one of the biggest uh, research questions, especially that, that um, uh, cement is such an uh, incredibly uh, uh, dynamically growing material and it's, it's so widely used. After water, concrete is the second most used substance on earth uh, by people. So it's, uh, and by today, all human mass exceeds all living uh, biomass uh, on the planet from a very recent uh, nature paper. And um, in fact, if you look at it, the amount tripled since the turn of the millennium. So it's really a big question whether it's, it's uh, good to go this way. So again, let's go back to the strategies. So uh, the strategies that uh, I uh, collected again from uh, digging into the, um, the working group three report. Uh, so I will have to go back again to the durability and the long life of buildings. And especially after Galina's talk, perhaps it's even you understand better because if we store carbon in, um, in timber or, or, or in, in the building infrastructure, it's not a permanent storage, it's just a temporary storage, but it's a big question how long, so the longer we take that carbon out of the carbon cycle, the better it is. So it's uh, with the carbon signature, this is becoming even uh, more important. And I forgot to um, um, mention one important policy uh, in my previous talk, which I was going to say about uh, how to encourage uh, retrofits rather than new construction, because it's always easier to just demolish and build new, right? That's also the trend here, also in Europe, and let's build uh, new. But um, in Europe, uh, the NGOs, the Greens, actually are pushing for a ban on new construction. Now, clearly, that would never fly in the US, and probably to, well, it's not going to fly in, in uh, Europe either. However, at least we could uh, have to fix some of our incentive systems uh, to um, favor retrofits rather than new construction. For, for example, uh, in Hungary, we have a 5% VAT on new construction, but we have a 25% VAT on retrofit. So clearly, it's going to be much more cost effective to just demolish and build new. So I think we, we with financial incentives and regulations, uh, or for example, another opportunity is that, for example, you, you want to hire someone from abroad, you have to justify that you really, really couldn't get anyone locally, right? I don't know if, if you still have that system, but in Europe, we still have that. Why don't we do that also with new construction? Okay, maybe you can build new, but can you really justify that there is nothing existing infrastructure that you could repurpose for that? Okay, so going back to the uh, minimizing material demand um, and uh, replacing by high emission materials, especially cement and steel by biomass uh, materials, uh, carbon uh, using bio-based materials and nature to capture carbon and store also in blue and green infrastructure that was very prominent in the working group, both two, but also in working group three uh, report. But also, I'm so glad that uh, Galina mentioned soils. It's so um, very impressive result, I think, uh, our working group three report that one of the biggest potentials of carbon mitigation is really related to soils. And in the end, even those uh, the cities don't uh, have a lot of uh, don't cover a lot of area but still preserving life soil makes uh, still a difference and integrating even micro ecosystems into infrastructure green roofs walls um, or rather in the end because we have a lot in the end it does add up uh, to a lot i'm not going to uh, cover this is also in our report improved material production processes recycling uh, the circular economy and carbon capture utilization and storage all of these are covered by uh, the industry chapter but since it's not uh, in the remit of cities i won't talk about this today 
But just to coming back, the importance of material and energy efficiency. So this is from uh, the, our special report of one and a half degrees. And what you saw, these are the in full illustrative scenarios of how we could get there. So just I want to just show you the P1 and P4. We are really heading towards the P4. That means, you know, slower, like Peter sh showed, a little bit slower thinking and then oof, down. But then we will have to compensate with this gigantic carbon capture and storage or negative emissions up to 20 gigatons per year. That's, that's just really enormous. Now, there is a lot of scientific concern about a very high level of negative emissions. Um, the point is that, uh, so, uh, um, for example, that last scenario that Eric already alluded to uh, has developed alternatives without uh, the big negative emissions, but we also have other scenarios with lower negative emissions. But the key characteristic, you can still do it without this, but the key is you have to reduce demand very significantly without, uh, of course, compromising uh, services. So let's uh, look at the actual uh, case studies. So this is, uh, was at that time the first uh, timber-based uh, uh, skyscraper, and it was uh, claimed this is by the industry, the numbers are from the industry, they claim a triple carbon win. Well, actually it is a triple carbon win, just the numbers are not, not verified. But first of all, it's a passive house, so it already reduces a lot of emissions or by 90%, although Vancouver has very clean electricity, so um, that's uh, maybe they're not so significant. And avoided emissions uh, from not using uh, concrete is uh, big, but in fact, what they claim that the storage is in fact uh, over three times bigger, which is in, in, in the timber. So altogether, uh, these are three aspects how it's winning. But of course, we don't know how much uh, uh, the industry calculations are reliable. And if you look at the science, this is uh, from our uh, buildings chapter of working group three, uh, the embodied carbon in the different construction materials, it's actually not all that uh, straightforward. So um, because, for example, they, uh, the report shows that general timber actually has positive carbon emissions. In fact, if you look at, it has more than most of cement. So, um, ex except for, for concrete block. So it's really the devil is in the detail, but nevertheless, it's true that if you do timber well, then, then certainly it has a very high level of negative emissions. But interestingly, for example, for bamboo, the chapter doesn't show uh, negative emissions. Unfortunately, it doesn't uh, show um, straw, which I, I also wanted to uh, point out because there are a lot of countries where there is not so much timber available and there are not so much but there is um, but there's more agriculture so agriculture waste could be used for example straw and this is uh, from uh, an example from lithuania this is but this is not like the three little piglets but these are really industrially <laughs> uh, industrially um, constructed panel which are actually high had high load bearing and actually have very high fire safety um, performances uh, higher than actually some of the concrete um, in buildings so, and this is a, a multi-story house also from, um, uh, from straw. So yes, you can have also load bearing uh, buildings. And in fact, you may think that uh, it's, uh, it's not, uh, you know, it's uh, lunatics, but actually there is quite a lot of uh, straw buildings already in Europe. This is just the ones which are in the this particular database. And I don't think it's so much country specific or that there might be some incentives uh, uh, but it's more, I think, where the data has been collected, where, where uh, it hasn't. Uh, nevertheless, it's very interesting that we always talk about just the building shell. But in fact, if you look at life cycle in, uh, assessments of uh, whole buildings, after, right after the, the walls, the biggest impact actually is from carpets, especially uh, because they are not used for a long time. You replace them very often, so very significant uh, carbon impact. So there also a, a very important opportunity for not only avoiding the high emissions, but also uh, a storage. If you use, we use bio-based uh, carpeting, and this is, for example, an organic uh, um, carpet from bio-based materials, then you uh, also store uh, the um, carbon in, in the carpet. And now that I'm back for three years, I haven't been to the US, so it's uh, interesting to be back. And I realize that there is so much, um, so much parking. Uh, this is, uh, 
um, but you could really do much better. So lots of the cement is used uh, for, um, for road infrastructure, but also parking and to small driveways. Now for driveways, which are not used a lot, you can actually use alternatives. This, it actually doesn't show, but there is a structure under this. Uh, so it's not just simply uh, lawn. And for example, in, in Kolkata in India, it's actually prohibited to use uh, fully uh, full um, asphalt covering for either driveways or parking lots because of the flood uh, risk. But this is really uh, the, um, a very important mitigation strategy, which is which is very strong. Uh, which has very strong synergies with adaptation and this summer taught us uh, the most because uh, uh, in Hungary we had very very severe drought the most severe in, in whole uh, Europe and one of the problems is that we have been covering so much of our surface uh, with uh, concrete in the last couple of uh, years we have been the first in the whole EU as per capita new uh, concrete coverage and we pay a high price because uh, we simply now have much more um, water leaving our country than coming in. So such, if we eliminate some of the urban uh, surface coverings uh, from concrete and instead where it's not necessary, we, uh, we have permeable surface covers, then uh, you also help uh, the drought because uh, the soil will be much more moist. And um, so this is also an alternative uh, for that. And that will keep the trees uh, also long, longer, which will cool in, in return, which will keep the temperatures longer cool. So, <laughs> excuse me. So it's a very good uh, win. Win. Uh, this is from the Prague. Also, cobblestones are a good solution if you keep the live soil. So first of all, they are permeable, but also it's important that the so you don't kill the soil. So it's still even under the rocks. There is some soil which still keeps the carbon and perhaps even uh, builds uh, keeps uh, building up the soil. So we simply, how Deborah said very nicely, Deborah Roberts, the co-chair working group too, that we need to learn in cities to work with nature rather than keep nature out of our um, our boundaries. So this example I wanted to uh, for material efficiency and low material de uh, demand. This is, it doesn't matter which particular airport because any airport is roughly uh, like this. The point is that it's just so much uh, concrete without really a big function. I mean, it's yes, it's beautiful, but why do we necessarily need to, do we want to show from space that this is an airport so that uh, the aliens can land there? Or simply, I don't quite understand because in the end, all you need from this space is the first, let's say three, if you're generous, the first three meters. So all of this space is totally unnecessary. And on the fig uh, figure, you show that there is even more unnecessary uh, concrete. So the point is that because it is not going to be very easy to, uh, to neutralize our emissions, as simply uh, it's, First of all, we are slow. Second of all, we don't have yet the technologies, uh, especially uh, cement related emissions. We really need to think about, for example, how to be more practical and more designed to function and also uh, do uh, aesthetics, redefine aesthetics uh, rather than um, doing just uh, we don't have the luxury to put a lot of concrete just for aesthetics. And this is a very good um, architect friend of mine. I know it's not necessarily nice this language, but I think it has a lot of wisdom uh, into, in, in this tweet it summarizes, because it's true that a lot of times life cycle assessment, very complicated, very difficult. We just don't, it's just uh, often we can't do it. And it's actually as simple as that. And finally, just I wanted to walk through this example. It's a Chinese. Uh, example, it's a retrofit, and there are just lots of nice features on this. So first of all, it's an old house, it's a several year old house retrofitted to newest modern standards, um, to passive house levels, so it's a low energy consumption. It's mostly using bio based materials, so a lot of carbon capture in the materials uh, already. It, um, it reuses, uh, uh, these are reused uh, materials from uh, others. So not putting in new, but others are repaired. If some tiles were missing, they'd rather just uh, pre reproduced a few tiles, but they repaired rather than uh, made new. The surfaces are permeable. The soil uh, remained uh, alive. So uh, the, the carbon to capture the carbon. There are small micro ecosystems uh, integrated. And also there is shading by trees, so you keep it cool and you capture the carbon by trees, bushes and, and live soil. So 
in the end, I think there is a lot more research that we still need in this, uh, in this and I, I, Galina already mentioned a few. I, first of all, I, what is, would be really important, how to integrate these into um, the big pathways. But I think an interesting question, perhaps also for our, our panel, would be, is what's the best use of really land uh, how to capture the most uh, amount of carbon? Because the GRC has a Joint Research Center of the European Commission, which is like the, the National Lab System in the US. Their report actually had a very provocative conclusion that, in fact, if you, if you have just given amount of land where you can produce wood, what's the best, the best way to capture the most carbon weight is simply leave it alone and leave it uh, just as a natural ecosystem. It's better than using it as timber for construction and bio-based materials and so on. I don't know if this is true. I think it's really an interesting question to discuss and to have first do more research on it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deanna. Um, so our next speaker is Clara Pregitzer. Um, she is the Deputy Director of Conservation Science at the Natural Areas Conservancy. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just get situated here. Um, thank you, Karen, so much for inviting me and having uh, our work part of the IPCC chapter. It's been so nice to hear from everyone today, and I feel like my mind is completely saturated with um, just the amount of possibility and solutions in transportation and in buildings. Um, so I'm going to be kind of taking a different turn and talking about the role of green, green and blue infrastructure. Uh, my background is in forestry and land conservation, but I've been working in New York City for 12 years. And I currently work at a nonprofit. So while I do research uh, there, I also work in advocacy for more funding and converting that research into case making um, and implementation. So I will be uh, introduce, briefly introducing in my time types of green and blue infrastructure and how they're framed and the mitigation and adaptation opportunities and the role that they play. And then I'll walk you through an urban forest case study. Most of my work is really in urban forests and is really US centric, but I think there's lessons to be learned um, and in this case study that could be applied to many types of green and blue infrastructure. And then I'll talk a little bit about some challenges and opportunity to making this happen in the uh, city landscape. So I will not belabor this point because I think we all know the impacts that climate change can have on people and communities in cities. There's a ton of pavement. There's a lot of people that live there. And as we see increased precipitation, uh, increased warming, increased wind events, the impacts of climate are very significant and very significant to the people that live in cities. And green and blue spaces can be part of this solution. So um, this is a, a figure from chapter eight. And I really loved working with the team on this figure because it shows the diversity of green and blue spaces and the relative differences in mitigation benefits and adaptation strategies. Um, I primarily work in urban forests, as I mentioned, but I would say that we need a wide variety and diversity of green and blue space solutions, but these will not be, all be equally abundant in cities or equally possible in cities. Um, and I'll also say that green and blue spaces and green and blue infrastructure uh, cannot be the silver bullet. Um, there just is not a lot of green and blue space land as, at a, um, within the cityscape. And so emission reductions and many of the solutions that we've heard about today are, are critically important. But I think many urban residents really identify with green and blue space solutions. Um, they want to walk on a shaded street, they want to enjoy a forest, um, and are very worried about aspects of flooding in their own homes and view green and blue space solutions as um, a solution to that problem. So I have just some images, and these are very US and New York City centric, but just to describe and visualize some of these places. So coastal tidal marshes, many cities are close to water bodies or developed close to water bodies and are critically important for absorbing storm surge. And in many cities in land use planning, as we think about developing cities, 
uh, even in New York, historically have filled in their tidal marshes and built houses uh, on the coastline. And this is still happening at a very regular rate. And so just thinking about land protection as one form um, and uh, salt marsh restoration projects. Um, food forests or urban agriculture is critically important. Um, uh, thinking about where we get our food and if it's being transported into the city. Uh, food forests and urban agriculture can offer cooling benefits and stormwater capture and bring local communities together. Green roofs have been shown to um, reduce energy demand um, by nearly 60% and heating demand from 10 to 30% and also offer a, a point of uh, recreation for urban residents. If you have, like many of the apartments I've lived in, just painted white or black roofs. Um, one of my first apartments in New York, I lived on the fifth floor and in the summer it was just boiling hot. And so having a green roof uh, can promote biodiversity and also improve heating and cooling. Street trees are critically also important to reducing heating and cooling demand, but also for aesthetics, shaded walks on the street, um, and connection to like, uh, nature in your uh, daily life. So uh, I work in natural areas primarily and forested natural areas, and uh, they can be places that have a really high density of trees, have a permeable surface with soils, promote biodiversity and habitat, and be really important for stormwater capture. Um, I threw in this uh, additional picture of an urban forest because it sort of shows forests at two stages. We do a lot of tree planting in cities and afforestation, and this is actually a really beautiful picture of an afforestation site. Uh, oftentimes we'll convert brownfields or landfills, cap, and, ca uh, cap a landfill and plant trees on it or convert uh, really degraded lands by planting trees. And so that's another solution that is uh, considered and implemented in cities. So to move on to the urban forest case study, the reason that we became interested in quantifying the carbon storage and sequestration in our natural areas in New York City was really to insert ourselves into the story and narrative about climate change and nature-based solutions. Um, we kept talking about natural areas for their biodiversity, their access to nature and public health, and we just couldn't get the time of day in a lot of cases for increasing funding. And so we started to think through strategies and I think really understood that if we could talk about natural areas and really connect that to management, that the case could be made for the importance of um, protecting them and also managing them. So prior to 2019, um, often urban forests were really considered um, as tree canopy or as one type. And uh, we, we really focus on forested natural areas and it might seem sort of niche, but I think there's important reasons to distinguish these types of forests for their uh, care and management, but also funding needs. And I'll also uh, describe the different some of the differences in carbon storage and sequestration so in new york city natural areas account for five and a half percent of the total city which i actually think is a lot uh, 11 percent of the city is natural areas and that um the remaining is grasslands and tidal marshes and open water even though they're just a quarter of the tree canopy they make up 65 percent of the total amount of trees in the city so that's where that density comes in um, and this is actually a really common type of parkland, even if you might envision, you know, a landscaped lawn in a city, 65% uh, of uh, or 68% of parkland in the US is a uh, natural area and that's the 100 largest cities. So we did a carbon accounting project. We had inventory data for our natural areas, over 1,000 field-based measured plots for trees and soil, and plugged it into allometric equations. And we found that the forests in New York City were really similar to rural forests in the amount of carbon they stored. Most of the carbon is stored in trees and soil, and that's very common in forest accounting projects. Um, and the total number is uh, down there. Um, I think the sequestration or stock change amounts to around 4,000 cars off the road per year, which um, if you think of 8 million residents in New York City, it, it, isn't a, it isn't a lot in the grand scheme of things. But I think the importance is really the relativity of healthy forests um, 
unhealthy forests and kind of comparing different types of green and green and blue infrastructure. So then when you look at uh, forest type and condition, um, you can see these are all New York City forest types, but our native oak tulip forests store nearly three times more carbon than our degraded non-native vinelands. So really connecting this to the importance of land management and uh, trajectories that could support biodiversity and habitat. We've also just this summer installed temperature, air temperature sensors in some of these forests and found that uh, our healthiest forests are also much cooler. In our healthiest forests, they were on average 11 degrees cooler than the sidewalk or buildings. And our healthy, healthier forests were seven degrees cooler than a street tree and, and um, four degrees cooler than our unhealthy natural areas. Um, so even though this might seem sort of nuanced, I think there could be many cases where in green, green or blue infrastructure, you have a desired target or condition and kind of thinking through uh, the additive benefits of managing those areas to improve carbon storage and the many co-benefits that come along with that. Um, so just to sort of summarize, I think connecting the climate adaptation strategies to mitigation potential, there could be potentially two pathways. So if a lot of our forests and cities might have healthy canopies now, but have invasive species, um, you know, really living in a different world than when some of those oak trees established 100 years ago. If we have some low cost interventions, we could really get to a site where we maximize carbon storage, we maximize cooling, biodiversity. Um, but if we have no interventions, we could see a loss in some of those mitigating benefits. And really thinking through the cost benefit scenarios, I think this is a really um, low cost in the grand scheme of things to manage natural lands and city when we're talking about huge infrastructure projects. Uh, so I also want to enforce that the size, age, and spatial arrangement of cities can really make a difference. So we're currently scaling these carbon accounting methods to five other cities, and you can see that um, when we summarize this, this is just for live trees and we're relating it to the gallons of gas offset, but all of these cities are storing and sequestering carbon in their natural areas at a very similar rate per acre or per hectare, but it's really about just the size and amount of uh, land that exists. And so um, I think land protection and land planning, smart land planning is critical. Um, so a few challenges and threats, land conversion, um, climate change and urban impacts. I think the combination of being in an urban setting is um, something that land managers think a lot of, about. And then lack of funding and political will. I think um, I'll, I'll rush through my last few slides here, but I think when the mayor, I really resonated with some of the comments from the mayor has people asking them about you know crime and safety affordable housing um, they're not hearing from a lot of constituents about more green and blue space even though that's really valued by city residents um, so I'll, a few uh, kind of opportunities to close with um, i think there's a lot of opportunity to fill data and knowledge gaps these are maps of new york city but um this map on the here uh, is a really fine scale map that shows different types of green space and, and having a map like this can really allow city planners to begin to think about some of the decisions that they make. Many cities that we work with um, in a network of cities don't even have a map of where their natural areas exist. They might have a parkland map, they might have a tree canopy map, but nothing that can intersect some of those decisions for green infrastructure. Um, looking at trends and change over time and then really thinking about people and climate equity. Um, I think there it takes a lot of work to get to implementation and I really resonated with a lot of the comments from Angel earlier. Um, we wrote this forest management plan in, in 2018 and just to get the high level goals inserted into the one New York City citywide plan took significant coordination and planning. And, um, and then you still have to implement it. So really kind of crossing those governance structures is critically important. And then finding, thinking of, finally thinking about influencing po uh, policy and political will. In New York City, the Parks Department receives less than 1% of the city budget and Forest Care receives less than 1% of the parks budget. To double the budget would be basically a rounding error for the city. Um, 
And that's what we asked Mayor Adams to do, to increase the budget to 1%. And um, yet that didn't happen. He certainly uh, gave us some pockets of money, but it, wa it wasn't really what we needed. And I think green and blue infrastructure can be a pretty low cost investment for cities that can connect the community. And I think there's a lot of opportunity um, to you know, uh, connect science to advocacy. So thank you. Okay, I'd like to invite my panel members up to the stage. You're all doing great. I know this is the end of the seven hours um, in this room. We got a half hour more, so let's go out on a strong note here. Um, I'll start with just a couple questions. Um, and um, yeah, then invite you folks to all jump in. So, so I wanted to start with uh, climate change. Um, you know, here in Connecticut, we're suffering our second major drought in six years. And like, I'm, I study streams and rivers. All of a sudden, I'm studying drought. This is something I never thought I'd be looking at. I'm wondering with some of the solution space that you've been discussing, um, what is going to be the impacts of some of the things we're planning with more heat waves and more drought and more floods? Like, what are some of the major things that were you like, are they being incorporated into the thinking? Yeah. I'm happy to start. I mean, in uh, specifically to forest care, I think we're seeing increases in pests. We're seeing wind events, wind and rain events combined that blow over our tree canopy. There was an image up there that I didn't describe, but um, Central Park has lost 25 acres of tree canopy in a seven year period. And a lot of those trees, I don't know exactly for Central Park, but a lot of the canopy change we're seeing, especially in natural areas and on our streets are really large, old, mature trees, and they store a lot of carbon. And it, you know, some of those trees are 200, 250 years old. And so you can't just replace those trees and that carbon stock quickly. And so really, uh, yeah, just sort of thinking through succession and time and how to plan ahead for those impacts and, you know, kind of stacking the deck with, you know, diversity, both structural and compositional. But yeah, we're definitely seeing a lot of um, impacts from drought and wind and pests, pests yeah, I mean, everything. We're losing our beaches. Yeah, yeah, there's be yeah, beach leaf disease, um, a lot of our ash are completely, you know, our mature ash are dying. And so it's hard to keep up with that too, right? It's, you know, then you have a lot of wood on the ground and, you know, how to use that so it doesn't get chipped. I mean, there's a lot of great examples of wood reutilization that's happening in cities. That's wonderful, but we're also, still seeing huge oak tree, trees just getting mulched um, and huge piles of mulch then catching on fire. Yeah, I can totally uh, reiterate that. Um, in fact, I think there is also huge risks and but also huge opportunities because what I see is that with these significant droughts, at least throughout Europe, but uh, I, I think probably the same reaction is also in, in North America, that when we see these serious droughts, then urban residents and cities are perhaps more willing to to take some up, uh, up some of uh, up some of these measures that we have been discussing and the luck is that there is a lot of synergy between mitigation and adaptation uh, in cities as i discussed for example for permeable having more permeable surface uh, and more live soil in uh, uh, the city definitely helps with water infiltration and recharging groundwater uh, systems in hungary we had um, uh, first time we had severe water shortages when we had the drought. Some um, villages just didn't have uh, running water anymore because our groundwater levels have dropped so much. But with more uh, blue infrastructure in cities and with more infiltration, we can keep groundwater water levels higher. So that's a very good adaptation, but also that uh, trees help uh, a lot. Uh, it's true that now it's more difficult to keep them alive, but once we kept them alive, they uh, already you mentioned the climate regulation uh, effect but in fact we have uh, the first time also in ipcc we assessed uh, the 
the local, the urban climate that urban that and trees influence uh, the urban climate and actually not only cool but they also make it moisture and they actually um, induce rain sometimes so uh, especially downwind from the cities but it means the more trees you have the the less severe your drought will be because actually the uh, the trees recycle the water and, and give you back uh, the rain so there is a lot of um, a lot of strong synergies and perhaps another reason why we really have to cherish old and mature uh, trees because as you also mentioned the young trees are finding harder and harder to to survive and especially in in europe what we see that the, the groundwater levels drop so much so, so by the time the roots get to the groundwater they are already dying out but those the mature trees who we, which we already have they already are down there the groundwater levels so all, all together that's another reason uh, to to really uh, keep uh, the mature trees and finally the one risk I see is that with more storms, uh, more and more um, cities are concerned about the damage from falling trees and falling branches, and they are cutting out trees or, or truncating uh, trees, and that way we get rid of the foliage and get rid of the climate regulation component. Great. I, I want to look at this actually at a little bit different angle. Um, the cities there are known for the urban heat island effect, right? So the, the cities are hotter than the surrounding uh, areas. So when the climate, um, global climate is getting warmer, um, cities are getting warmer as well. And, and um, in many areas, so there is a kind of synergetic effect between heat island and the global warming. So the cities become hotter than actually at the areas outside. Uh, but what is interesting, I think we should look, uh, we should look at this as uh, actually cities as the labs for the future conditions, for, for the future dry, because uh, the, uh, the vegetation in many cities is, um, um, because it's hot, right? So it, the water evaporates much faster and it's hotter. So the trees in the cities, they experience this uh, effect of the global warming already for decades. So the foresters who out, work outside and the natural forest, they should learn from the forester working in the cities how they deal actually with adaptation of the urban vegetation to this change. So I think we should, uh, so yes, there are some different uh, effects and we see the, the, the trees and the cities don't do so well, but they, they, they've been living, cities, the, the urban trees and forests, they have been growing and surviving under very harsh conditions. The heat island effect plus a lot of pollution. I mean, we shouldn't forget that many cities are extremely polluted and many of these pollutants actually, they do influence the uh, physiology of plants. So there is one example that is actually, I, I find personally very striking. So to adapt uh, to the uh, pollution, cities modified the pollen that they produce. So they, there is more protein in this pollen that they produce, so it be become, become more allergenic. So the uh, pollen that you breathe in in the city, uh, from, from the trees, it's more allergenic and there is more aller allergic reactions, for instance. And this is reaction of the trees to the pollution because they want to survive. So this is my reaction. And to, in terms of storms, I think that's something that already my colleagues already told about. And um, of course, the, the coastal regions, um, the, I don't know what to do. I mean, the, probably people will have to move eventually because you cannot rebuild and rebuild this um, infrastructures and the, uh, in the coastal areas. Um, the fires is another actually hazard and it's, there is an increased, um, increased um, frequency of fires. So in Australia, there is a program that is actually funded by the government on resettlement of people from those areas that are fire prone. So um, we have to think kind of creatively about what to do with the settlements in the future, I think, not only about the vegetation. Great, thank you. Um, so, you know, there still is a fair bit of scientific uncertainty. I'd say like two of the areas of scientific uncertainty that seem to get a lot of focus is this idea of like the durability and permanence of, of, of these um, solutions. So like risks of reversal and losing your carbon stocks, which is somewhat related to some of the stuff we're just saying, but then also monitoring and verification. Um, and so, I, you know, we didn't hear a lot about that. I was wondering if, you know, you could talk a little bit about what, like, what concerns you or maybe 
doesn't. Maybe you're not concerned with some of the concerns you have around those two issues. Sure, I can start. Um, I think with the concept of permanence, I, I mean, I think forests are not a permanent element in carbon. I think once a tree dies, it starts decomposing and emitting CO2. And even in some of our forest plots where we measured the carbon um, stock and sequestration, there were some plots that were net emission. Um, and so I think, you know, that really suggests healthy forest management, sustainable forest management. And when we see tree mortality, kind of making sure to kind of plan ahead for the future. In terms of monitoring and verification, um, I mean, I think when I think of like increases in carbon stocks in natural lands and in parklands and cities, uh, we've done some research and have found that actually because of deferred maintenance in the 1970s, because of budget cuts, that there was huge increases in tree growth in previously mowed lawns. Um, and so I think, you know, a forest and a tree can grow anywhere. So you could get more forest growth. But if you're thinking about it in the context of like a carbon credit or something where you really want to show with improved forest management, you're getting additional carbon. I think that, you know, it requires a lot of monitoring. And I think there's a lot of uncertainty there because I think we are seeing so many big trees come down that any incremental growth that could lead to increases in carbon storage could essentially be lost by large tree blowdowns. Um, so I, but I, I haven't seen anyone do that in a, in a forest yet. We're about to do a monitoring project in 2024 to look at some of our forest data and we'll incorporate that. But some early evidence sort of showed that we've seen a lot of mortality. Yeah, I, I fully agree with this. Um, I think uh, I wouldn't be that concerned about uh, the, the, the permanence, first of all, because in the end, in the cities, if it dies, then we will plant another one. As long as we plant another one, as the, and as long as we, we um, close the chain. So for example, if, if a tree dies, I would have to just make sure that that um, wood will be used for, uh, let's say, in a building or, or as, a, as, a, as construction material or, or for another bio-based material, which will keep still out the carbon out of this carbon cycle so the key thing is that you don't allow that carbon to go back to the atmosphere and then then the permanence issue is not uh, that uh, tragic so i wouldn't be uh, that concerned but certainly uh, it's an issue but i think it's more issue with uh with uh with big forest natural forests where we just count on them constantly being uh, a sink and, and in the end they with warming and so on they become a, a source with monitoring and verification i have a perhaps not very popular position and this is by no means ipcc perspective but i don't think it makes a lot of sense to keep counting and, and counting what we see from the scientific literature that anyway the vast majority of, uh, of offsets vast majority of earlier projects for example on the clean development mechanism also if you look at the european emission trading scheme a lot of the projects which were kind of offset uh, type of projects did not result to only two percent of them actually resulted in real um, additional uh, reduction and uh, uh, and whereas eight percent was that resulted in some temporary uh, reduction uh, but but the permanence wasn't there so anyway when we all have to go to zero then i don't see a lot of sense in you know um like my very good colleague uh, the deputy director of tina center usually says that why pay someone else to go on a diet for you i mean if you have to go on a diet then you have to go on a diet you can't pay someone else to go on a diet we all have to go on a diet we all have to go to zero then all of this big accounting and big it's just a lot of cost a lot of transaction cost a lot of effort instead of if we had put all of this effort just counting and and monitoring and verifying to actually mitigation and just you know, trying our best to, to go towards net zero probably would, would mitigate more. But by no means, of course, uh, there are other benefits to carbon markets and, and, and offsets and, and so on. So there are definitely cases when, when it still makes sense. Uh, and in that case, probably it's important. But in general, whenever 
we can, I think we should just do it, do it rather than count it a lot. I think I will comment on the permanence of carbon uh, stocks in buildings, so in the bio and the um, biomass based materials, um, because it hasn't been covered yet. Um, by now, I mean, we can look around and see all this beautiful wood in the crown hall uh, that surrounds us. And um, I don't know what the expected lifetime of the crown hall for when um, Yale is planning to remodel or to. Um, I don't know. So the the question of permanence in the buildings for for carbon, for instance, is um, definitely related to the life cycle to life cycle of the building. And um, wood is one of those materials that, um, if you design a building smartly, it can be easily reused. So it can be reused. So this um, the this carbon stock that you um, originally store in the building, it can be if and if you don't like this building, you basically disassemble the building and um, you can use this material somewhere else and something else. Um, so if um, right now there are no really incentives, there are very few cases when this is done. There are these buildings that have been built for disassembly and I think uh, one of the new Yale buildings, uh, the Horse Island was Kind of built with this idea in, in mind. Uh, so, um, but it hasn't been really routinely done. But I think the permanence, the, the kind of adding, uh, building with uh, biomass based materials and incorporating the uh, carbon in the built in, in the built infrastructures is really uh, something that um, gives this carbon um, kind of long life from my perspective. Um, and on the question to the, on the question to verification and the carbon credits, um, I mean, these carbon credits will not die, even though they're not so um, maybe effective. And uh, in my opinion, it's easier to monitor carbon accumulation in the city than in a remote place somewhere in the um, remote tropical forest. In the, um, in the city, you can go and measure the trees. You can easily observe what happens to the forest that where you can maybe bought, you invested some and bought some offsets, and it's much more difficult to do it with some other types of ecosystems. The same with, I mean, there are no carbon, right now, car offsets that you can buy for a building when you put in the carbon. But I think in the, in the future that there will be, and that's something that we can monitor much more easily. So maybe that's, um, will give also more uh, credible, uh, produce more credible kind of credits <laughs> in the future. Great, I wanna open it up to you folks. Just a couple of questions. Yeah, go ahead, I'm in the back there. Um, in our small city, we calculated the energy savings from the shade provided by trees, street trees, and it was remarkable. It occurred to me, you're in New York City where there are skyscrapers, but in small cities, that number can be huge. And so it would just be for, in terms of informational whatever outreach to small cities, that would be an important feature to include. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think that's a great point, especially when you have um, really large buildings where the tree is below the height, it might just reach the second story, it's gonna provide a lot less energy saving. So yeah, I think that's an excellent point. There was a question up here and well, yeah, there's a lot. Um, Wanna bring the mic over here? Can I add to that? Oh, sorry, you want to answer yeah. too? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point. And I think we should start mandating not only shading um, buildings, but I think we, we should soon, at least in, in heat uh, wave uh, prone countries, we definitely, and, and where we may expect capacity shortages uh, when heat waves come and, and where don't, we don't have enough air conditioning. In the US, you have, but but still, there is some level of energy poverty, right? That some of the poor populations don't have. So at least maybe sh uh, putting shading trees now that will protect them in 20 years when the heat waves uh, come. But I would also mandate uh, putting shading trees in, in uh, bus stops. Well, you don't have that many bus stops, but sidewalks or where people are, are out, uh, out and, and can be exposed to, to extreme heat in the cities. And, um, and what uh, it's not necessarily shading trees, but it's I think it's uh, related that I was uh, very surprised to see in Turkey, for example, most of the cars are white. So actually that in the end, if in the city, you know, the number of cars 
make a lot of difference in the in the whole urban albedo and we never consider that i would give for example a tax rebate for perhaps uh, <laughs> or maybe just to a fee bait and increase you know the registration fee or whatever for dark cars whereas uh, more reflective uh, cars could uh, so in, um, anyway so i think definitely shading and um, in, in general keeping cities and, and buildings cooler uh, is crucial Although you might need more car washes if all your cars are <laughs> away. Um, great, thank you. This was an excellent panel. Um, I'm curious to know um, what a lot of the data and the ideas presented, um, how do those apply to informal settlements, considering that the preponderance of urban growth in most of the parts of the world where urban growth is happening is, are informal settlements. I'd be curious to hear that. And the other question I have is, around food. Um, by one estimate, about 80% of global food production will be consumed in cities by 2050. And I didn't really hear much mention of food in, in solutions or problems, but also in many developing country cities, a big part of uh, waste is uh, organic waste and food waste. So again, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that as well. Thank you. I mean, it's certainly not my area of expertise, but I, it makes me think of a study that I saw in Seattle where they tried to calculate if with like the amount of space available, if they could have enough agricultural land within the city limits to support the food production needs for the whole city. Um, and I think the answer was no. Um, but I think that, I mean, there certainly is a lot more opportunity to expand urban agriculture to, you know, at least get part of the way there. And then I also don't have a lot of experience with urban settlements in developing countries, but I, the thing that came to mind was like kind of like land planning and protecting areas um, for multiple uses and kind of just thinking through that, but I certainly don't know the governance and sort of social ways to get that done. I'm, it is certainly a complex aspect, yeah. So thank you. Those are really uh, excellent questions. And on informal settlements, that was also quite strong in the cycle of the sixth assessment report. Um, and um, for example, um, in, in, in building energy use, it's uh, it's fairly simple, the answer, because we have uh, done modeling uh, and assumed that what if all informal settlements sooner or later upgrade and, and go to, uh, to normal formal settlements and how much the emission, how much will the emissions grow? And it's actually really amazing that you still don't even show, don't even see the line, even if all of them get, uh, get upgraded. So it's, so at this point, I think from just from my perspective, the mitigation perspective, of course, it, it's, it's really important and great if we can help them to have energy efficient, uh, when they upgrade to have energy efficient infrastructure and, and appliances and so on. But even if they don't, we won't even notice that. So our consumption growth is so significantly bigger and affects global emissions that, that, uh, that I think we, they should uh, just prioritize their own development needs. And then uh, food, yes, that was also important uh, in um, the working with three report. But I think um, the, uh, the, the science on, on food waste reduction opportunities is, is more mixed. Of course, we say that uh, we, the, the SDG target is that we should try to uh, eliminate half of that. But some of the science says actually it's not so easy. And if, if you do it, then, for example, it will be a lot of trade offs with, uh, with um, with transportation because collecting that and distributing that and so on so there it's actually I think more controversial but where we were quite uh, strong is the dietary shift so just to encourage dietary shift that can have a very uh, significant uh, uh, impact and I think uh, there is more and more evidence on uh, the importance of, of, uh, of dietary shifts but it's a very uh, politically very difficult um, not necessarily because we, we love our steaks, it's also that, but, but the issue is that a lot of countries and a lot of uh, communities who cannot change don't have the opportunity because in, on, on marginal lands and, uh, and pastoral communities there is nothing else. So also in the IPCC now we have a very sophisticated, I don't remember the exact language, shift to, 
balanced and sustainable diets. I think that was the, the correct wording. It was a lot of days of negotiations to, to find a wording that is acceptable to, to all uh, communities, especially South America's and, and Australia, they are important, but recognizing that in, you know, in some, that there is still legitimacy of, of so we not, IBIS is definitely not advocating for a full vegan diet for everyone, simply pointing out that, that relying more on, uh, on uh, plant-based diets can have a very significant impact. I can only shortly add to whatever was already said. So on informal settlements, I remember there was a comparison of the embodied energy uh, for the uh, like a building and informal settlement um, versus kind of this similar um, uh, kind of floor area in a um, normal kind of uh, building. And in a formal settlement, uh, this um, embodied energy or emissions, associated emissions, because it mostly comes from the fossil fuels uh, burning, um, it was almost an order of magnitude lower than in, um, in a modern building where we think that the conditions, living conditions are much better. So from this point of view, what is better? <laughs> but of course, the living conditions are completely different. You, you cannot compare those. Um, yeah, so I think in the food, I think I, I mean, I, sh I mentioned it in this, in the graph, this urban carbon cycle, but I'm, I remember I was looking at the numbers uh, for like the food, um, carbon, uh, carbon footprint of the food that goes in and out of the city. And it's unfortunate, it's, um, it's very small comparative to the like construction materials. So the amount of construction materials that carried, carried in and then uh, the, um, this um, all this construction demolition debris that are carried out, this is basically substantially higher than whatever comes from food. So food is important for people, for, for us to survive, but in terms of carbon balance, kind of carbon fluxes and food, it's a very small number. We're gonna do one more. So thank you for bringing up nature in the cities. And, um, you know, water is one of these issues that, that uh, so I work on an inland uh, waterway in Hartford, and uh, what I've seen is really the, the co-benefits, this issue of synergy is quite profound around around rivers. And also they are the most volatile, uh, you know, we, we can't really build around them unless, unless you channelize them, right, and we don't want to do that. So I'm not hearing the academic community really advocating for increasing conservation and revitalization around riparian corridors, which is actually pretty low hanging fruit. And uh, especially because, uh, you know, so many floodplains were used for parking lots or whatever. So I'm, I'm wondering um, how can we um, amplify uh, that opportunity uh, given its uh, cost benefits. But also, I also had just a little question about why do we not measure oxygen um, the value of the production of oxygen in trees, because there's an awful lot of talk about carbon sinks, but um, and, and, and thankfully we're beginning to recognize the value of trees and, and dense forests to reduce temperatures in cities, making temp high density cities more livable, but really we also need that oxygen. So who, who's, who's measuring that and, and how does that factor into it? Um, those are great questions. The question about oxygen is a good one, and I, I feel like maybe that's captured in air quality monitoring, but I, I don't know. I, I have never incorporated oxygen that concentrations are going down ever so slightly, but yeah. not to a point where I think it's a concern yet, because there's a very large amount. And the, as far as I know, the trees um, as a source of oxygen is it's a very, very small kind of source. So that's why it's not really um, considered in any of these budgets. And, and First, second, it's, uh, it's uh, one, one tree in the end is, is oxygen, oxygen neutral during its uh, life cycle because uh, it's only uh, emits oxygen when it uh, photosynthesizes, but otherwise it emits actually carbon dioxide when it doesn't, when it breathes. So, and then when it decomposes, then, uh, then it uses oxygen. So in the end, uh, it's, it's very little, as, as, as my colleague said, 
the oxygen impact. So it's, it's a little bit of a myth, even by, by the Amazon, that Amazon produces our oxygen, which is not true. It's also in cities, I think this is very insignificant. Um, and I can comment a little bit on your question about like freshwater streams and riparian areas. I mean, I, I didn't mention this, but um, in addition to some of the work in forests, we've done assessments on tidal wetlands and freshwater wetlands in New York City, and many of them have been, you know, buried. A lot of the freshwater streams. We also have been working tirelessly in the Bronx River and then in um, Tibbetts Brook, which is an area in the Bronx, to sort of daylight that stream. And I, I mean, there is so much to do there and so much to to clean up. And um, the Guanas Canal is another example. It's like I think a, a lot of waterways in cities were used really for industry historically and so but i think you know kind of, there's so much opportunity to connect people to the water in their community and so i think all i have to say is that there's a ton of opportunity to do that okay well, can we thank our panelists Karen, you're going to do a wrap up? Okay. Okay. Well, we have had a really full day. Uh, Pete's done the math for us seven hours of lots of information. And I'm not going to summarize any, any of my students will know I'm not a big fan of summaries, but I'm a big fan of synthesis. And I think of today's talks somewhat akin to going to a buffet. And I think of cities as coming to this climate mitigation buffet and seeing a variety of different options available in buildings and transport, how we design streets, trees, waterways, what we can do as cities, as neighborhoods, as individuals at the household level, it just seems like this buffet is filled with options. But it also seems like there are an enormous set of opportunities, but also challenges. And I'm going to synthesize that in the context of three themes that I heard. One is there's an incredible opportunity just simply in the scale of the challenge. Pete mentioned it in his slides. A number of different speakers did. I had no idea that we were going from 1 million EVs to possibly a billion. Incredible opportunity. But I guess the flip side of what I learned today was, do we need those 1 billion EVs? Are there different ways to rethink our landscapes and our urban spaces so that we're saving land for nature and so that we can be more efficient with the land that we currently have? So the scale of the challenge and the scale of the opportunity. The second thing that I took away from today is, is really urgency. And again, Pete, I think your, your story of when you were in graduate school, it seems so far away. And now we're hearing, you know, Co says we've got three years to get emissions, to have peak emissions in three years. But I also hear from the speakers, we have the knowledge, we have the know-how, we have the technological know-how to actually do it. That's the opportunity. But the challenge is we're not doing it. We're not doing it. And we're hearing from Kevin and Jeff and others about why we're not doing it. We heard from the mayor. He's not hearing from those of us who care about green streets and walkable neighborhoods. So the urgency is there. It offers an opportunity, but offers huge challenges because the responsibility ultimately is on all of us. And that's the third takeaway that I took from today's amazing talks is, you know, I, I've spent my entire career studying urbanization in cities. And, and today it, it really resonated that at the end of the day, it all pulls down to us too. We are the folks living in cities and towns. We comprise the 55% of the world's population living in cities and towns. We, those of us in this room, are living in cities and towns that consume more than 60% or produce more than 60% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So 
it's not just about expecting nation states to do something or private sector. It's really not even our mayor. It's also what we can do as individuals. And so I want to thank all the speakers for really, I think, just so being so inspiring again. Um, thank Colleen and your incredible team at the Hickson Center um, for, for putting this on. And thank everyone who's been part of this online. I understand that we have had participants from over 35 countries. And Deanna said, oh my goodness, that's one sixth of all the countries in the world. That's her IPCC knowledge there, right <laughs> off the bookshelf there. So thank you for joining us in this conversation. Um, and please thank, join me in thanking the speakers. And we have time for re refreshments and and a reception. So please spend time speaking with the speakers and with the, uh, each other. So thank you for coming and, and thank you all the speakers. <laughs> and our reception will be down the hall. So please join us in the reception.